The Poem of the Man God, The Second Year of the Public Life, Chapter 255 Jesus Speaks of Hope, 18th of August 1945. Some vine dressers who are passing through the orchard, laden with baskets of golden grapes, which seem to be made of amber, see the apostles and ask them. Are you pilgrims or strangers? We're Galilean pilgrims going towards Mount Carmel. Replies on behalf of everybody, James of Zebedee, who, with his fishermen companions, is stretching his legs to overcome a residual somnolence. Piscariot and Matthew are just waking up on the grass on which they had lain down, while the elder ones, being very tired, are still sleeping. Jesus is speaking to John of Endor and Amastius, while the Blessed Virgin and Mary Clopas are nearby, but they do not speak. The vine dressers ask, Have you come from afar? Caesarea was our last stop. Before that we were at Sicaminum and further away. We come from Capernaum. Ooh, it's a long way in this season, but why did you not come to our house? It's over there, see? We could have given you cool water to refresh in yourselves and some food. Rustic food, but good. Come now. We are about to depart. May God reward you just the same. Oh, Mount Carmel will not flee on a chariot of fire as its prophet did, says a peasant half seriously. No more chariots come from heaven to take prophets away. There are no more prophets in Israel. They say that John is already dead, says another peasant. Dead? Since when? That's when we were told by some people who came from beyond the Jordan. Did you venerate him? We were his disciples. Why did you leave him? To follow the Lamb of God, the Messiah, whom he announced. Men, he is still in Israel and much more than a chariot of fire would be required to transfer him worthily to heaven. Do you not believe in the Messiah? Of course we do. We decided to go and look for him when the harvest is over. They say that he is very zealous in obeying the law, and that he goes to the temple and prescribes festivities. We shall soon be going for the tabernacles, and we will stay in the temple every day to see him. And if we do not find him... We will go looking for him until we find him. Since you know him, tell us. Is it true that he's at Capernaum almost all the time? Is it true that he's tall, young, pale and fair-haired? And that his voice is different from every other man's? As it touches the hearts of men and even animals and trees listen to it. It touches every heart except the hearts of Pharisees, Gamala. They have become harsher. They are not even animals. They are demons, including the one whose name I bear. But tell us, is it true that he's so kind as to speak to everybody, to comfort everybody, to cure diseases and convert sinners? Do you believe that? Yes, we do. But we would like to be told by you who follow him. Oh, I wish you would take us to him. But you have your vineyards to look after. But we also have a soul to take care of, and it is worth much more than our vineyards. Is he at Capernaum? By forced marches we could go and come back in ten days. The one you are looking for is over there. He has rested in your orchard and is now speaking to that old man and the young one. And his mother and the sister of his mother are beside him. That what? What shall we do? They become stiff with amazement. They are all eyes looking at him. All their vitality is concentrated in their eyes. Well, you were so anxious to see him, and now you're not moving. Have you become of salt? Says Peter, prodding them. <gasps> no, it's... But is the Messiah so simple? What did you expect him to be? Sitting on a flashing throne wearing a royal mantle? Did you think that he was a new Ahasuerus? No, but so simple. And he's 
so holy. Man, he's simple just because he is holy. Well, let us do this. Master, be patient. Come here and work a miracle. There are some men here who are looking for you, but they have become petrified seeing you. Come and give them back motion and speech. Jesus, who turned around when he was called, gets up smiling and comes towards the vine dressers, whose countenance is so stupefied that they seem to be frightened. Peace be with you. Did you want me? Here I am. And he makes the usual gesture with his arms, which he stretches out as if he offered himself. The vine dressers fall on their knees and remain silent. Be not afraid. Tell me what you want. They offer their baskets full of grapes without speaking. Jesus admires the beautiful grapes and saying, Thanks. He stretches a hand and takes a bunch and begins to eat them. Oh, most high God, he eats like us, says with a sigh the one whose name is Kamala. It is not possible not to laugh at such a remark. Jesus also smiles more noticeably and almost to excuse himself, he says. I am the son of man. His gesture has overcome their ecstatic torpor, and Gomala says, Would you not enter our house at least till Vesper? We are many, because we are seven brothers with wives and children, and then there are the old ones who are waiting for death in peace. Let us go. Call your companions and join us. Mother, come with Mary. And Jesus sets out behind the peasants, who have got up and are walking a little sideways in order to see him walk. The path is a narrow one and runs between trees tied to one another by vines. They soon reach the house, or rather the houses, because there are several houses forming a square with a large common yard in the centre where there is a well. The entrance is through a long corridor which serves as a lobby and is closed at night with a heavy door. Peace to this house and to those who live in it, says Jesus entering and raising his hand to bless, and then lowers it to caress a little half-naked baby who looks at him ecstatically. He's lovely in his little sleeveless shirt, which has fallen off his plump shoulder. He is barefooted, with one finger in his mouth and a crust of bread, dressed with oil, in the other. That's David, the son of my youngest brother, explains Gamala, while one of the other vine dressers enters the house next door to inform the people in it. He then comes out and enters another one and so on, so that the faces of every age look out and withdraw, and finally come out after a short toilet. There is an old man sitting in the shade of a shed, shielded by a huge fig tree, and he is holding a stick in his hands. He does not even raise his head, as if nothing were of interest to him. He's our father, explains Kamala. He's one of the old people of the household, because Jacob's wife also brought her father here when he was left all alone. Then there is the old mother of Leah, who is the youngest wife. Our father is blind. His eyes are covered by a veil. So much sunshine in the fields. So much heat from the soil. Poor father. He is very sad, but he's very good. He is now waiting for his grandchildren, who are his only joy. Jesus goes to the old man. May God bless you, father. May God give your blessing back to you, whoever you are, replies the old man, raising his head towards the voice. Your fate is unpleasant, is it not? asks Jesus kindly, beckoning to the others not to say who is speaking. It comes from God, after so much good he has given me during my long life. As I accepted good from God, I must accept also the misfortune of my sight. After all, it is not eternal. It will end on the bosom of Abraham. You are right, 
it would be worse if your soul were blind. I have always endeavoured to keep its sight perfect. How did you do that? You, who are speaking, are young. Your voice tells me. Are you perhaps like the present-day young people who are all blind because they are without religion, eh? Be careful. It is a great misfortune not to believe and not to do what God told us. An old man told you, my boy, if you abandon the law, you will be blind, both on the earth and in next life. You will never see God, because the day will come when the Redemptor Messiah will open the gates of God for us. I am too old to see that day here on the earth, but I will see it from the bosom of Abraham. That is why I do not complain of anything, because I hope that through my darkness I will expiate anything I may have done disagreeable to God, and that I may deserve him in eternal life. But you are young. Be faithful, son so that you may see the Messiah, because the time is near. The Baptist said so. You will see him. But if your soul is blind, you will be one of those of whom Isaiah speaks. You will have eyes, but you will not see. Would you like to see him, Father? Asks Jesus, laying one hand on his right. I would like to see him, of course. But I prefer to go without seeing him, rather than I should see him and my sons should not recognize him. I still have the ancient faith and it is enough for me. They, oh, the world nowadays. Father, see, therefore, the Messiah. And may the evening of your life be crowned with delight. And Jesus' hand slides from the white head down across his forehead, as far as the bearded chin of the old man, as if he were caressing him. And in the meantime, he bends to be at the height of his senile face. Oh, most high Lord, but I can see, I can see. Who are you with this unknown face, which, however, is familiar to me, as if I had already seen you? <gasps> but, oh, how foolish I am. You who have given me back my eyesight, are the blessed Messiah. <laughs> oh. The old man weeps over Jesus' hand, which he has grasped, covering them with tears and kisses. All the relatives are in a turmoil. Jesus frees his hand and he caresses the old man again, saying, Yes, it is I. Come, so that you may become acquainted with my words as well as with my face. And he goes towards the little staircase which leads up to a shady terrace entirely shielded by a thick pergola. Everybody follows him. I had promised my disciples to speak to them about hope, and I was going to tell them a parable to explain it. This is the parable, this old Israelite. The Father of Heaven gives me the subject to teach you all, the great virtue that supports faith and charity, like the arms of a yoke, a sweet yoke. The scaffold of mankind, like the arm of the cross, the throne of salvation, like the support of the wholesome snake raised in the desert, Scaffold of mankind, bridge of the soul, 
to fly up to the light, and it is placed in the middle between essential faith and most perfect charity, because without hope there can be no faith, and without hope charity dies. Faith presupposes unfailing hope. How can one believe that one will reach God if one does not hope in his bounty? What can support you during your lifetime if you do not hope in eternal life? How can we persist in justice if we do not entertain the hope that every good deed of ours is seen by God who will reward us for it? Likewise, how can charity be alive in us if we have no hope. Hope precedes charity and prepares it, because a man needs to hope in order to love. Those who have lost all hope cannot love. This is the staircase made of steps and banisters. Faith, the steps. Hope, the banisters. At the top there is charity, to which one climbs by means of the other two. Man hopes in order to believe, and believes in order to love. This man knew how to hope. He was born, a baby of Israel like everybody else. He grew up with the same teaching as everybody else. He became a son of the law like all the others. He became a man, a husband, a father. Old, always hoping in the promises made to the patriarchs and repeated by the prophets. In his old age, shadows came over his eyes, but not over his heart. Hope has always been lit in it. Hope to see God. To see God in next life. And in the hope of that eternal vision, there was a more intimate and dearer. To see the Messiah. And he said to me, not knowing who was the young man speaking to him, If you abandon the law, you will be blind both on the earth and in heaven. You will not see God, and you will not know the Messiah. He spoke as a wise man. There are too many people in Israel now who are blind. They have no hope because it was killed by their rebellion to the law, which is always a rebellion, even when veiled by sacred vestments. If it is not complete acceptance of the word of God, I say of God, not of the superstructures put there by man, which being too many and completely human are neglected by the very ones who put them there, and are fulfilled mechanically, compulsorily, wearily, unfruitfully by others. They have no more hope, but they deride the eternal truth. Therefore they no longer have faith or charity. The divine yoke given by God to man, that he might make it his obedience and merit, the heavenly cross that God gave to man to conjure the serpents of evil, that he might make it his health, has lost its cross arm, the one supporting the white flame and the red one, faith and charity. And darkness descended into the hearts of men. The old man said to me, it is a great misfortune not to believe and not to do what God told us. It is true. I confirm it. It is worse than bodily blindness, which can be cured, to give a just man the joy to see again the sun, meadows, the fruit of the earth, the faces of his sons and grandchildren, and above all, what was the hope of his hope? To see the Messiah of the Lord. I wish such virtue were alive in the soul of every man in Israel and above all in the souls of those who are most learned in the law. It is not sufficient 
to have been to the temple or to be of the temple. It is not sufficient to know the words of the book by heart. It is necessary to make them the life of our lives by means of the three divine virtues. You have an example. Everything is easy to deal with where they are alive, even misfortune. Because the yoke of God is always a light one, which weighs only on the body, but does not deject the spirit. Go in peace, you who live in this house of good Israelites. Go in peace, old father. You have the certainty that God loves you. End your just day by laying your wisdom in the hearts of the children of your own blood. I cannot stay, but my blessing remains here, among these walls rich in grapes like the grapes of this vineyard. And Jesus would like to go away, but he has to stay at least long enough to meet this tribe of all ages and receive what they wish to give him until their travelling sacks are like bulging goatskins. He can then take on the road again, along a shortcut through the vineyard, shown to him by the vine dressers, who leave him only when they reach the main road, in sight of a little village where Jesus and his friends can stay for the night. The Poem of the Man-God The Second Year of the Public Life Chapter 256 Jesus goes up Mount Carmel with his cousin James, 19th of August, 1945. Evangelize in the plain of Israelin until I come back. Jesus orders his apostles on a clear morning while they are taking a little food, some bread and fruit, on the banks of the Kishon. The apostles do not appear to be very enthusiastic, but Jesus comforts them, telling them how to behave, and he concludes, In any case, you have my mother with you. She will give you good advice. Go to Johanan's peasants, and on the Sabbath, endeavour to speak to Doris's peasants. Give them some assistance, and console the old relative of Marcian, giving him news of the boy, and tell him that we will take him his grandson for the Feast of the Tabernacles. Give those poor people very much everything you have. Tell them everything you know. Give them all the love you can, all the money we have. Be not afraid. As it goes, so it comes. We shall never die of starvation, even if we had to live on bread and fruit only. And if you see people needing clothes, give them some, also mine. Nay, mine first. We shall never be left nude. And above all, if you come across poor wretches looking for me, do not disdain them. You have no right to do that. Goodbye, mother. May God bless you all through my lips. Go without any fear. Come, James. Are you not taking your bag? Asks Thomas, seeing that the Lord is going away without picking it up. I do not need it. I shall walk more freely. James also leaves his, notwithstanding his mother had taken care to fill it with bread, cheese and fruit. They set out, following for a little while the bank of the Kishon. Then they start climbing the first slopes leading up to Mount Carmel, and can no longer be seen by those left behind. Mother, we are now in your hands. Guide us, because we are not capable of doing anything confesses Peter humbly. Mary smiles reassuringly and says, It is very simple. All you need to do is to obey his orders and you will do everything very well. Let us go. Jesus is climbing with his cousin and does not speak. Neither does James. Jesus is engrossed in thought. James who feels he is on the threshold of a revelation, is full of reverential love, of spiritual tremor, and looks now and again at Jesus, whose pensive, solemn face brightens up now and again 
with a smile. James looks at him as he would look at God, not yet incarnate and shining in his immense majesty. The apostle's face, which resembles the countenance of Saint Joseph, a brownish visage with, however, some red on the top points of cheeks, becomes pale with emotion. But he respects the silence of Jesus. They climb up steep shortcuts, paying no attention to the shepherds, pasturing their flocks on the green meadows under home oaks, oaks, ash trees and other forestry. And as they climb up, they brush with their mantles glossious juniper bushes, or golden broom ones, or emerald tufts strewn with myrtle pearls, or trembling curtains of honeysuckle and flowery clematis. They ascend, leaving behind woodsmen and shepherds, until they reach, after an exhausting climb, the crest of the mountain, or rather, a small tableland close to the crest, crowned with gigantic oaks and surrounded by a veritable balustrade of forestry, whose base is formed by the tops of the other trees on the mountainside, so that the little meadow seems to be resting on a rustling support isolated from the rest of the mountain, and is rather concealed by the branches beneath. Behind it, there is the peak, with its trees rising towards the sky, with the firmament above, and in front the unbroken horizon reddening in the sunset, and stretching endlessly beyond the bright sea. A fissure on the earth, which does not collapse only because the roots of gigantic oaks hold it firmly in position, opens in the cliff and is barely wide enough for one man of normal build. The path is further narrowed and lengthened by some fringe undergrowth. Jesus says, James, my dear brother, we shall stop here tonight, and although our bodies are so tired, I ask you to pass the night in prayer. Tonight and all day tomorrow until this time. A whole day is not too much to receive what I want to give you. Jesus, my Lord and Master, I will always do what you want, replies James, who became even paler when Jesus began to speak. I know. Let us go now and pick some blackberries and bilberries to eat and refresh yourselves at a spring that I heard below here. You may leave your mantle in the cave. No one will take it. And together with his cousin, he goes round the cliff and picks wild fruit of the bushes in the undergrowth. And then a few yards further down, on the opposite side to the one they came up, they fill their flasks, the only things they brought with them, at a babbling spring which runs out from a mass of intertwined roots, and they've refreshed themselves because it is still very warm, notwithstanding the height. They then climb back to the tableland, and while the sun, setting in the west, reddens the mountain top, they eat what they have picked and drink some water, smiling at each other like two happy children or two angels. They speak only a few words, a remembrance of those left down in the plain, an exclamation admiring the infinite beauty of the day, the names of two mothers, nothing else. Then Jesus draws his cousin towards himself and James takes John's habitual posture, his head resting on the upper part of Jesus' chest, one arm hanging loose, the other hand in that of his cousin. They remain thus, while in the dusk birds twitter loudly in the thicket. The tinkle of cattle bells recedes and fades in the distance, and the light breeze rustles caressingly in the treetops, cool and reviving after the heat of the day, and promising dew in the night. They remain thus for a long time and they think that only their lips are silent, whilst their souls, more active than ever, 
are engaged in supernatural conversation. The poem of The Man God, the second year of the public life. Chapter 257. Jesus reveals to James of Alphaeus his future apostolic mission. 20th of August, 1945. It is the same time on the following day. James is still in the fissure of the mountain and is sitting all curled up, with his head almost resting on his knees, which are drawn up and embraced by his arms. He is either engrossed in meditation or sleeping, I do not know which. He is certainly unaware of what is happening around him, that is, the fight of two large birds, which for some private reason are dueling fiercely on the little meadow. I would say that, they are mountain cocks, or wood grouse, or pheasants, because they are the size of a cockerel, with variegated feathers, but they have no combs, but only a helmet of flesh as red as coral, on the top of their heads and on their cheeks. And I can assure you, but not number one, that if their heads are small, their beaks must be like steel spikes. Feathers fly in the air and blood falls onto the ground in a dreadful noise which has caused all whistling, trilling and warbling to come to an end among branches. Perhaps the little birds are watching the wild fight. James does not hear anything. Jesus does hear and comes down from the hilltop to which he had climbed and clapping his hands he separates the two opponents which fly away bleeding, one towards the mountainside, the other to an oak tree on the top, where it tidies its shaggy, ruffled feathers. James does not raise his head even at the noise made by Jesus, who takes a few more steps smiling and stops in the middle of the little meadow. His white tunic seems to become tinged with red on the right-hand side. So deep is the crimson of sunset. The sky seems to be catching fire. And yet, James cannot be asleep, because as soon as Jesus whispers, he just whispers, James, come here. He lifts his head from his knees, frees his legs from the embrace of his arms, stands up and comes towards Jesus. He stops a couple of paces before him and looks at him. Jesus returns the glance, gravely, but encouraging him at the same time by means of a smile, which is not formed by his lips or his eyes, and yet is visible. He stares at James, as if he wanted to read the slightest reaction and emotion of his cousin and apostle, who, feeling, as on the previous day, that he's about to receive a revelation, turns pale and becomes even paler until he is as white as his linen tunic, when Jesus raises his arms and lays his hands on his shoulders, and remains thus with arms stretched forth. James then looks just like a sacred host, only his mild dark brown eyes and his brown beard give some colour to his expectant face. James, my brother, do you know why I wanted you here, all by ourselves, to speak to you after hours of prayer and meditation? James seems to find it difficult to reply, as he is so deeply moved. But at last he replies in a low voice. To give me a special lesson, or with regard to the future, or because I am the least capable of all. I thank you from this moment, even if it is for a reproach. But believe me, my master and lord, if I am slow and incapable, it is due to inborn deficiency, not to poor will. It is not a reproach, but a lesson for the time when I shall no longer be with you. During the last months, 
you have pondered in your heart over what I told you one day at the foot of this mountain. When I promised to come here with you, not only to speak of the prophet Elijah and to watch the infinite sea shining over there, but to speak to you of another sea, greater, more changeable and untrustworthy than this one, which today looks like the most placid of all seas, and yet in a few hours it may swallow boats and men in its voracious hunger. And you have always linked what I told you then to the idea that your coming here had some connection with your future destiny. In fact, you are now becoming paler and paler as you realise that it is a grave destiny. A heritage full of such responsibility as to cause even a hero to tremble. A responsibility and a mission to be fulfilled with all the holiness that is possible in man in order not to disappoint the will of God. Be not afraid, James. I do not want your ruin. Therefore, if I destine you to it, it means that I know that you will not receive any harm from it, but only supernatural joy. Listen, James. Set your heart at rest through a fine act of abandonment to me, so that you may be able to hear and remember my words. Never again shall we be all alone as we are now, and with our souls so prepared to understand each other. I will go one day, like every man who has a limited period of time to stay on the earth. My stay will come to an end in a way that is different from that of men. But it will still come to an end, and you will no longer have me with you except through my spirit, which, I can assure you, will never desert you. I will go after giving you what is necessary to enable my doctrine to make progress in the world, after completing the sacrifice and obtaining grace for you. By means of that grace and of the sapiencio septiform fire, you will be able to do what you would now consider madness and presumption even to imagine. I will go, and you will remain. And the world that did not understand Christ will not understand the apostles of Christ. You will therefore be persecuted and dispersed as the greatest danger to the welfare of Israel. But since you are my disciples, you must be happy to suffer the same afflictions as your master suffered. One day in the month of Nisan, I told you, you will be the one who is left of the prophets of the Lord. Your mother, by spiritual ministry, almost understood the meaning of those words. But before they come true, for my apostles, they will be realized with regard to you. James, everybody will be dispersed except you. And that until you are called by God to his heaven. You will remain in the place to which God will have elected you through the word of your brothers, you, the descendant of the royal race, in the royal city, to raise my scepter and speak of the true king, of the king of Israel and of the world, according to a sublime regality that no one understands except those to whom it is revealed. They will be days when you will need strength, perseverance, patience, and unlimited sagacity. You will have to be just with charity and with the pure, simple faith of a child, but at the same time erudite 
as becoming a true master in order to support faith attacked in many hearts by so many enemies and to confute the errors of false Christians and the doctrinaire quibbles of old Israel which is blind now and will become even more blind after killing the light and will twist the words of the prophets and even the instructions of the Father from whom I come to convince the world and itself in order to give itself peace that I was not the one of whom patriarchs and prophets spoke. They will instead state that I was a poor man a madman, a dreamer, according to the better ones, a possessed heretic, according to the worst ones of old Israel. I beg you then to be another myself. No, it is not possible. It is possible. You will have to bear in mind your Jesus, his actions, his words, his deeds. You will have to become molten in me. As if you lay in the clay mold used by those who melt metals to shape them. I will always be present, so present and alive with you, my faithful ones, that you will be able to unite yourselves to me and form another me, if you only wish so. But you, who have been with me since our earliest youth and have received the food of wisdom from the hands of Mary, even before you received it from mine. You, who are the nephew of the most just man that Israel had, you must be a perfect Christ. I cannot, I, I cannot, Lord, give that task to my brother, give it to John, to Peter Simon, to the other Simon, but not to me, my lord. Why to me? What have I done to deserve it? Can't you see that I am a poor man, capable of one thing only? That is, to love you and firmly believe in what you say. Judas's character is too strong. He will do well where paganism is to be demolished, not here, where those who are to be convinced of the Christian faith believe that they are absolutely right, as they already are the people of God. Not here, where those are to be persuaded, who, although they believe in me, will be disappointed at the course of events. They are to be convinced that my kingdom is not of this world, but it is the entirely spiritual kingdom of heaven, the prelude to which is a Christian life, that is a life in which spiritual values are the prevailing ones. Persuasion is achieved by means of firm kindness. Woe to those who catch people by their throats to persuade them. They will say yes at the moment, to be freed from the grip. But they will run away without looking back, and they will refuse any further discussion if they are not wicked, but only misguided. But if they are wicked or simply fanatics, they will run away to get armed and kill the overbearing asserter of doctrines different from theirs. And you will be surrounded by fanatics. There will be fanatics among Christians and among Israelites. The former will expect you to take strong action or will claim authority from you to take strong action themselves. Because old Israel, with its intolerance and restrictions, will still be wrinkling its poisonous tail amongst them. The latter will march against you and the others as if they were fighting a holy war to defend the old faith, its symbols and ceremonies. And you will be in the middle of the stormy sea. 
Such is the fate of leaders. And you will be the leader of all those belonging to the Jerusalem converted to Christianity by your Jesus. You will have to know how to love perfectly in order to lead them holily. You will have to oppose your heart to the weapons and anathemas of the Jews and not offer resistance with their weapons and anathemas. Never take the liberty of imitating the Pharisees in judging the Gentiles as filth. I have come for them as well, because the humiliation of God in taking flesh, liable to death, would have been out of proportion if done for Israel alone. Because while it is true that my love would have made me become incarnate with joy for the salvation of one only soul, Justice, which is also a divine perfection, demands that infinite be humiliated for an infinity, for mankind. You will have to be kind to them as well, in order not to repel them, confining yourself to being firm with regard to my doctrine, but indulging as far as other forms of life different from ours, and material matters are concerned without any detriment to souls. But you will have to fight hard with your brothers over that, because Israel is enveloped in practices that are external only and useless, as they do not change souls. You instead must be concerned only with the spirit, and you must teach others to do the same. Do not expect Gentiles to change their habits all of a sudden. You will not change yours with one blow either. Do not remain anchored at your rock, because to pick up wreckage at sea and take it to the dockyard and reshape it for a new life, it is necessary to sail and not remain still. And you must go and look for wreckage. There is some paganism and also in Israel. Beyond the boundless sea there is God who opens his arms to all his creatures, whether they are rich because of their holy origin, like Israelites, or poor because pagans. I said, you shall love your neighbour. Your neighbour is not only your relative or countryman, also the Hyperborean, whose face is unknown to you, is your neighbour, as well as the man who is now admiring dawn in regions of which you are unaware, or the man who travels on the fabulous mountain chains covered with snow in Asia, or drinks at a river flowing on the unknown forests in Central Africa. And if a worshipper of the sun should come to you, or one whose god is the voracious crocodile, or one who believes that he is wisdom reincarnate, who understood the truth, but did not grasp its perfection, neither did he give it as health to his faithful ones, or should a nauseated citizen of Rome or Athens come to you asking, give me knowledge of God, you cannot and must not say to them, I reject you, because it would be a profanation to take you to God. Bear in mind that they do not know, whereas Israel does. And yet many people in Israel are and will be really more idolatrous and cruel than the most barbarian idolater in the world. And they will not sacrifice human victims to this or to that idol, but to themselves, to their pride, avid for blood after they have become parched with an unquenchable thirst, which will last until the end of centuries. That terrible thirst may be quenched only by drinking once again, and with faith what caused it but it will then be the end of the world 
because Israel will be the last to say, We believe that you are God and the Messiah, notwithstanding all the proofs that I have given and will give of my divinity. You will watch and ensure that the faith of Christians is not vain. It would be vain if it consisted only of words or hypocritical practices. It is the spirit that vivifies. There is no spirit in mechanical or pharisaic practices which are but sham faith and not true faith. What would it avail man to sing praises to God in the congregation of believers if every action of his is an imprecation to God? who does not become the laughing stock of such believer, but in his paternity always maintains his prerogatives of God and King. Watch and ensure that nobody takes a place not belonging to him. The light will be given by God according to your situation. God will never let you be without light unless grace is extinguished in you by sin. Many will love to be called master. One only is your master, he who is speaking to you. And one only is your mistress, the church, which perpetuates him. In the church, those will be masters who will have been consecrated with a special appointment to teach. But among the believers, there will be some who by the will of God and their own holiness, that is because of their goodwill, will be overwhelmed by the vortex of wisdom and will speak. There will be others who are not wise themselves, but are docile instruments in the hands of artisans, and they will speak in the name of the artisan, repeating like good children what the father tells them to say although they do not understand the full meaning of the words they speak. And finally, there will be those who speak as if they were masters, and their magniloquence will deceive simple people, but they will be proud, hard-hearted, jealous, irascible, liars, and lustful. While I tell you to receive the words of the wise in the Lord and of the sublime children of the Holy Spirit, helping them to understand the depths of divine words, because if they are the bearers of the divine voice, you, my apostles, will always be the teachers of my church. And you must assist those who are supernaturally tired of the enrapturing and grave richness that God has granted them, that they may take it to their brothers, So I say to you, reject the false words of false prophets whose lives are not in accordance with my doctrine. A holy life, mildness, purity, charity and humility will never be lacking in the wise and little voices of God. They will always be lacking in the others. Watch and ensure that there are no jealousy and slander or resentment or desire for revenge in the congregation of believers. Watch and ensure that the flesh does not overwhelm the spirit. He whose spirit does not control his body could not withstand persecutions. James, I know that you will do it, but promise your brother that you will not disappoint me. But, my lord, I am afraid of one thing only, that I am not capable of doing it. My lord, I I beg you, give that task to someone else. No. I cannot. Simon of Jonah loves you, and you love him. Simon of Jonah is not 
James of David. John, John, the learned angel, make him your servant here. No, I cannot. Neither Simon nor John possess that nothingness, which is however so important with men, kinship. You are a relative of mine. After refusing to acknowledge me, the better part of Israel will endeavour to be forgiven by God and by themselves, and will make an effort to know the Lord, whom they have cursed in the hour of Satan. And they will feel they have been forgiven, and will thus feel strong to come onto my way, if one of my blood is in my place. James Great things have been accomplished upon this mountain. Here, the fire of God consumed not only the holocaust, the wood and stones, but even the dust and the very water that was in the ditch. James, do you believe that God can do again such a thing, burning and consuming all the materiality of the man, James, to make a James fire of God? We have been speaking while the setting sun has inflamed our tunics. Do you think that the brightness of the chariot that took Elijah away was like this, or more or less refulgent? Much more refulgent because it was made of heavenly fire. Consider therefore what a heart will be when it has been turned into fire to have in itself God. Because God wants it to perpetuate his word, preaching the gospel of salvation. But you, word of God, eternal word, why do you not remain? Because I am word and flesh. By the word I must teach and by the flesh, redeem. Oh, my Jesus, how will you redeem? What have you to face? James, remember the prophets. But are their words not allegoric? Can you, the word of God, be man handled by men? Do they perhaps not mean that your divinity, your perfection, will be tormented, but nothing more than that? My mother is worried about Judas and me, but I am worried about you and Mary, and also about ourselves, because we are so weak. Jesus, if men should overwhelm you, do you not think that many of us would believe you to be guilty? And being disappointed would abandon you. I am sure of it. There will be confusion among my disciples. But then peace will reign. And there will be a cohesion of all the better parts. Upon which the fortifying wise spirit. The divine spirit will come. After my sacrifice and my triumph. Jesus, in order that I may not deviate and may not be scandalized in the dreadful hour. Tell me, what will they do to you? You are asking me a great thing. Tell me, my Lord. It will be a torture for you to know it exactly. It does not matter for the love that has united. It is not to be known. Tell me and then cancel it from my memory until the hour it is to be accomplished. Then bring it back to my memory. Together with the remembrance of this hour, I will thus not be scandalized and I will not become your enemy in the depth of my heart. It will be of no avail because you, too, will yield. To the store. Tell me, my lord! I shall be accused, betrayed, captured, 
tortured, crucified. No! shouts James, writhing as if he had been struck to death. No! he repeats. If they do that to you, what will they do to us? How shall we be able to continue your work? I cannot accept the position you have destined to me. I cannot. When you die, I will die too, having no more strength. Jesus, listen to me. Don't leave me without you. Promise me at least that. I promise that I will come and guide you with my spirit after my glorious resurrection has freed me from the restrictions of matter. You and I will be again one thing only, as we are, now that you are between my arms. James, in fact, has begun to weep on Jesus' chest. Do not weep any more. Let us come out of this bright and painful hour of ecstasy, as one comes out from the shadow of death, remembering everything except the act of dying, a fright that freezes one's blood and last but one minute, and as an accomplished fact it lasts forever. Come, I will kiss you thus, to help you forget the burden of my fate as man. You will remember all this at the right moment as you asked. Here, I kiss your lips that you have to repeat my words to the people of Israel, and your heart that will have to love as I told you. And there, on your temple, where life will cease together with the last word of loving faith in me. My beloved brother, I will come to you and be with you in the meetings of believers, in the hour of meditation, in those of danger, and in the hour of your death. No one, not even your angel, will receive your spirit, because I, They remain embraced for a long time and James seems to doze off in the joy of God's kisses that make him forget his suffering. When he lifts his head, he has become once again James of Alves, peaceful and kind, so much like Joseph, the spouse of Mary. He smiles at Jesus. His smile is more mature, somewhat sad, but always so sweet. Let us take our food, James, and then we shall sleep under the stars. At daybreak we shall go down to the valley, back to men. And Jesus sighs, but he ends with a smile, and to Mary. And what shall I tell my mother, Jesus, and my companions? They will ask me many questions. You can tell them everything I told you making you consider Elijah in his answers to Ahab, to the people on the mountain, and meditating on the power of a man loved by God to achieve what is wanted of people and all the elements, his zeal which devours him for the Lord, and how I made you consider that with peace, and in peace one understands and serves God. You will say to them, as I said to you, come. And as Elijah put his mantle on Elisha, so you, by the mantle of charity, will be able to gain for the Lord new servants of God. And to those who are always worried, say that I drew to your attention the joyful freedom from past things, which Elisha shows when he got rid of the oxen and plough. Tell them how I reminded you that evil and no good befalls those who want miracles through Beelzebub, as it happened to Ahaziah, according to the word of Elijah. And finally tell them how I promised you that for those who are faithful until death, 
the purifying fire of love will come to burn their imperfections and take them straight to heaven. The rest is for you only. Footnote number one. Maria Votorta is addressing her confessor. The poem of The Man God, the second year of the public life. Chapter 258. Jesus and his cousin James on their way back from Mount Carmel. 21st of August, 1945. Jesus leaves the tableland on Mount Carmel and descends along dewy paths through woods that became lively with trills and voices in the early sunshine gilding the eastern side of the mountain. When the sun dissolves the heat haze, the beauty of the whole plain of Israel and is displayed with its orchards and vineyards all gathered around houses. It looks like a carpet, mostly green, with a few yellowish oases strewn with red areas, which are the fields where the corn has been cut and poppies now sparkle. A carpet enclosed by the triangular bezel of Mount Carmel, Mount Tabor and Mount Hermon, Little Hermon, and by more remote mountains, the names of which I do not know which conceal the Jordan and are linked to the southeast, to the mountains of Samaria. Jesus stops and looks pensively at all that area of Palestine. James looks at him and says, Are you looking at the beauty of this region? Yes, also at that. But more than anything else, I was thinking of future pilgrimages and of the necessity of sending disciples without any delay to do real missionary work, and not just limited work as we have done now. There are many areas where I am not yet known, and I do not want to leave any place without the knowledge of me. It is a worry constantly present in my mind, to go and do everything while I can. Now and again something happens that delays you, Rather than delay me, they cause changes to my itinerary, because the trips we make are never useless. But there is still so much to be done. Also, because after being absent from one place, I find that many hearts have gone back to where they started from, and I have to start all over again. Yes, the apathy of souls, their inconstancy and affection for evil are depressing and disgusting. Depressing, yes, but do not say disgusting. The work of God is never disgusting. We must feel pity, not disgust, for poor souls. We must always have the heart of a father, of a good father. A good father is never disgusted at the diseases of his children. We must never have a dislike for anyone. Jesus, may I ask you a few questions? I did not sleep last night, but I pondered very much while watching you sleep. You looked so young when you were asleep. My brother, you were smiling, with your head resting on your folded arm, just like the posture of a little boy. I could see you very well in the clear moonlight of last night, and I pondered, and many questions came up from my heart. Tell me. I was saying, I must ask Jesus how we shall be able to set up that organized body which you called church, and in which there will be hierarchies, if I understood properly, considering how incapable we are. Will you tell us what we must do, or shall we have to do it by ourselves? When the time comes, I will tell you who is its head. Nothing else. While I am with you, I will inform you of its various classes with the differences between apostles, disciples, and women disciples, because they cannot be avoided. But as I want the disciples to respect and obey the apostles, so the apostles must love and be patient with the disciples. 
And what shall we have to do? Preach you all the time and nothing else? That is essential. Then you will have to absolve in my name and bless. Readmit to grace. Administer the sacraments that I will institute. What are they? They are supernatural and spiritual means, applied also through material means, which are used to convince men that the priest is really doing something. You know that man does not believe unless he sees. He always needs something to tell him that there is something. That is why when I work miracles, I impose my hands, or I wet with saliva, or I give a morsel of soak to bread. I could work a miracle by means of a simple thought. But do you think that in that case people would say, God has worked the miracle? They would say, the invalid is cured, because it was time for him to be cured. And they would ascribe the merit to the doctor, or to medicines, or to the physical strength of the invalid. The same will apply to sacraments, religious formalities to administer grace or give it again, or fortify it in believers. John, for instance, used to immerse sinners into water to symbolize cleanness from sin. In actual fact, the mortification of confessing oneself unclean because of sins committed was more useful than the water that washed only the body. I will have a baptism as well. My baptism, which will not be only a symbol, but will really cleanse a soul of the original sin and give back to it the spiritual state that Adam and Eve possessed before they sinned. A state which is now improved because it will be granted through the merits of the man, God. But water does not descend upon the soul. A soul is spiritual. Who can touch it in a newborn baby, in an adult or in an old person? Nobody. See, you admit that water is a material means, with no effect on a spiritual thing. So, it will not be the water, but the word of the priest, a member of the Church of Christ, consecrated in his service, or the word of another true believer who may replace him in exceptional cases that will work the miracle of redeeming the baptized person from original sin. All right, but man commits sin of his own. Who will remove the other sins? It will always be the priest, James. If an adult is baptized, also the other sins will be removed with the original one. If a man has been baptized and he commits sins, the priest will absolve him in the name of God, one and trying, and through the merits of the incarnate word, as I do with sins. But you were holy. We, you must be holy, because you touch holy things, and you administer what belongs to God. So, shall we baptize the same man several times as John does? In fact, he grants immersion into water as many times as one goes to him. John's baptism purifies only through the humility of the person who is immersed into water. I already told you, you shall not baptize again those who have already been baptized. Unless a person has been baptized with a schismatic formula and not with the apostolic one in which case a second baptism is to be administered, subject to a precise request of the person to be christened, if adult, and subject to a clear statement that the person in question wishes to become a member of the true church. In all the other cases, to give a soul its friendship and peace with God, you will use the words of forgiveness joined to the merits of Christ and the soul that has come to you with true repentance and a humble confession will be absolved. 
And if a man cannot come, because he is so ill that he cannot be moved, will he die in sin? Will the fear for the judgment of God be added to the misery of his agony? No. The priest will go to the dying person and give absolution. In actual fact, he will give the person a more ample form of absolution, not a comprehensive one, but an absolution for each and every sense organ by means of which man generally sins. We have in Israel the sacred oil, compound according to the prescriptions given by the Most High, with which the altar, the pontiff, priests and kings are consecrated. Man is really an altar, and he becomes king through his election to a throne in heaven. He can therefore be consecrated with the oil of unction. The holy oil will be taken with other rites of the Israelite cult and included in my church, but with different uses. Because not everything in Israel is evil and to be rejected. Nay, many recollections of the old stock will be in my church. And one will be the oil of unction, which will be used also in the believers when they become priests and heirs of the kingdom, or when they need the greatest help to appear before God with their bodies and senses cleansed of all sins. The grace of God will assist both the soul and the body, if God so wishes for the benefit of the sick person. Our body does not always react against diseases, also because its peace is upset by remorse and because of the work of Satan, who through the death of the sick person hopes to gain a soul to his kingdom and cause despair to those who are left behind. The sick person passes from the satanic grip and internal emotion to a peaceful state through the certainty of God's forgiveness, which also brings about Satan's departure. And since the gift of grace was coupled in our first progenitors with the gift of immunity from diseases and from all forms of sorrow, the sick person who has been restored to grace, as great as the grace of a newborn baby christened with my baptism, may get over the illness. The sick man is assisted also by the prayers of his brethren, who are obliged to have not only physical but above all spiritual pity on invalids, in order to obtain both physical and spiritual salvation for their brother. Prayer is in fact a form of miracle, James. The prayer of a just man, as you have seen in Elijah, can be very powerful. I understand only a little of what you say. But what I do understand fills me with deep respect for the sacerdotal character of your priests. If I have understood you correctly, we shall have many points in common with you. Preaching, absolution, miracles, three sacraments, therefore. No, James, preaching and miracles are not sacraments. The sacraments will be more, seven like the sacred candelabrum of the temple and the gifts of the spirit of love. And in fact, the sacraments are gifts and flames and are granted to man so that they may burn forever before the Lord. There will be a sacrament also for the marriage of man, and it is already symbolized in the holy marriage of Sarah, the daughter of Raguel, after she was freed from the demon. The sacrament will give the married couple all the assistance needed to live together according to the law and the wishes of God. Husband and wife also become the ministers of a right, the right of procreation. Husband and wife become also the priests of a small church, their family. They must therefore be consecrated in order to procreate with the blessing of God and to bring up a progeny that will bless the most holy name of God. And by whom will priests be consecrated? By me, before I leave you. You will afterwards 
consecrate to your successors and those whom you will aggregate to yourselves to propagate the Christian faith. You will teach us, will you not? I and he whom I will send to you. Also his coming will be a sacrament. It will be granted voluntarily by the Most Holy God in his first epiphany, and it will then be given by those who have received the fullness of priesthood. It will be strength and intelligence, confirmation in faith. It will be holy piety and fear. It will be assistance in advice and supernatural wisdom. And it will be possession of a justice that by its nature and power will turn the child who receives it into an adult. But you cannot for the time being understand that. But he will make you understand. The divine paraclete, the eternal love, when the moment comes for you to receive him. And likewise, you cannot for the time being understand another sacrament. It is so sublime that it is almost incomprehensible to angels. And yet, you simple men will understand it by virtue of faith and love. I solemnly tell you that those who will love it and nourish their souls by it will be able to trample on the demon with impunity, because I will then be with them. Try to remember these things, brother. You will have to repeat them many times to your companions and to believers. You will all already know through your divine ministry, but you will be able to say, He told me one day, coming down from Mount Carmel. He told me everything, because since then I was destined to be the head of the Church of Israel. Here is another question I wanted to ask you. I was thinking about it last night. Shall I have to say to my companions, I will be the head here? I don't like it. I will do it if you tell me, but I do not like it. Be not afraid. The paraclete spirit will descend upon you all and will instill holy thoughts into you. You will all have the same thoughts for the glory of God in his church. And will there be no more of those so unpleasant discussions that we have now? Even Judas of Simon will no longer be the cause of disagreement? He will no longer be. Do not worry. But there will still be differences of opinion. That is why I said to you, be careful and watch, without ever tiring, doing your duty to the end. Another question, my lord. How am I to behave during persecutions? By what you say, it looks as if I am the only one of the twelve to be left. So the others will go away to avoid persecutions. And what about me? You will stay in your place. Because if it is necessary that you are not all exterminated until the church is well consolidated, which justifies the dispersion of many disciples and of almost all the apostles, nothing would justify your desertion and your abandoning the church of Jerusalem. Nay, the greater its danger is, the more you will have to watch over it, as if it were your dearest child about to die. Your example will strengthen the souls of believers and they will need it to pass the test. The weaker you see them, the more you will have to support them with pity and wisdom. If you are strong, do not be pitiless with weak people. Support them, saying, I have received everything from God to become so strong. I must admit it humbly and act charitably on behalf of those who have not been blessed with so many gifts of God. And you must share your strength through your word, your assistance, your calm 
and example. And if among the believers there should be some wicked ones, who are the cause of danger and of scandal to the others, what shall I do? Be wise when you accept them, because it is better to be few and good than many and not good. You know the old apologue of the good apples and the bad ones. Make sure it does not happen also in your church. But should you find people who betray you as well, endeavour in every way to get them to repent, using severe measures as a last resource. But if it is a matter of small individual faults, do not be so severe as to dismay people. Forgive. A heart is more easily redeemed by forgiveness, joined to tears and loving words, than by anathema. If the fault is a grave one, but is the result of a sudden attack by Satan, and is so grave that the culprit feels the need to run away from your presence, go and look for the offender. Because he is a lamb led astray, and you are the shepherd. Do not be afraid of degrading yourself by going along muddy paths, searching pools and precipices. Your forehead will then be crowned with the crown of the martyr of love, and it will be the first of the three crowns. And if you are betrayed yourself, as the Baptist was, and like many others, because every holy man has its traitor, forgive Forgive the traitor more than you would forgive anybody else. Forgive as God forgave man, and as he will forgive. Call him son again, who will grieve you, because that is how the Father calls you through my lips. And truly, there is no man who has not caused deep sorrow to the Father in heaven. There is a long period of silence while they cross pastures strewn with grazing sheep. At last, Jesus asks, Have you no more questions to ask me? No, Jesus. And this morning I understood my tremendous mission more clearly. Because you are less upset than you were yesterday. When your time comes... You will be even more calm, and you will understand even better. I will remember all these things, everything, except what, James? The thing, what did not let me look at you last night without weeping, what I do not really know, whether you told me, and whether I should believe it, if really told by you, or whether it was a fright by the demon. How can you be so calm if, if that should really happen to you? And would you be calm if I said to you, that shepherd is dragging himself along with great difficulty because of his mind leg, try to cure him in the name of God? No, my lord, I would be beside myself thinking that I was tempted to usurp your place. And if I ordered you, I would do it out of obedience, and I would no longer be upset, because I would know that you want it, and I would not be afraid of not knowing how to do it. Because if you sent me, you would certainly give me the strength to do what you want. You said so, and you are right. You can thus see that I, by obeying the Father, am always in peace. James lowers his head, weeping. Do you really want to forget? As you wish, my Lord. You have two options, to forget or to remember. By forgetting, you will be relieved from sorrow and from the necessity of being absolutely silent with your companions. 
but you will be left unprepared. By remembering, you will become prepared for your mission. Because in order never to complain and to be strengthened spiritually, seeing the whole of Christ in the brightest light, one thing only is necessary, to remember what the Son of Man suffers in his earthly life. Make your choice. To believe, to remember, to love. That is what I would like. And to die as soon as possible, my Lord. And James continues to weep silently, if it was not for the tears shining on his brown beard, one would not realise that he is weeping. Jesus lets him weep. Then James asks, And if in future you should allude again to, to your martyrdom, Shall I say that I know? No, be quiet. Joseph was able to be silent on his sorrow of a bridegroom when he thought his bride was unfaithful to him and on the mysteries of her virginal conception and of my nature. Imitate him. That was a tremendous secret as well. And it was to be kept. Because if it had been disclosed out of pride or carelessness, the whole redemption would have been endangered. Satan is constant in watching and acting, remember that. If you spoke now, you would damage too many people and too many things. Be silent. I will. And it will be a double burden. Jesus does not reply. He lets James weep freely sheltered by his linen hood. They meet a man carrying an unhappy child tied to his back. Is he your son? asks Jesus. Yes, he was born thus and was the cause of his mother's death. Now my mother is also dead and when I go back to my work, I take him with me to watch him. I am a woodcutter. I lay him on the grass on my mantle. And while I cut trees down, he plays with flowers, the poor wretch. It is a great misfortune. Yes, it is. But we must accept peacefully what God wants. Goodbye, man. Peace be with you. Goodbye. Peace to you. The man climbs the mountain. Jesus and James continue to descend. How many misfortunes. I was hoping that you would cure him says James with a sigh. Jesus does not appear to hear. Master, if that man had known that you are the Messiah, perhaps he would have asked you to work a miracle. Jesus does not reply. Jesus, will you let me go back and tell him? I feel sorry for that boy. My heart is already so grieved. Give me at least the joy of seeing the little fellow cured. You may go. I will wait for you here. James runs back. He comes up with the man and calls him. Man, stop! Listen! The man who was with me is the Messiah. Give me your boy that I may take him to him. You may come as well, if you wish so, to see whether the master will cure him. Go, man. I have all this wood to cut. I am already late because of the child. And if I do not work, I get no food. I am poor, and he costs me so much. I do believe in the Messiah, but it is better if you speak to him on my behalf. James bends to pick up the boy lying on the grass. Be careful, warns the woodcutter. He's painful all over. In fact, as soon as James attempts to lift him, the boy weeps mournfully. Oh, how painful! exclaims James with a sigh. A dreadful pain, says the woodcutter working with a saw on a hard trunk, and he adds, Could you not cure him? 
I am not the Messiah. I am only a disciple. Well, doctors learn from other doctors. Disciples learn from their master. Come on, be good. Don't make him suffer. Try. If the master wanted to come, he would have come. He sent you either because he does not want to cure him or because he wants you to cure him. James is undecided. He then makes up his mind. He stands up and he prays as he had seen Jesus pray. Finally, he enjoins. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Messiah of Israel and Son of God, be cured. And immediately afterwards, he kneels down saying, Oh, my Lord, forgive me. I acted without your permission. But I did it out of pity for this child of Israel. Have mercy, my God, on him and on me, a sinner. And he sheds bitter tears, bent over the boy, outstretched on the cross. His tears fall onto the twisted, inert legs. Jesus suddenly appears on the path. No one sees him because the woodcutter is working. James is weeping. And the boy is looking at him curiously. And then caressing him, he asks, Why are you weeping? And he stretches out his little hand to caress him again. And without realizing it, he sits up by himself. He stands up and embraces James to comfort him. It is James's cry that makes the woodcutter turn round. And he then sees his boy standing straight on his legs, which are no longer inert or twisted, and to turn him round to see Jesus. There he is, he shouts, pointing to the back of James, who turns round and sees Jesus looking at him, beaming with joy. Master, I do not know how it happened, Pity that man, this child, forgive me. Stand up. Disciples are not above their master, but they can do what the master does when they do it for a holy reason. Stand up and come with me. May you too be blessed, and remember that also the servants of God accomplish the deeds of the Son of God. And he goes away dragging James, who continues to say, How could I do that? I do not understand yet. How did I work a miracle in your name? By being pitiful, James. Through your desire to make me loved, by that innocent child, and by that man who believed and doubted at the same time. John worked a miracle near Jebneel out of love curing a dying man whom he anointed while praying. You cured here by means of your tears and your pity and with your faith in my name. See how peaceful it is to serve the Lord when a disciple has good intentions. Now let us walk fast because that man is following us. It is not right that your companions should be aware of this the time being. I will soon be sending you in my name. A deep sigh of Jesus. As Judas of Simon is anxious to work, another heavy sigh. And you will work, but it will not do everybody good. Quick, James, your brother, Simon Peter and the others would suffer if they knew about this, as if it were favouritism, but it is not. It is to prepare someone among you twelve who may be capable of guiding the others. Let us go on to the gravel bed of the torrent that is covered with leaves. All traces of us will be lost. Are you sorry for the boy? Oh, we shall meet him again. The Poem of the Man-God, the Second Year of the Public Life, 
Chapter 259 Peter speaks to Doris's peasants about the love which is salvation. 22nd of August, 1945 My dear friends, what are you doing near this fire? Asks Jesus when he finds his disciples round a well-fed fire which blazes in the early evening shadows at a crossroads in the plain at Esrelin. The apostles start, as they did not see him come, and they forget the fire to greet the master. They look as if they had not seen him for ages. They then explain. Listen, we settled an issue between two brothers from Jezreel, and they were so pleased that they gave us a lamb each. We decided to cook them and give them to Doris's men. Micah of Johanan slaughtered and prepared them, and we're now going to roast them. Your mother has gone with Mary and Susanna to tell Doris's men to come here after Vesper, when the stewards go home to Tipple. Women do not attract attention so much. We endeavoured to see them pretending we were wayfarers passing by the fields, but we did not do much. We decided to gather here this evening and say a little more for their souls and satisfy also their bodies, as you have done in the past. And now that you are here, it will be even more pleasant. Who was going to speak? Well, a little each, informally. We're not capable of doing any more. Also because John, the zealot, and your brother do not want to speak. Judas of Simon and Bartholomew are not anxious to speak either. We even quarrelled over that, says Peter. Why do those five not want to speak? John and Simon, because they say that it is not right that they should be the ones who always speak. Your brother, because he wants me to speak and says that if I never start. Bartholomew, because because he's afraid that he may speak too masterly and that he may not succeed in convincing people. You can see that they are excuses. And you, Judas of Simon, why do you not want to speak? For the same reasons as the others, for all those reasons, because they are all fair. Many reasons, but not one, is specified. I will now decide, and my verdict will be inappellable. You, Simon of Jonah, shall speak, as Thaddeus wisely says, and you, Judas of Simon, shall also speak. Thus, one of the many reasons, the one known to God and to you, will no longer exist. Master, believe me, there is nothing else, Judas endeavours to retort. But Peter cuts him short, saying, Oh, my lord, how can I speak in your presence? I shall never be able. I am afraid you might laugh at me. You do not want to be alone. You do not want to be with me. What do you want? You are right. But what shall I say? There is your brother coming with the lambs. Help him. And while you are cooking them, think it over. Everything helps to find a subject. Also a lamb on the spit? Asks Peter incredulously. Yes. So obey. Peter heaves a deep sigh, a really pitiful one, but does not reply. He goes towards Andrew and helps him to fix the lambs onto a sharpened stick, which is used as a spit. And he watches them cooking with such a grave countenance that he looks like a judge on the point of passing sentence. Judas of Simon, let us go and meet the women, orders Jesus and he goes away through the barren fields of Doris. Judas, a good disciple does not despise what his master does not despise. He says after a little while, without wasting words. Master, I do not despise, but like Bartholomew, I feel that I would not be understood and I prefer not to speak. Nathaniel is afraid 
that he may not fulfill my desire, which is to enlighten and relieve hearts. He is at fault too, because he lacks confidence in the Lord. But you are much more at fault, because you are not afraid of not being understood, but you disdain being understood by poor peasants, who are ignorant of everything except virtue. They surpass many of you. In fact, as far as virtue is concerned, you have not yet understood anything, Judas. The gospel is really the good news brought to the poor, the sick, the afflicted and the slaves. Later, it will be given also to others. But it is given just to assist and relieve those who suffer from all kinds of misfortune. Judas lowers his head but does not reply. The Blessed Virgin, Mary of Clopas and Susanna, appear, coming out from a thicket. I greet you, Mother. Peace to you, women. Son, I went to those poor wretches. But I was given news that did not make me suffer so much. Doris has got rid of this land and Johannan has taken it. It is not paradise, but it is no longer hell. The steward told the peasants today. He has already gone taking away on his carts all the corn to the last grain, and thus leaving everybody without anything to eat. And as Johannan's steward today has food only for his own men, Doris's peasants were to be left with nothing to eat. Those lambs are really providential. It is also providential that the men no longer belong to Doris. We saw their houses. Pigsties, says Susanna, who is obviously scandalised. The poor people are so happy, concludes Mary of Clopas. I am happy too. They will be better off than previously, replies Jesus, going towards the apostles. John of Endor joins him, carrying some pitchers of water, which he is taking along with the Mastias. Johannan's men gave them to us, he explains after greeting Jesus respectfully. They all go towards the spot where they are roasting the two lambs in a thick cloud of greasy smoke. Peter keeps turning his spit, and in the meantime he broods over his thoughts. Judas Thaddeus, instead, is walking backwards and forwards, engrossed in conversation, holding one arm round his brother's waist. Of the other apostles, some bring firewood, some lay the table, carrying large stones, to be used as seats or as a table. I do not know. Doris's peasants arrive. They are thinner and more ragged than ever, but they are so happy. They are about twenty in number, and there is not even a child or a woman with them. Poor men, all alone. Peace to you all, and let us bless the Lord for giving you a better master. Let us bless him by praying for the conversion of the man who has caused you to suffer so much. Is that right? Are you happy, old father? I am glad to. I shall be able to come more frequently with the boy. Have they told you? You are weeping for joy, are you not? Come here, do not be afraid, he says, speaking to Marcian's grandfather, who stoops, kissing his hand and weeping, whispers. I beg nothing else of the most he has granted me more than I asked. I would now like to die, lest I should live so long that suffering may overwhelm me again. The peasants, who were somewhat embarrassed being with the master, soon take heart again. And when the two lambs are laid on large leaves arranged on the stones brought previously, and the portions are made, 
each of which is placed on a large bread cake that serves also as a dish. They relax in their simplicity, and they eat with relish, satisfying their hunger after starving so long. They talk of the recent events. One of them says, I have always cursed locusts, moles and ants, but from now on they will look like messengers of the Lord to me, because it is through them that we are leaving hell. And although the comparison of ants and locusts with angelical cohorts is somewhat queer, nobody laughs, because they all perceive the tragic circumstances concealed in those words. The fire lights up the assembly, but their faces do not look at the flame, neither do they pay much attention to what is in front of them. All eyes are turned towards Jesus' face, and are diverted only for a few moments, when Mary of Alphaeus, who is busy making portions, lays more meat on the flat bread cakes of the hungry peasants, and she finishes her work by wrapping two roasted legs in some large leaves, and says to Marciam's grandfather, Take this, you will have a morsel each also tomorrow, and Johanan's stewards in the meantime will provide something. But... What about you? We will have less to carry. Take it, man. Of the two lambs, there is nothing left but the picked bones and the persistent smell of dripping fat, still burning on the fire, which is dying out, and its light is being replaced by moonlight. Johannan's men also join the others. It is the moment to speak to them. Jesus' blue eyes look up in search of Judas, who is sitting near a tree, half hidden in the shade. And when Jesus sees that Judas pretends he does not understand, he calls in a loud voice, Judas! Judas is thus compelled to stand up and come forward. Do not seclude yourself. Please, evangelize in my place. I am very tired. In any case... If I had not come this evening, one of you would have had to speak. Master, I do not know what to say. At least ask me some questions. It is not for me to ask you them. Men, what do you wish to hear or to have explained to you? He then asks the peasants. The men look at one another. They are uncertain. At last... A peasant asks. We have become aware of the power of the Lord and of his bounty, but we know little about his doctrine. Perhaps we will now be able to learn a little more, being with Johanna. But we are really anxious to know which are the essential things we must do in order to gain the kingdom that the Messiah promises, as we can practically do nothing. Will we be able to gain it? Judas replies. You are certainly in a very painful situation. Everything in you and around you conspires to drive you away from the kingdom. The lack of freedom to come to the master whenever you wish. Your condition of servants of a master who, if not Aina like Doris, is as far as we know, a Molossian hound who keeps his servants prisoners. Your sufferings and dejection are unfavourable conditions to your election to the kingdom. Because it is difficult for you not to cherish resentment and feelings of grudge, criticism and revenge for the man who treats you so hard. And the bare essential is to love God and one's neighbour. Otherwise there is no salvation. You must be watchful to maintain your hearts passively submitted to God's will, which is revealed to you in your destiny, and bear your master patiently without ever taking the liberty of expressing a judgment that certainly could not be kind to your master or express gratitude for you. You. In short, you must not ponder on your situation to avoid feelings of rebellion that would kill love. And he who does not love will not reach salvation, because he infringes the first precept. 
but I am almost certain that you will be saved, because I see that you have good will joined to kind souls, which gives rise to hope that you will be able to refrain from hatred and desire for revenge. In any case, God's mercy is so great that he will remit what is still lacking for your perfection. There is silence. Jesus has lowered his head so much that his countenance cannot be seen. But the faces of the rest can be seen, and their expression is certainly not happy. The peasants look more dejected than previously. The apostles and the women seem surprised and almost frightened. We shall endeavour to repress every thought against patience and forgiveness the old man replies humbly another peasant says with a sigh it will certainly be difficult for us to reach the perfection of love because it is already a great thing that we have not become the murderers of those who tortured us a soul suffers a great deal and even when it does not hate, it finds it difficult to love. Like emaciated children who grow with difficulty. No, man. I, instead, think that just because you have suffered so much, without becoming murderous and revengeful, your souls love more strongly than ours. You love without even realising it. Says Peter to comfort them, and he becomes aware that he has spoken, and he stops to say, Oh, master, but you told me that I had to speak and to find the subject even in the lambs that I was roasting, and I continued to watch them to find some good words for our brothers here, and for their situation, but as I am stupid, I did not find anything suitable, and I do not know how. I found that I was wandering away in thoughts, which I do not know whether they are strange, in which case they are certainly mine, or holy, and if so, they have certainly come from heaven. I will express them exactly as they came to me, and you, master, will explain them to me or reproach me, and you, my friends, will bear with me. I was looking first at the fire, and I thought, now, what is a fire made of? Of wood. But wood does not burn by itself. And if it is not dry, it will not burn at all. Because water makes it heavy and prevents the tinder from lighting it. And when wood is dead, it rots, and woodworms pulverise it. But it will not catch fire by itself. And yet, if one arranges it in a suitable manner, and holding tinder and flint close to it, produces a spark and helps it to light by blowing on thin branches to increase the flame, because one always starts from the smallest things. Then the flame rises and becomes beautiful and useful and sets everything on fire, also thick pieces of wood. And I said to myself, We are like wood. We do not light up by ourselves. But we must take care not to be impregnated with the heavy moisture of flesh and blood, to allow the tinder to be lit up by a spark. And we must desire to be burnt. Because if we remain inactive, we may be destroyed by inclement weather and by woodworms, that is, by mankind and by the demon. Whereas if we give ourselves to the fire of love, it will begin to burn the thinner branches and will destroy them, and I considered the little branches to be imperfections, then it will grow and set on fire the bigger pieces of wood, that is the stronger passions, and we, being like wood, something material, hard, dull, even ugly, will become the beautiful, incorporeal, agile, bright thing that a flame is. And that, because we have given ourselves to love, 
which is the flint and tinder that turns us poor sinners into future angels and citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And that was one thought. Jesus has raised his head a little and is listening with his eyes closed and the shadow of his smile on his lips. The others looking, they are still surprised, but no longer frightened. Peter continues to speak peacefully. Another thought came to my mind, looking at the lambs that were roasting. Do not say that my thoughts are childish. The master told me to look for them in what I was watching, and I obeyed. So, I was looking at the lambs, and I said, There you are. They are two innocent, meek animals. Our holy scriptures are full of gentle allusions to lambs, both to remember him who is the promised Messiah and Saviour, as was symbolised in the Mosaic Lamb, and to remind us that God will have mercy on us. The prophet says so. He comes to gather his flock together, to assist wounded sheep and carry those whose limbs are fractured. How much goodness, I was saying to myself. We must not be afraid of a God who promises us, poor wretches, so much mercy. But, I still said to myself, we must be meek, at least meek, since we are no longer innocent. We must be meek and anxious to be consumed by love. Because what would the most beautiful and pure little lamb also become after it has been slaughtered? if it is not cooked on a fire, a putrid carrion. Fire instead turns it into wholesome, blessed food. And I concluded, in short, all good things are achieved through love. Love relieves us of the burden of humanity. It makes us bright and useful. It enables us to be good to our brothers and grateful to God. It elevates our good natural qualities, raising them to a height that bears the name of supernatural virtues. And he who is virtuous is holy, and who is holy possesses heaven. So it is not science or fear that open the way to perfection for us. It is love. It detaches us from evil, much more than the fear of punishment. As through it, we do not wish to grieve the Lord. It makes us pity our brothers and love them because they come from God. Therefore, love is the salvation and the sanctification of man. That is what I was thinking while watching my roast and obeying my Jesus. Forgive me if that is all, but those thoughts did me good. I offer them to you, hoping that they may do you good as well. Jesus opens his eyes, which are radiant with joy. He stretches out one arm and lays his hand on Peter's shoulder. I solemnly tell you that you have found the words that you had to find. Obedience and love made you find them, and humility and the desire to give solace to your brothers will make of them as many stars in their dark sky. May God bless you, Simon of Jonah. May God bless you, Master. And are you not speaking? They will be commencing their new service tomorrow. I will bless their commencement with my word. Go now in peace. And may God be with you. The Poem of the Man God The Second Year of the Public Life Chapter 260 Jesus to Johannan's Peasants Love is Obedience 23rd of August, 1945 It is not yet daybreak. Jesus is standing in the middle of Doris's ruined orchard. Rows of withered or withering trees, many of which have been felled or uprooted. Around him there are Doris's and Johannan's peasants and the apostles, some standing, some sitting on the felled trunks. Jesus begins to speak. 
another day and another departure. And I am not the only one who is leaving. You are departing as well. If not materially, morally, as you are going to another master. You will thus be joined to other good and pious peasants, and you will form one family in which you will be able to speak of God and of his word without having to resort to subterfuges to do so. Sustain one another in your faith, help one another, bear one another's faults and edify one another. That is love. And you heard from my apostles last night, although in different ways, that love is salvation. Simon Peter, with his simple, kind word, made you ponder how love changes your heavy nature into a supernatural nature, how a man without love may become corrupt and corrupting, like a slaughtered animal that is not cooked, or he may become useless like wood rotten with water that will not burn in a fire, and how love makes a man live in the atmosphere of God, and thus he comes out of corruption and becomes useful to his neighbour. Because, believe me, my dear children, love is the great strength of the universe. I will never tire telling you. All the misfortunes on the earth come from lack of love. Beginning from the death and diseases caused by the lack of love of Adam and Eve for the Most High Law. Because love is obedience. He who does not obey is a rebel. He who is a rebel does not love him against whom he rebels. Where do other general or particular misfortunes come from, such as wars or the downfall of contending families? From selfishness, which is estrangement and the ruin of welfare through God's punishment follows the downfall of families, because God sooner or later will strike him who lives without loving. I know that it is rumoured here, and because of such rumour I am hated by some, looked at with fearful hearts by others, or invoked as a fresh punishment, or tolerated for fear of a punishment. I know that it is rumoured here that it was my look that made these fields cursed. It was not my look, but the punished selfishness of an unjust and cruel man. If my eyes were to scorch the land of all those who hate me, very little green would be left in Palestine. I never avenge myself for ill will manifested towards me. But I hand over to the Father those who stubbornly persist in their sin of selfishness towards their neighbour and sacrilegiously deride the precept of love. And the more one endeavours to persuade them to love by means of word and suitable deeds, the more cruel they become. I am always willing to raise my hand and say to a repentant soul, I absolve you. Go in peace. But I will not offend love by agreeing to inconvertible harshness. Always bear that in mind, to see things in the right light and disprove tales which are always different from the truth, whether they are told out of veneration or angry fear. You are changing, Master, but you will not be leaving this land to take care of which in its present state seems madness. And yet I say to you, do your duty on it. You have done it so far for fear of cruel punishment. Do it also now, although you are aware that you will not be dealt with as in the past. Nay, I say to you, the more humanely you are treated, the more diligently and cheerfully you are to work to return humanity through your work to those who grant you humanity. Because while it is true that masters are obliged to be humane to their subordinates, 
remembering that we are all of one race, and that every man is born nude in the same manner, and dies putrefying in the same manner, whether he is rich or poor, and that wealth is not the work of those who possess it, but of those who either honestly or dishonestly have amassed it for them, and that one is not to be proud of it or make use of it to oppress other people. Instead, one should use it with love, discretion and justice in order not to be looked at with severity by the true master who is God, who cannot be bought or seduced by jewels or gold talents, but can be made our friend only through our good deeds. Because while all that is true, it is also true that servants are obliged to be good to their masters. Do the will of God who wants you in your humble condition, with simplicity and goodwill. You know the parable of dives. You know that not gold, but virtue is rewarded in heaven. Virtue and submission to the will of God. May God the friend of man. I know that it is very difficult to be able to always see God through the deeds of men. It is easy in good people. It is difficult in bad people, because your souls may be induced to think that God is not good. But you must overcome the evil done to you by men tempted by Satan. And beyond that barrier that costs so many tears, you must see the truth of sorrow and its beauty. Sorrow comes from evil. But as God cannot abolish it, as the power of evil exists, and it is the assay of the spiritual gold of the children of God, he compels it to extract from its poison the juice of a medicine which gives eternal life. Because the pugency of sorrow inoculates good people with such reactions that spiritualize them more and more, making them holy. Be therefore good, respectful, submissive. Do not judge your masters. There is one who judges them. I would like the man who commands you to become just, to make your life easier and gain eternal life himself. But remember that the more burdensome the task to be accomplished is, the greater is the merit in the eyes of God. Do not try to defraud your master. Money or victuals obtained by fraud do not enrich or satisfy anybody's hunger. Let your hands, lips and hearts be pure. You will then keep the Sabbaths and holy days of obligation with grace in the eyes of God, even if you are compelled to work in the field. I solemnly tell you that your labour will be worth more than the hypocritical prayer of those who go to fulfil their duty to be praised by the world. Because in actual fact they infringe the precept by disobeying the law that prescribes that each man and all the members of his family are to keep the Sabbath and festivals of Israel for their own sake. Because prayer does not consist in actions, but in sentiments. And if your hearts love God in a holy manner, they will celebrate the rites of the Sabbath and festivals which other people prevent you from keeping, better than they do, and under every circumstance. I bless you, and I will now leave you because the sun is rising and I want to be on the hills before the heat of the day. We shall meet again soon, because autumn is not far. Peace be with you all, both the new and the old servants of Johannan, and may your hearts be serene. And Jesus sets out, passing through the peasants and blessing them one by one. Behind a large withered apple tree there is a man half-hidden.
But when Jesus is about to pass by, pretending he has not seen him, the man jumps out and says, I am Johanan's steward. He said to me, If the rabbi of Israel should come, let him stop in my fields and let him speak to my servants. They will do more work for us because he teaches only good things. And yesterday he wrote to me, informing me that, as from today, they, and he points to Doris's men, are with me, and these fields belong to Johanan. And he says, if the rabbi should come, listen to what he says and act accordingly. Let no calamity befall us, load him with honours, but see if you can get him to revoke the curse on the land. Because you must know that Johanan bought it out of spite, but I think he already regrets it. It will be a great achievement if we can turn into grazing ground. Did you hear me speak? Yes, master. You know then how to behave, both you and your master, to have God's blessing. Tell your master, and as far as you are concerned, moderate his orders, because you know how burdensome in actual fact is the work of a man in the field and you are well liked by your master. But it is better for you to lose his favour and your position rather than lose your soul. Goodbye. But I have to honour you. I am not an idol. I do not need interested honours to grant graces. Honour me with your soul by practising what you have heard, and you will serve God and your master at the same time. And Jesus, followed by the apostles and the women, and then by all the peasants, goes across the fields and directs his steps towards the hills, greeting everybody once again. The Poem of the Man God The Second Year of the Public Life Chapter 261 In the House of Dora and Philip, 24th of August, 1945. Jesus is going back towards Nazareth along a road which winds through hills, benefiting from the shade of olive groves and orchards spread in this fertile and well-cultivated region. But when he arrives at a crossroad, intersecting the road to Ptolemy, he stops and says, Let us stop at that house, where I have rested before. We shall have our meal, and while the sun follows its course, let us stay together before we part again. We shall go towards Tiberias. My mother and Mary will go to Nazareth, John and Amastius to Sicamina. Through an olive grove, they turn their steps towards a low, large house of peasants, adorned with the usual fig tree, and decked with the festoons of a vine which climbs up an outside staircase and expands its branches over the terrace. Peace be with you. I am here once again. Come, master. You are always welcome. May God grant peace to you and your friends, replies an elderly man who was crossing the yard carrying an armful of faggots. He then shouts, Sarah, Sarah, the master is here with his disciples. Add more flour to your bread. A woman covered with flour comes out of one of the rooms. She has obviously been sieving because she is still holding in her hands a sieve with some bran in it. She kneels in front of Jesus, smiling. Peace to you, woman. I brought you my mother, as I promised you. Here she is. And this is her sister-in-law, the mother of James and Judas. Where are Dina and Philip? The woman, after greeting the two Marys, replies. Dina had her third baby girl yesterday. We are a little sad because we have not yet been given a nephew. But we are happy too. Is that right, Matthias? Yes, because she is a beautiful baby, and she is always our blood. We will show her to you. 
Philip has gone to bring back Anna and Naomi from his old parents, but he will soon be back. The woman goes back to her baking while the man, after putting the faggots into the oven, takes care of the guests, offering them seeds and new milk if they want it, or fruit and olives if they prefer them. The room on the ground floor is cool and shady, large as it is, and with two doors, one in the front, the other at the back. The former being shaded by the large fig tree, the latter by a tall hedge of star-shaped flowers, which resemble sunflowers in shape, but with smaller corollas. Thus, an emerald green light enters into the large room, and it is of great relief to eyes tired by the strong sunshine. There are benches and tables in the room, which is perhaps the one where the women spin and weave, and the men repair their agricultural tools, or store their supplies of flour and fruit, as would appear by some small beams with many hooks and boards placed on consoles, besides long chests along the walls. Fluffy herds of linen or hemp look like loose plates hanging on the whitewashed wall, and a piece of bright red cloth stretched on an uncovered loom seems to cheer up the whole room with its pompous, joyful colour. The landlady who has finished her baking comes back and asks the guests whether they wish to see the newborn baby. Jesus replies, I will certainly bless her. Mary instead stands up, saying, I will come and greet the mother. All the women go out. It is very comfortable here, says Bartholomew, who was clearly very tired. Yes, it is quiet and shady. We shall end up by falling asleep, confirms Peter, who is already drowsy. In three days' time, you shall be at home for a long time. You will be able to rest, because you will be going evangelising in the neighbourhood, says Jesus. And what about you? I will stay at Capernaum most of the time, going to Bethsaida now and again, and I will evangelise those who join me there. Then at the moon of Tishri we shall begin to go about again. In the meantime, I will instruct you in the evening. Jesus becomes silent because he sees that sleep makes his words useless. He shakes his head, smiling, while watching the group overwhelmed by fatigue and sleeping in more or less comfortable postures. There is dead silence in the house and in the sunny country. It looks like an enchanted place. Jesus goes to the door near the hedge of flowers, and through the branches he contemplates the gentle Galilean hills, covered with grey, still olive trees. A light shuffling is heard above his head, together with the uncertain crying of a newborn baby. Jesus looks up and smiles at his mother, who is coming down, holding in her arms a white little bundle, from which three tiny red things emerge, a little head and two lively little fists. Look, Jesus, what a beautiful baby. She's somewhat like you when you were one day old. Your hair was so fair that you did not seem to have any. If it had not been even then raised in light curls like a woolly cloud, and you were as red as a rose as well. And look, look, now that she has opened her little eyes, here in the shade, and she's looking for her mother's breast. Her eyes are dark blue, like yours. Oh, darling, but I have no milk. My dear little one, my little rose, my little dove. And Our Lady loves the baby, who stops crying and falls asleep, gurgling like a little dove. Mother, did you do that to me also? asks Jesus, watching his mother lull the baby, with a cheek pressed against the little fair-haired head. Yes, son, but I called you my little lamb. She is beautiful, is she not? Really beautiful and strong. Her mother can be proud of her. 
confirms Jesus, who is also stooped watching the sleep of the innocent child. Instead, she's not. Her husband is angry because all the children are girls. It is true that men are better for the fields we have, but it is no fault of our daughter, says with a sigh the landlady who has just arrived. They are young. Let them love each other and they will have boys also, says the Lord confidently. Here is Philip. He will become gloomy now, moans the upset woman. And in a louder voice she says, Philip, the rabbi of Nazareth is here. I'm glad to see him. Peace to you, master. And to you, Philip. I saw your lovely baby. I am still looking at her because she is really praiseworthy. God blesses you with beautiful, healthy and good children. You must be very grateful to him. Are you not replying to me? You seem to be annoyed. I was hoping it was a boy. You are not going to tell me that you are unfair by accusing the innocent child of being a female, or that you are going to be hard on your wife, asks Jesus severely. I wanted a boy, for the Lord and for myself, exclaims Philip resentfully. And do you think you are going to get one through injustice and rebellion? Have you perhaps read God's thoughts? Are you above him, that you may say to him, Do that, because that is just? This woman disciple of mine has no children, for instance. And yet she said to me, I bless my sterility, which gives me wings to follow you. And this disciple, the mother of four sons, is anxious that all four of them may no longer belong to her. Is it true, Mary and Susanna? Do you hear them? And you, although you have been married only a few years to a fertile woman, and have been blessed with three rosebuds who seek your love, you are angry? With whom? Why? You do not want to tell me? Well, I will tell you, because you are selfish. Pocket your ill feeling. Open your arms to this child, born of your seed, and love her. Come on, take her. And Jesus takes the little bundle of linen and lays it in the arms of the young father. He then resumes speaking. Go to your wife who is weeping and tell her that you love her. Or God really will never give you a son. I am telling you. Go. The man goes up to his wife's room. Thank you, master, whispers his mother-in-law. He has been very rude since yesterday. The man comes down after a few minutes and says, I did it, my lord. She thanks you. And she told me to ask you to name the baby because in my unjust hatred, I had decided on a name that was too ugly. Call her Mary. She has sucked bitter tears with the first drop of milk, which was all so bitter because of your harshness. So she may be called Mary, and Mary will love her. Is that right, mother? Of course, poor little darling. And she's so pretty. And she will certainly be good and become a little star of heaven. They go back into the large room where the apostles are fast asleep, with the exception of Judas, who seems to be on tenter hooks. Did you want me, Judas? asks Jesus. No, master, but I cannot go to sleep and I would like to go out for a little while. Who stops you? I am going out as well. I am going up to that hillock. It is all in the shade. I will rest praying. You want to come with me? No, master, I would disturb you because I am not in condition to pray. Perhaps... Perhaps I am not feeling very well and 
That is upsetting me. Stay here, then. I do not force anybody. Goodbye. Goodbye, women. Mother, when John of Endor wakes, send him to me by himself. Yes, son. Peace be with you. Jesus goes out. Mary and Susanna bend to watch the cloth on the loom. Mary sits down with her hands in her lap, slightly bent. Perhaps she is praying too. Mary of Alve is soon tired of watching the work. She sits in the darkest corner and soon falls asleep. Susanna thinks it is a good idea and imitates her. Only Mary and Judas are awake. The former deeply absorbed in her thoughts. The latter looking at her with wide open gaze which never leaves her. In the end, he gets up and approaches her slowly and noiselessly. Although he is most definitely a handsome man, he gives me the impression of a feline or snake approaching its prey. I do not know why. Probably because I dislike him. I feel that his very steps are deceitful and dangerous. He calls her in a low voice. Mary, what do you want from me, Judas? Mary asks kindly, looking in him with her most loving eyes. I would like to speak to you. Do so, I am listening. Not here. I do not want anybody to hear me. Would you mind going out there for a moment? It is shady out there as well. Let us go. But see, they are all sleeping. You could have spoken here as well, says the Blessed Virgin. But she gets up and goes out before him, leaning against the tall, flowery hedge. What do you want from me, Judas? She asks again, staring at the Apostle, who appears to be somewhat upset and to find a difficulty in speaking. Are you not feeling well? Or have you done something wrong? And you do not know how to tell? Or do you feel that you are on the point of doing something wrong and it is a burden for you to admit that you attempted? Speak, son. As I cured your body, I will cure your soul. Tell me what is upsetting you, and if I can, I will help you. If I cannot do so by myself, I will tell Jesus. Even if you had committed a grave sin, he will forgive you if I ask him. Really, Jesus would forgive you at once as well. But perhaps you are ashamed of him, the master. I am a mother. I do not make anyone feel ashamed. No, you do not, because you are a mother and you are so good. You are peace to all of us. I feel very upset. I have a very bad character, Mary. I do not know what I have in my blood and in my heart. Now and again I am no longer able to control them. And then I would do the strangest and worst things. Even with Jesus near you, can you not resist temptation? Yes, and I suffer because of that, believe me. It is so, I am a poor wretch. I will pray for you, Judas. It is not enough. I will get just people to pray for you without telling them for whom it is. It is not enough. I will make children pray. So many of them come to me, to my kitchen garden, like little birds looking for corn. And my caresses and the words I speak to them are corn to them. I speak to them of God. And they, little innocent souls, prefer that to games and tales. The prayer of children is pleasing to the Lord. Never as much as yours, but it is still not enough. I will tell Jesus to pray the Father for you. 
it is still not sufficient. More than that is impossible. Jesus' prayer defeats also demons. Yes, but Jesus would not always pray, and I would go back to being myself. Jesus always says so. He will go away one day. Must think of the time when I shall be without him. Jesus now wants to send us evangelizing. I am afraid to go with this enemy of mine, which is myself, to spread the word of God. I would like to be already perfected. But, son, if not even Jesus is successful, who can ever be so? You, mother, let me stay a little while with you. Pagans and prostitutes have stayed with you, so I can stay as well. If you do not want me to be where you live, at night I will go and sleep at Alpheus and Mary of Clopas's, but I will spend the day with you and the children. In the past, I tried to do things by myself and made the situation worse. If I go to Jerusalem, I have too many wicked friends. And in the situation I am in now, when I feel like this, I become their laughingstock. It is the same if I go to any other town. The temptation of the road burns me with this one, which I already have. If I go to Carrieth, to my mother's, I become the slave of pride. If I withdraw to a solitary place, silence rends me with Satan's voices. But if I am staying with you, oh, I feel that it will be different. Let me come. Tell Jesus to grant me this. Do you want me to be lost? Are you afraid of me? You are looking at me with the countenance of a wounded gazelle which has no strength left to escape its assailants. But I will not offend you. I have a mother too, and I love you more than her. Have mercy on a sinner, Mary. Look, I am weeping at your feet. If you reject me, it may be my spiritual death. And Judas is really weeping at Mary's feet. She looks at him, and her eyes are full of pity and anguish, mixed with fear. She's very pale. But she takes a step forward because she had almost sunk into the hedge to keep away from Judas, who was going too close to her. And she lays a hand on Judas's dark hair. Be quiet, lest they should hear you. I will speak to Jesus, and if he agrees, you will come to my house. I disregard the opinion of the world. It does not injure my soul. I would be horror-struck only at being guilty towards God. Calumny leaves me cold. No one will speak ill of me, because Nazareth knows that its daughter does not cause scandal to her own town. In any case, let come what may. I am anxious that you may save your soul. I am now going to Jesus. Peace to you. And she covers herself with her veil, which is white like a dress, and she walks fast along the path which leads up to a hillock covered with olive trees. She looks for her Jesus and finds him engrossed in meditation. Son, it is I. Listen to me. Oh, mother, have you come to pray with me? What joy and relief you bring to me. What is it, son? Is your soul anguished? Are you sad? Tell your mother. You have said it, anguished and tired. Not so much because of the work or of the miseries I see in hearts, as for the immutability of my friends. But I do not wish to be unfair to them. One only worries me, Judas of Simon. Son, I have come to speak to you of him. Has he wronged you? Has he grieved you? 
No, but I feel sorry for him, just as I would feel sorry if I saw a very infected person. Poor soul, how ill his soul is. And you feel sorry for him? Are you no longer afraid of him? You were once. Son, my pity is even greater than my fear. And I would like to help you and him to save his soul. You can't do everything, and you do not need me. But you say that everybody must cooperate with Christ in redeeming. And that, son, needs to be redeemed so badly. What else can I do for him in addition to what I already do? You cannot do any more, but you could let me do. He asked me to let him stay in our house, because he thinks that he will be able to get rid of his monster there. Are you shaking your head? You do not want? I will tell him. No, mother, it is not that I do not want. I am shaking my head because I know that it is useless. Judas is like one who is drowning, and although he realizes that he is drowning, he rejects out of pride the rope that has been thrown to him to draw him to the shore. He has no will to come to the shore. Now and again, he is in terror of drowning, and he seeks and invokes help. He clings to the rope, and then, seized once again by pride, he refuses help, rejects it. He wants to be independent. And he becomes heavier and heavier because of the muddy water that swallows him down. But as I wish to leave no stone unturned, let that be done as well, poor mother. Yes, poor mother, as you are subjecting yourself for the love of a soul to the pain of having near you one who frightens you. No, Jesus, do not say that. I am a poor woman because I am still subject to antipathies. Reproach me, I deserve it. I should not be disgusted at anybody for your sake. That is why I am a poor woman. Oh, I wish I could give you back Judas spiritually cured. To give you a soul is to give you a treasure. And the person who gives a treasure is not poor. Son, shall I go and tell Judas that it is all right that you agree? You said once, the day will come when you will say, how difficult it is to be the mother of the Redemptor. I have already said it once. Ackley. But what is once only? Mankind is so numerous, and you are the redeemer of all men. Son, son, as I held the little baby in my arms to bring her to you to be blessed, let me hold Judas in my arms that I may bring him to your blessing. Mother, he does not deserve you. Jesus, when you hesitated to give Marcian to Peter, I told you that it would be beneficial to him. You cannot deny that Peter has become a new man since that moment. Let me try with Judas. Let it be done as you wish. And may you be blessed for your loving intention towards me and Judas. Now let us pray together, Mother. It is so pleasant to pray with you. The sun is just beginning to set when I see them depart from the house that gave them hospitality. John of Endor and Amastius take leave of Jesus as soon as they reach the road. Mary, with the women instead, proceeds with her son along a road through the olive groves 
on the hills. They are talking of the events of the day. Peter says, Philip must be really crazy. He was almost going to disown his wife and daughter if you had not been there to make him listen to reason. Let us hope that he will persevere in his repentance and does not have another fit of bad temper against females. After all, it is due to women that the world goes on, says Thomas, and many laugh at his witty remark. It is certainly true, but they are more unclean than we are, and replies Bartholomew. Never! With regard to uncleanliness, we are not angels either. Now, I would like to know whether after redemption it will always be the same for women. They teach us to honour mothers and hold in great respect sisters, daughters, aunts, daughters and sisters-in-law, and then anathema here, anathema there. The temple is out of question. Many times we're not allowed to approach them. Eve sinned, agreed, but also Adam sinned. God punished Eve very severely. Is that not enough? Thomas, Moses also considers women unclean. And Moses, without women, would have been drowned. But mind you, Bartholomew, although I am not so learned as you are, as I am only a gold-beater, I would remind you that Moses mentions the bodily uncleanliness of women so that we may respect them, not to anathematize them. The debate is becoming livelier. Jesus, who was ahead of them with the women and John and Judas Iscariot, stops and turning round, he comes into the discussion. God had in front of him a people which was morally and spiritually amorphous and contaminated by connections with idolaters. He wanted to make the people physically and spiritually strong. Thus, the precepts he gave were instructions beneficial to both physical strength and moral honesty. He could not do otherwise to check the lust of men and thus prevent repetition of the sins which caused the earth to be submerged and Sodom and Gomorrah to be burned down. But in future, the redeemed woman will not be oppressed as she is now. Prohibitions concerning physical prudence will remain, but obstacles to her coming to the Lord will be removed. I am already removing them to prepare the first priestesses of the future era. Oh, will there be priestesses? asks Philip, who is almost dumbfounded. Do not misunderstand me. They will not be priestesses like men. They will not consecrate and will not administer the gifts of God, which you are not yet capable of understanding. But they will belong to the sacerdotal class, cooperating in many ways with priests to the benefit of souls. Will they preach? asks Bartholomew incredulously, as my mother already preaches. Will they make apostolic pilgrimages? asks Matthew. Yes, they will. They will take faith very far, and I must admit it, with greater heroism than men. <laughs> Will they work miracles? asks this Iscariot, laughing. Some will work also miracles, but do not consider miracles the essential thing. They, being holy women, will work many miracles of conversions through their prayers. Bah! Will women pray to the extent of working miracles? grumbles Nathaniel. Do not be narrow-minded like a scribe, Bartholomew. What is a prayer, according to you? To address God by means of the formulae known to us. That and much more. Prayer is the conversation of the heart with God, and it ought to be the habitual state of man. Women because of their more retired lives than ours, and because of their affective faculties that are stronger than ours, are inclined to such conversation with God more than we are. 
They find comfort to their sorrows in it, relief in their work, which is not only the work in the house and in procreating, but also in tolerating us men. They find what wipes their tears and brings peace and joy to their hearts, because they know how to speak to God, and they will know even better in future. Men will be giants in doctrine. Women will be those who support men and the world with their prayers, because many misfortunes will be avoided through their prayers, and many punishments will be withheld. They will thus work miracles, invisible in most cases and known to God only, but not less real. You also worked an invisible but real miracle today. Is that right, Master? asked Thaddeus. Yes, brother. It would have been better to work a visible one, remarks Philip. Did you want me to change the little girl into a boy? A miracle, really, is the alteration of what has been destined. A beneficial disorder, thus, which God grants to hear the prayer of man and thus prove to him that he loves him, or that he is he who is. But since God is order, he never violates order immoderately. The child was born a female, and a female she will stay. I was so distressed this morning, says the Blessed Virgin with a sigh. Why, the loveless baby was not yours, says Susanna. And she adds, when I see an unfortunate child, I say, luckily for me, I have none. Do not say so, Susanna. It is not charitable. I also could say so because my only maternity is beyond natural laws. But I do not say that, because I always think, if God had not wanted me to be a virgin, that seed might have fallen on me, and I would be the mother of the unhappy child. And thus I pity them all. Because I say, he might have been my son. And as a mother, I would like all children to be good, healthy, loved and loving, because every mother wishes that for her own children, replies Mary kindly. And Jesus seems to envelop her in light. So radiantly he looks at her. That is why you pity me, says this carrot in a low voice. I pity everybody even if one were the murderer of my own son, because I think that he would be the most in need of help and love, because the whole world would certainly hate him. Donna, you would have to work hard defending him to give him time to repent. I would get rid of him immediately, says Peter. This is where we part. Mother, God be with you. And with you, Mary. And with you too, Judas. They kiss one another, and Jesus adds, Remember that I have granted you a great thing, Judas. Make it beneficial and not detrimental to you. Goodbye. And Jesus, with the eleven apostles left in Susanna, goes eastwards at a quick pace, while Mary her sister-in-law, and this garret go straight to head. The Poem of the Man-God The Second Year of the Public Life Chapter 262 The Man with the Withered Hand 26th of August, 1945 Jesus enters the synagogue in Capernaum which slowly becomes crowded with believers, because it is Sabbath. Everybody is greatly surprised seeing him. They all point to him, whispering, and some pull the tunic of this or that apostle, asking why they came back to town, because nobody knew that they were back. 
We landed at the fig wheel, coming from Bethsaida, to avoid taking one step more than is prescribed, my friend, replies Peter to Uriah the Pharisee, who, feeling offended at being called friend by a fisherman, goes away disdainfully and joins his peers in the first row. Don't tease them, Simon, warns Andrew. Tease them? He asked me a question and I replied, saying also that we avoided walking to respect the Sabbath. They will say that we worked in the boat. They will end up by saying that we worked by breathing. Fool! It's the boat, the wind and the waves that work, not us who sail in the boat. Andrew accepts the reprimand and becomes silent. After the preliminary prayers, it is time to read a passage and explain it. The head of the synagogue asks Jesus to do so. But Jesus points to the Pharisees, saying, Let them do it. But as they do not wish to comply, he is compelled to speak. Jesus reads a passage from the first book of the Kings, which tells how David was betrayed by the men of Ziph, who informed Saul that he was at Gibeah. Jesus hands the roll back and begins to speak. It is always evil to infringe the precepts of charity, hospitality and honesty. But man does not hesitate to do so with utmost indifference. We have here a double episode of such infringement and the consequent punishment of God. The behaviour of the men of Ziph was deceitful. Saul's was equally so. The former were mean in their intention of getting into the graces of the stronger of the two. The latter was vile in the intention of getting rid of the Lord's anointed. They were thus united by their selfishness. And the false, sinful king of Israel dares to give a reply to the base proposal mentioning the Lord. May you be blessed by the Lord. Derision of God's justice. Habitual derision. Too often, the name of the Lord and his blessing are invoked as a reward or guarantee for man's wickedness. It is written, You shall not utter the name of God in vain. And can there be anything more vain, or rather more wicked, than uttering it to commit a crime against one's neighbour? And yet, it is a sin that is more frequent than any other, committed with indifference, also by those who are always the first in the meetings of the Lord, in ceremonies and teaching. Remember that it is a sin to investigate, take notice, and prepare everything to damage one's neighbour. It is also a sin to make other people investigate, take notice, and prepare everything, so that other people may injure one's neighbour. It implies inducing others to sin by tempting them with rewards or threatening them with retaliation. I warn you that it is a sin. I warn you that such behaviour is selfishness and hatred. And you are aware that hatred and selfishness are enemies of love. I am warning you because I am anxious about your souls. Because I love you. Because I do not want you to be in sin because I do not want you to be punished by God, as happened to Saul, whose country was destroyed by the Philistines while he was chasing David to capture him and kill him. I solemnly tell you that that will always happen to those who harm their neighbours. Their victory will last as long as the grass of a meadow. It will come up quickly, but it will soon be dry and trodden on by the foot of indifferent passers-by. Whereas good behaviour and honest life seem to find it hard to grow and assert themselves. But once they are perfected as habits of life, they become strong leafy trees, which no hurricane can uproot or dog days part.
Really, he who is faithful to the law, truly faithful, becomes a strong tree which is not bent by passions nor burnt by Satan's fire. I have finished. If there is anyone who wishes to say something, let him do so. We ask you whether you have spoken referring to us Pharisees. Is the synagogue perhaps full of Pharisees? You are full, and there are hundreds of people. My word was for everybody. But the illusion was clear. Really, it has never been known that a man accuses himself only because suspicion is thrown on him by a parallel. But that is what you are doing. Why do you accuse yourselves if I do not accuse you? Are you aware of behaving as I said? I am not. But if you are, mend your ways. Because man is weak and may sin. And God forgives him if he sincerely repents and wants to sin no more. But to persist in evil is double sin for which there is no forgiveness. We have not committed such sin. Well, do not grieve over my words. The argument is over, and the singing of hymns fill the synagogue. The meeting seems to be on the point of winding up without any further incident, when Joachim, the Pharisee, sees a man in the crowd and beckons him to go to the first row. The man is about fifty years old and has an atrophic arm, and as atrophy has destroyed his muscles, also his hand is affected and is smaller than the other one. Jesus sees him, and he notices the bustle to draw his attention to him. There is a flashing but very clear sign of disgust and pity on his face, but he does not ward off the blow. On the contrary, he faces the situation resolutely. Come here in the middle, he orders the man. And when the man is before him, Jesus turns to the Pharisees and says, Why do you tempt me? Have I not just finished speaking of snares and hatred? And have you not just now said we have not such sin? Are you not replying to me? Answer at least this. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Is it lawful to save life or to kill? Are you not replying? I will reply in your place and in the presence of all the people who will be able to judge better than you do because they are simple and free from hatred and pride. It is not lawful to do any work on the Sabbath. But as it is lawful to pray, so it is lawful to do good. Because good is even a greater prayer than the hymns and psalms which we have sung. But neither on the Sabbath nor on any other days is it lawful to do evil. And you have done just that by intriguing to have here. This man, who is not even from Capernaum, and was brought here two days ago, as you knew that I was at Bethsaida, and you guessed that I would be coming to my town. And you have done that, to see if you can find something to use against me. And thus you commit also the sin of killing your souls instead of saving them. But as far as I am concerned, I forgive you. And I will not disappoint the faith of this man, whom you told to come, saying that I would cure him, whereas you wanted to lay a snare for me. He is innocent, because he came here with no other intention than to be cured. And be it so. Man, stretch out your hand and go in peace. The man obeys, and his hand is cured and is like the other one. He makes use of it at once by taking the hem of Jesus' mantle to kiss it, saying, 
You know that I was not aware of their true intentions. Had I known, I would not have come, as I would have preferred to keep my wit at hand rather than serve against you. So have no grudge against me. Go in peace, man. I know the truth. And with regard to you, I assure you of my goodwill. The crowd go out making comments, and Jesus comes out last with his eleven apostles. The poem of the man God, the second year of the public life, chapter 263, a day of Judas Iscariot at Nazareth, 27th of August, 1945. The house in Nazareth would be the most suitable for spiritual elevation. There is peace, silence, order. Holiness seems to exude from its stones, from the trees of the kitchen garden, or to pour from the serene thatch which forms a heavenly dome over it. In actual fact, it exhales from her who lives in it and moves about quickly and silently with her unchanged youthful gait and light step, as when she entered the house as a bride, and with the same smile which soothes and caresses. The sun in this early morning hour is shining on the right-hand side of the house, the one close to the first undulation of the hill, and only the tops of the trees benefit from it. First of all, the olive trees planted near the terrace to retain the earth, by means of their roots. They are the surviving olive trees of Joachim's olive grove, huge contorted trees with their thicker branches rising towards the sky as if they were invoking its blessing or were praying also from that peaceful place. Once the grove consisted of many trees which like praying pilgrims formed a long procession extending as far as the fields where olive grove and fields become grazing ground, whereas there are only a few trees left now within Joachim's mutilated property. The next to benefit from the sunshine are the tall, strong almond and apple trees, forming sunshades over the garden with their branches. Then there is a pomegranate enjoying the rays of sunlight, and last, the fig tree near the house, and the sun already caresses the well-cultivated flowers and vegetables in rectangular flower beds, and along the hedges planted under pergolas laden with grapes. Buzzing bees, like flying golden drops, alight on everything that may give them sweet-scented juices. A small honeysuckle shoot is attacked by them, as well as a hedge of a bell-shaped flower bunches, the name of which I do not know but must be night flowers as they're about to close, and their scent is very strong. The bees hasten to suck them before they fold their petals to sleep in the corolla. Mary goes quickly from the nest of the doves to the little fountain, and from there to the house doing her work, and yet, while doing so, she manages to admire her flowers or the doves cooing along the paths or flying around the house and the kitchen garden. Judas Iscariot comes back, laden with plants and seeds. Hail, mother! They gave me everything I wanted. I ran back so that they may not get injured. But I hope that they will take root as the honeysuckle did. Next year, your garden will be like a flowery basket, and you will thus remember poor Judas and his stay here. He says, carefully taking out from a bag some plants the roots of which are enveloped in earth and damp leaves, and some seans from another bag. Thank you, Judas. Thank you very much indeed. You have no idea how happy I am to have that honeysuckle near the little grotto. When I was a little girl, over there, at the end of those fields which belonged to us in those days, there was a lovelier grotto, and ivy and honeysuckles adorned it with their branches and flowers forming a kind of curtain and shelter for tiny lilies growing inside the grotto, 
which the delicate embroidery of maiden hair made completely green. Because there was a spring there. In the temple I often thought of that grotto. And I tell you that when I prayed before the veil of the holy as a virgin of the temple, I did not perceive God more strongly. Nay, I must say that I dreamed there of the sweet conversations of my soul with my Lord. My Joseph prepared this one for me, with this fine stream of water, not so much because of its utility as to give me the joy of a grotto like the other one. Joseph was good and considerate of the least details. And he planted a honeysuckle and ivy. The latter is still alive. The former died during the years of our exile. He replanted it later. But it died three years ago. You have planted it once again. It has taken root, see? You are a very clever gardener. Yes, when a child I loved plants so much. And my mother taught me how to take care of them. Being with you, mother... I feel as if I were a boy again, and I discover my old skill. I do it to please you. You are so good to me, replies Judas, working skillfully in setting the plants in the most suitable places. Near the hedge of the night flowers, he places a tangle of roots, which I do not know whether they are lilies of the valley or some other flower. They will do well here, he says, pressing with a little hoe the earth onto the buried roots. Too much sunshine, it is not good for them. Eliaza's servant did not want to give me them, but I insisted so much that he gave them to me. They did not want to give Joseph those Indian jasmines, but he did some work for them without asking for payment in order to get them for me. They have flourished more and more. There you are, mother. I will now water them and they will be all right. He waters them and washes his hands in the fountain. Mary looks at him. He is so different from her, Jesus, and so different as well from the Judas of certain stormy hours. She scans him, approaches him, and laying a hand on his arm, she kindly asks him, Are you feeling better, Judas, in your soul? I mean. Oh, mother, so much better. I am in peace, and you can see it. I find pleasure and salvation in humble things and in being with you. I should never leave this place, this quietude. Here, how far is the world from this house? And Judas looks at the garden, the plants, the little house. He concludes. But if I stayed here, I would never be an apostle, and I want to be one. However, believe me, it would be better for you to be a just soul, rather than an unjust apostle. If you feel that contact with the world upsets you, if you realise that the praises and honours of an apostle hurt you, give it up, Judas. It is better for you to be a simple believer in my Jesus but a holy believer, rather than a sinful apostle. Judas lowers his head pensively. Mary leaves him to his meditation and goes into the house, to her housework. Judas remains still for some time. He then walks up and down under the pergola. His arms are folded, his head is lowered. He is engrossed in thought. Then he begins to speak and gesticulate to himself. His monologue is incomprehensible. His gestures are typical of a person anguished with clashing ideas. He seems to be invoking and rejecting or pitying or cursing something. His inquisitive countenance becomes frightened, anguished, until his face has the expression of his worst moments and he stops abruptly in the middle of the path, remaining still for some time, with a real diabolic countenance. He covers his face with his hands and runs up the hillock of the olive trees, away from Mary's sight, and he weeps 
hiding his face in his hands until he calms down and remains sad, leaning with his back against an olive tree as if he were bewildered. It is no longer morning but the end of a glorious sunset. Nazareth opens the doors of its houses which have been closed all day against the fierce summer heat of an eastern day. Women, men, children come out into the kitchen gardens or onto the roads, still warm, but no longer sunny, seeking cool air at the fountain, or playing, or talking, waiting for supper. Men, women, children greet one another in loud voices. They chatter, laugh, shout. Judas also goes out and turns his steps to the fountain, carrying copper pitchers. He is noticed and indicated by the people of Nazareth with the nickname the disciple of the temple, which sounds to him like sweet music. He passes by greeting people kindly, but also with a little reserve, which, if it is not yet proud haughtiness, it is very close to it. You're very good to marry, a citizen with a long beard says to him. She deserves that and more. She really is a great woman of Israel. You are lucky to have such a citizen. The praise of the woman of Nazareth delights the people who repeat to one another what Judas said. The apostle has, in the meantime, reached the fountain where he waits for his turn, and he is so kind as to carry the pictures of an elderly woman who cannot bless him enough, and he fills the jars of two women, who are hampered by the suckling each carries in her arms. Sorting their veils, they whisper, May God reward you. Love for our neighbour is the first duty of a friend of Jesus, replies this Garriott bowing. He then fills his own pitchers and goes back home. The head of the synagogue of Nazareth and other people stop him on his way home and invite him to speak on the following Sabbath. You have been here with us over two weeks and you have not taught us any lesson apart from your kindness to us all complains the head, who is with the elders of the village. But if the speeches of your greatest son are not pleasant to you, how can you be satisfied with the sermon of one of his disciples, who is a Judean over and above? replies Judas. Your suspicion is an unfair one, and it grieves us. Our invitation is sincere. You are a disciple and a Judean, that is true. But you are of the temple. So you may speak, because there is doctrine in the temple. Joseph's son is only a carpenter. But he is the Messiah, he said so. But is it true, or is it delirium? But people of Nazareth, what about his holiness, his holiness? Judas is scandalized at the incredulity of the Nazarenes. It is great, that is true. But between that and being the Messiah? And then, why does he speak so harshly? Harsh? No, he does not seem harsh to me. Well, he is too sincere and too intolerant, that is true. He leaves no fault untouched. He does not hesitate to denounce abuses, and people do not like that. He always brings up a sore point, and that hurts. But he does it because of his holiness. Surely, that is the only reason. I have said to him several times, Jesus, you are damaging your reputation, but he will not listen to me. You are very fond of him, and, learned as you are, you could guide him. Oh, not learned, but practical, yes. I am of the temple, you know. I am familiar with customs. I have friends. Annas' son is like a brother to me. If you want something from the Sanhedrin, just tell me. But let me take the water to Mary now, as she is waiting for me for supper. Come back later. It is cool on my terrace. You will be among friends and we shall be able to talk. Yes, goodbye. And Judas goes home where he apologises Mary for being late 
as he was held up by the head of the synagogue and by the elders of the village. And he concludes, They would like me to speak on Sabbath. The master did not tell me to speak. What do you say, mother? Guide me. Speak to the head of the synagogue or to the synagogue? To both. I would not like to speak to any of them because they are against Jesus and also because it seems a sacrilege to me to speak where he is by right the only master there. But they insist so much. They want me after supper. I have almost promised them to go. And if you think that by speaking I may be able to mitigate their spirit of resistance to the master, which is so unpleasant, I will go and speak to them, although it is so burdensome to me. I will speak as best I can, very simply, endeavouring to be very patient in view of their stubbornness, because I have realised that it is worse to be hard. Ah, uh, I will not make again the mistake I made at Ezrelin. The master was so upset about it. He did not say anything to me, but I understood. I will not do it again. But I would like to leave Nazareth after persuading the people that Jesus is the Messiah and is to be believed and loved. Judas is speaking while sitting at the table, at Jesus' place, and eating what Mary has prepared for him and it hurts me to see Judas sitting in that place in front of Mary who serves him like a mother she now replies it would be a good thing if Nazareth understood the truth and accepted it I will not hold you back you may go no one can say better than you whether Jesus deserves love. Consider how much he loves you, and he shows it by always excusing you and satisfying you whenever possible. Let that consideration inspire you with holy words and deeds. The supper is soon over. Judas goes to water the flowers in the garden before it gets too dark, and then he goes out leaving Mary on the terrace, intent on folding the clothes she had hung out to dry. And Judas, after greeting Alphaeus of Sarah and Mary of Clopas, who are talking standing at the door of the ladder, goes straight to the house of the head of the synagogue. Also the Lord's two cousins are present with other six elders. After pompous greetings, they all sit gravely on seats adorned with cushions, and they refresh themselves drinking an ice or mint water, which must be very cool, because the metal pitcher is moist outside, owing to the difference in temperature between the ice-cold water and the still warm air, notwithstanding the breeze blowing from the hills to the north of Nazareth stirs the treetops. I am glad you agreed to come. You are young. A little relaxation is good for you, says the head of the synagogue, who is full of attention towards Judas. I was afraid of bothering you if I had come earlier. I know that you are rather disdainful towards Jesus and his followers. Disdainful? No. Sceptical. And we are hurt by his... Let us admit it. By his too crude truth, we were under the impression that you disdained us, and that is why we did not invite you. I disdain you? On the contrary, I understand you very well. Of course, but I am sure that, at the end, peace will be made between you and him. It suits both you and him. It suits him, because he is in need of everybody, and it suits you because it does not pay to be considered enemies of the Messiah. And do you think that he really is the Messiah? asks Joseph of Alphaeus. There is no trace in him of the royal figure predicted by the prophets. Perhaps it is because we remember him as a carpenter. But where is the liberating king in him? David also appeared to be only a little shepherd. But you know that there has been no greater king than David, 
Not even Solomon in all his glory was so great. Because, after all, Solomon only continued David's work, but was never inspired like him. Whereas David, just consider the figure of David. It is gigantic. His regality almost reaches up to heaven. Do not doubt the royalty of the Christ, basing your judgment on his genealogy. David was king and shepherd. More truly, shepherd and then king. Jesus is king and carpenter, or, better still, carpenter and later king. You speak as a rabbi. One can see that you have been brought up in the temple, says the head of the synagogue. And could you let the Sanhedrin know that I, the head, am in need of help in the temple for a private reason? Of course, certainly. With Eleazar, just imagine. And then Joseph the Elder, you know, the wealthy man from Arimathea. And then Sadok, the scribe. And then all you have to do is tell me. Well, be my guest tomorrow. We will talk about it. Your guest? No, I cannot leave Mary, that holy and sorrowful woman. I came here specially to keep her company. What is the matter with our relative? We know that she is healthy and, although poor, she's happy, says Simon of Alphaeus. Yes, and we never leave her. My mother is always with her. And my wife, and I too. Although, although I cannot forgive her for being so weak with her son, and also for grieving my father, who, because of Jesus, died only with two of his sons at his bedside. And then, but family troubles are not to be proclaimed publicly, says Joseph of Alphaeus with a sigh. You are right. They should be whispered in low voice and confided to a friendly heart. The same applies to many troubles. I have mine as well, as a disciple. But it's better not to speak of them. On the contrary, let us speak of them. What is the matter? Trouble for Jesus. We do not approve of his behaviour, but we are his relatives, and we are ready to side with him against his enemies. Speak up, says Joseph again. Trouble? No. I was just saying, the sorrows of a disciple are manifold, not only because of the behaviour of his master with friends and enemies, harming himself, but also because it is grievous to see that he is not loved. I wish you all loved him. But what can we do? You said that yourself. His behaviour is such. He was not like that before leaving his mother, says the head of the synagogue apologetically. Is that true? What do you all say? They all agree solemnly speaking high of the silent, meek, retired Jesus of the past. Who could have imagined that he was to become what he is now? He was completely devoted to the house and relatives. Now, instead, remarks an elderly Nazarene, Judas exclaims with a sigh. Poor woman. Well, what do you know? Tell us. Speak up, shouts Joseph. Nothing more than you know. Do you think that it is pleasant for her to be left alone? If Joseph had lived as your father did, that would not have happened, states another elderly Nazarene sententiously. Don't believe that, man. It would have been the same. When one takes an idea into one's head, says Judas. A servant brings some lamps and lays them on the table, because it is a moonless night, although the sky is sparkling with stars. More drinks are brought at the same time, and the head of the synagogue offers them to Judas at once. Thank you. I cannot stay any longer. I must go back to Mary he says, getting up. Also Alphaeus's two sons stand up 
saying, We will come with you. We are going the same way. And they part, greeting one another ceremoniously, while the six elders remain with the head of the synagogue. The streets are now deserted and silent. People can be heard talking in low, grave voices on the terraced roofs. Children are already sleeping in their little beds, and thus their shrill voices, resembling the twittering of joyful birds, are not heard. From the terraces of the wealthier houses, the faint glow of oil lamps descends with the low voices of people. Alphaeus' sons and Judas walk for a little while without speaking. Then Joseph stops, taking Judas' arm. He says, Listen, I realise that you know something that you did not wish to mention in the presence of strangers. But now you must tell me. I am the oldest of the family and it is my right and my duty to know everything. And I came here for the purpose of telling you, and thus protect the master, Mary, your brothers and your reputation. It is something painful to tell, and to hear, very painful to be done, because it looks like playing the spy, but please understand me properly, it is not so. It is only love and prudence. I know many things which you know as well. My friends of the temple told me, and I know that they are dangerous for Jesus and for the good name of the family. I have tried to make the master understand, but I was not successful. On the contrary, the more I advise him, the worse he behaves, thus causing people to criticize and hate him more and more. The reason is that he is so holy that he cannot understand what the world is like. In short, it is sad to see a holy thing perish through the heedlessness of its founder. But what is it? Tell us everything, and we will take action. Is that right, Simon? Of course, but it seems impossible to me that he is imprudent and acts against his mission. But if this kind young man, who loves Jesus, says so, see what you are like, you are always like that, uncertain, hesitating. You always leave me alone at the crucial moment. The whole family is against me. You have no pity for our reputation and for our poor brother who is ruining himself. No, he's not ruining himself, but he's injuring himself. That's what he's doing. Speak up, insists Joseph, while Simon is perplexedly silent. I would speak, but... I would like to be certain that you will not make any mention to Jesus. Swear it. I swear it on the holy veil. Speak up. And you must not relate to your mother, and least of all to your brothers, what I am going to tell you. You can be certain of our silence. And will you say nothing to Mary, in order not to grieve her? It's your duty to see the peace of that poor mother in silence, as I do. We will not say anything to anybody. We swear it. Well, listen. Jesus no longer confines himself to approaching Gentiles, publicans and prostitutes, to offending Pharisees and other important people. But he does things that are absolutely absurd. Just imagine that when in Philistia he made us go about taking with us a black billy goat. Now he has a Philistine among his disciples. And before that, the boy he picked up? You have no idea what comments were made. And a few days ago he took a Greek girl, a slave, who had run away from her Roman master. And his speeches are contradictory to our well-known wisdom. In short, he seems to be mad. And he damages himself. In Philistia... He intruded also into a ceremony of wizards, competing face to face with them. He defeated them, but scribes and Pharisees hate him. But what will happen if they happen to hear about such things? You must intervene and stop. That's serious. Very serious. But how could we know? We are here. And even now, how will we be able to find out? 
and yet it is your duty to intervene and stop him. His mother is a mother, and she is too good. You must not abandon him thus, for his own sake and for the sake of the world. Also his continuous driving away demons. It is rumoured that he is assisted by Beelzebub. You can imagine whether that can do him any good. In any case, what kind of a king will he ever be if the crowds laugh at him just now or are scandalised? But does he really do such things? asks Simon incredulously. Ask him yourself. He will tell you that he does, because he even boasts about it. You should let us know. I certainly will. When I see something new, I will send you word. But please, never say a word to anybody. We swore it. When are you leaving? After the Sabbath. There is no reason why I should stay here any longer. I have done my duty. And we thank you for it. Oh, I said that he had changed. And you, brother, you would not believe me. Can you now see whether I was right? Says Joseph of Alves. I can hardly believe it. Judas and James, after all, are not fools. Why have they not told us? If such things are really happening, why have they not taken action? Says Simon of Alves. Man, you will not disgrace me by refusing to believe my words, answers back Judas resentfully. No, but that's enough. Forgive me if I say I will believe when I see things myself. All right, you will soon see, and then you will have to say to me you were right. Well, there is your house. I leave you. God be with you. God be with you, Judas. And listen, don't speak to anyone about that, for our reputation. I will be as silent as the grave. Goodbye. And he goes away at a good pace. He enters the house serenely and goes up to the terrace where Mary, with her hands in her lap, is contemplating the sky crowded with stars. In the light of the little lamp that Judas had lit to climb the steps, tears can be seen shining on Mary's cheeks. Why are you weeping, mother? asks Judas anxiously. Because I think that there are more snares in the world than stars in the sky. Snares of my Jesus. Judas looks at her attentively, and he seems upset. But she concludes kindly. But I am comforted by the love of his disciples. Love, my Jesus. Love him. Do you wish to stay here, Judas? I am going down to my room. Mary of Clopas has already gone to bed after preparing the leaven for tomorrow. Yes, I will remain up here. It is lovely here. Peace be with you, Judas. Peace be with you, Mary. The Poem of the Man God The Second Year of the Public Life Chapter 264 Instructions to the Apostles at the Beginning of Their Apostolate 28th of August 1945 Jesus is sitting at the table in the house in Capernaum with all his disciples, which means that Judas has joined his companions after fulfilling his task. It is evening. The light of the fading day enters from the door, and the wide open windows, through which it is possible to see the purple of sunset, change into unreal violet red, the borders of which fray crumpling up into a violet slate that pales into grey. It puts me in mind of a sheet of paper thrown onto a fire. It lights up, and as soon as it stops burning, its edges crumple up and become a leaden, bluish shade, 
which fades into an almost white pearly grey. It's warm, states Peter, pointing out a huge cloud which tinges the west with those shades. Warm, but no rain. That's not a cloud, it's fog. Tonight I am going to sleep in the boat where it is cooler. No, tonight we are going to the olive groves. I must speak to you. Judas is now back. It is time for me to speak to you. I know an airy spot where we shall be comfortable. Get up and let us go. Is it far? They ask, picking up the mantles. No, it is very near. Within a stone's throw by sling from the last house. You may leave your mantles, but take tinder and flint so that we can see our way when coming back. They come out of the upstairs room and go downstairs, bidding good night to the landlord and his wife, who are enjoying the cool air on the terrace. Jesus walks resolutely in the opposite direction from the lake, and after crossing the village, he proceeds for about two or three hundred yards into an olive grove on the first hillock behind the village. He stops on a projection of earth, but because of its position free from obstacles, enjoys all the air possible in that sultry night. Let us sit down and pay attention to me. The hour of evangelization has come. I am about halfway through my public life, preparing hearts for my kingdom. It is now time that my apostles also take part in the preparation of this kingdom. That is what kings do when they decide to conquer a kingdom. First, they make investigations and approach people to find out their reaction and win them to the plan they are pursuing. Later, they enlarge their preparatory work by means of reliable messengers sent to the country to be conquered. And they send more and more of them until all the geographical and moral details of the whole country are known. After that, the king completes his work by proclaiming himself king of that country and being crowned as such. And much blood is shed to achieve that, because victories always cost blood. We are ready to fight for you and shed our blood, promised the apostles by one consent. I will shed no blood but that of the Holy One and of saints. Do you wish to begin your conquest starting from the temple, storming it at the hour of the sacrifice? Let us not stray, my friends. You will be informed of the future in due course, but do not shudder with horror. I assure you that I will not upset the ceremonies by means of a violent eruption. And yet, they will be upset And there will be one evening when terror will prevent the ritual prayer. The terror of sinners. But I shall be in peace that evening. In peace with both my spirit and my body. A total blissful peace. Jesus looks at his twelve apostles one by one. And it is the same as if he looked at the same page twelve times and read for twelve times the one word written on it. Incomprehension. He smiles and continues. So I have decided to send you so that you may penetrate further ahead and more widely than I can do by myself. But for prudential reasons, I will ensure that there is a difference between your way of evangelizing and mine, because I do not want to put you in two difficult situations, which could be too seriously dangerous for your souls and bodies, and also because I do not wish to jeopardize my own work. You are not as yet perfected to the point of being able to approach anyone without being damaged or without damaging, and least of all, 
Are you heroic to the extent of defying the world on behalf of the idea, facing the revenge of the world? So, when you go about preaching me, do not go among Gentiles and do not enter the towns of Samaritans, but go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. There is so much to be done amongst them, because I solemnly tell you that the crowds that you think are so numerous around me are the hundredth part of those who are still waiting for the Messiah in Israel, and they do not know him. Neither do they know that he is living amongst them. Take to them faith in me and the knowledge of me. On your way, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is near. Let that be your basic announcement, supporting all your preaching. You have heard me speak so much of the kingdom. All you need to do is to repeat what I told you. But man, to be attracted by and convinced of spiritual truth, needs material kindness, as if he were an eternal boy who will not study a lesson or learn a trade unless he is attracted by a sweet from his mother or a reward from his schoolmaster or his trade tutor. In order to let you have the means to be believed and sought after, I will grant you the gift of working miracles. The apostles jumped to their feet, with the exception of James of Alphaeus and John, shouting, protesting, becoming excited, each reacting according to his temperament. Really, the only one strutting about at the idea of working miracles is Discariot, who with the foolhardiness of false and selfishly motivated interest exclaims, it was time that we should do that to have the least authority over the crowds. Jesus looks at him, but does not say anything. Peter and the zealot were saying, No, Lord, we are not worthy of so much. That is due to saints, contradicts Judas, as the zealot says. Why do you take the liberty of reproaching the master, you silly, proud man? And Peter adds, The least authority? And what do you want to do more than work miracles? Do you want to become God as well? Have you got the same itch Lucifer had? Silence! Orders Jesus. And he continues. There is one thing that is even greater than miracles and equally convinces the crowds, but more deeply and durably, a holy life. But you are far from that, and you, Judas, are farther than the rest. But let me speak, because my instruction is a long one. Go, therefore, curing sick people, cleansing lepers, raising bodies and spirits from the dead, because bodies and spirits can be sick, leprous, dead as well. And you are already aware how a miracle is worked through a life of penance, fervent prayer, sincere desire to glorify the power of God, deep humility, living charity, burning faith, and through hope that no kind of difficulty can upset. I solemnly tell you that everything is possible to those who have such virtues. Demons also will flee before the name of the Lord pronounced by you, if you have within you what I said. That power is given to you by me and by our Father. No money can buy it. Only our will grants it. Only a just life keeps it. As it is given to you gratuitously, so gratuitously give it to others, to the needy. Woe betide you if you depreciate the gift of God by using it 
to fatten your purse. It is not your power, it is the power of God. Make use of it, but do not take possession of it, saying, It is mine. As it is given to you, so it can be taken away from you. Simon of Jonah, a little while ago, said to Judas of Simon, Have you got the same itch as Lucifer had? He gave a correct definition. To say, I do what God does because I am like God, is to imitate Lucifer. And his punishment is well known. Equally known is what happened to the two progenitors who in the earthly paradise ate the forbidden fruit through instigation of the envious one who wanted to imprison more unhappy souls in his hell besides the rebellious angels already there, but also through their own itch of perfect pride. The only fruit you are allowed to take from what you do are the souls whom you will conquer for the Lord by means of the miracle and who are to be given to the Lord. That is your money, nothing else. You will enjoy your treasure in the next life. Go without riches. Do not take with you gold or silver or money in your purses, or travelling bag with two or more tunics or spare shoes, or pilgrim's staff or weapons. Because for the time being, your apostolic visits will be short ones, and every Sabbath eve we shall meet, and you will be able to change your sweated garments without having to take spare ones with you. No staff is required, because it is more pleasant to walk without. And what is useful on hills and plains is different from what is useful in deserts and on high mountains. No weapon is needed. Weapons are useful to men who do not know what is holy poverty or divine forgiveness. You have no treasures to protect and defend from robbers. The only robber you must fear is Satan. And he is defeated by perseverance and prayer, not by swords and daggers. Forgive those who offend you. If anyone should rob you of your mantle, give him also your tunic. If you should remain completely nude because of your mildness and detachment from riches, you will not scandalize the angels of the Lord or the infinite chastity of God because your charity would clothe your nude body with gold and your mildness would adorn you like a sash, while your forgiveness towards the robber would give you a royal mantle and crown. You would therefore be better dressed than a king, not with corruptible clothes, but with imperishable material. Do not worry about food. You will always have what is appropriate for your condition and your ministry, because a worker is always worthy of the food that is offered to him. And if men should not provide for the worker, God will. I have already proved to you that to live and preach, it is not necessary to have your stomachs full of food. That is useful to unclean animals, whose purpose in life is to grow fat, and then be slaughtered to fatten men. But you must fatten your souls, and the souls of other people, with the food of wisdom. And wisdom is revealed to minds, not made dull by guzzling, and to hearts nourished with supernatural food. You have never been so eloquent as after the retreat on the mountain. And then you ate only what was necessary to survive. And yet, at the end of the retreat, you were as strong and cheerful as you have never been before. Is that not true? Whatever town or place you enter, find out who is deserving of receiving you. Not because you are Simon or Judas 
or Bartholomew, or James, or John, and so on, but because you are the messengers of the Lord. Even if you had been the dregs of society, or murderers, thieves, publicans, but now you were repentant and at my service. You would deserve respect because you are my messengers. I will say even more. I say, woe betide you if outwardly you look like my messengers, whilst inwardly you are abject servants of Satan. Woe betide you. Hell would be too little compared to what your deceit deserves. But even if you were messengers of the Lord publicly, and at the same time the dregs of society or publicans, thieves, murderers, or cultly, and people in their hearts suspected or were almost certain of that, you would still be entitled to honour and respect, because you are my messengers. The eye of man must see beyond the means and see the messenger and the final purpose, that is God and his work, beyond the too often faulty means. Only in the case of grave sin, injuring the faith in hearts, I, for the time being, my successors in future, will see that the bad limb is cut off because it is not lawful that the souls of believers should be lost through a demon priest. It will never be lawful in order to hide the wounds affecting the apostolic body, to allow gangrenous limbs to survive in it, as their repugnant aspect drives people away and their demoniac stench is poisonous. So you will find out which is the most righteously living family, where women know how to live in seclusion and morals are chaste. And you will enter that house and live there until you leave the place. Do not imitate drones, which after sucking a flower pass on to a more nourishing one. Whether you arrive among people with a splendid house and rich table, or you happen to go to a humble family, rich only in virtue, stay where you are. Never seek what is better for the perishable body. On the contrary, always give it what is worse, keeping all the rights for the spirit. And whenever possible, give your preference to the hospitality of the poor. I tell you, because it is better to do so. Do so in order not to mortify them and in memory of me, as I am and will remain poor, and I boast of being poor, and also because very often the poor are better than the rich. You will always find poor people who are just, but only rarely you will find a rich man without any fault. You have no excuse in saying, I found goodness only amongst the rich in order to justify your keen desire for welfare. When entering a house, greet its inhabitants with my salutation, which is the kindest there is. Say peace be with you. Let peace be in this house, or let peace come to this house. In fact, as messengers of Jesus and of the gospel, you take peace with you, and your going to one place is to make peace come to it. If the house is worthy of it, peace will come and remain in it. If it is not worthy of it, your peace will come back to you. So, mind to be peaceful yourselves in order to have God as your father. A father always helps, and with the help of God, you will do everything and everything well. It may be, nay, it will certainly happen, that a town or house will not receive you, or will not listen to your words, but will drive you away or ridicule you, 
or will chase you throwing stones at you as boring prophets. In such cases, you must be more than ever peaceful, humble and mild, having acquired such virtues as a habit of life. Otherwise, you will be overwhelmed by anger and you will commit sin, scandalizing and increasing the incredulity of those you wish to convert. If instead you peacefully accept the insult of being driven away, derided, chased, you will convert people by means of the most beautiful sermon, the silent sermon of true virtue. One day you will find on your way the enemies of today, and they will say to you, We have been looking for you because your behavior has convinced us of the truth that you announce. Please forgive us and accept us as your disciples, because we did not know who you were, but now we know that you are saints. And if you are saints, you must be the messengers of a saint and we now believe in him. But when leaving the town or the house where you were not received, shake the dust off your sandals, so that pride and harshness of that place may not stick even to your souls. I solemnly tell you, on doomsday, Sodom and Gomorrah will be dealt with less severely. Now I am sending you like sheep among wolves. Be, therefore, as cunning as serpents and yet as harmless as doves, because you are aware how the world, in which really there are more wolves than sheep, treats me also, and I am the Christ. I can defend myself by my power, and I will do so until the hour of the temporary triumph of the world comes. But you do not possess that power, and you need greater prudence and simplicity. Thus, greater sagacity as well, to avoid being scorched and imprisoned for the time being. In actual fact, notwithstanding your statement that you are willing to shed your blood on my behalf, you are not capable at present of putting up with an ironic or angry glance. But the time will come when you will be as strong as heroes against persecutions, even stronger than heroes and your heroism, which the world cannot conceive or explain, will be called madness. No, it will not be madness. It will be the identification, through love, of man with the man God. And you will be able to do what I have already done. To understand this heroism, it will be necessary to see it, study it, and judge it from a heavenly level. Because it is something supernatural that is beyond all the limitations of human nature. Kings. The kings of the spirit will be my heroes, forever kings and heroes. In those days, they will arrest you, laying hands on you. They will drag you before law courts, garrison commanders and kings to judge and condemn you for the great sin in the eyes of the world of being servants of God, the ministers and guardians of good the masters of virtue. And for that same reason, you will be scorched and punished in many ways and even killed. And you will give testimony of me to kings, garrison commanders, nations, confessing with your blood that you love Christ, the true son of the true When you are in their hands, do not worry about what you have to reply and what you have to say. Do not grieve, then, for anybody, but for the judge and accusers, led astray by Satan to the extent of becoming blind to the truth. 
you will be given the words to be spoken at the time. Your father will put them on your lips because it is not you who will be speaking to convert people to your faith and profess the truth. But it will be the spirit of the father who will speak in you. Brother will then betray brother to death and the father his child and children will rise against their parents and have them put to death. Do not be shocked or scandalized. Tell me, according to you, is it greater crime to kill a father, a son, a brother or God himself? God cannot be killed replies sharply, Judas is carried. That is true. He is an invincible spirit, confirms Bartholomew, and the others, although they do not speak, are all of the same opinion. I am God, and I am flesh, says Jesus calmly. No one is thinking of killing you, retorts this carry. Please, reply to my question. Of course it is a graver crime to kill God. Well, God will be killed by man. In the flesh of the man God and in the soul of the murderers of the man God. So, as they will go so far as committing that crime, without the murderers being horrified at it. So the crimes of fathers, brothers and children against children, brothers and fathers will be committed. You will be hated by all men on account of my name, but he who stands firm until the end will be saved. And when they persecute you in one town, take refuge in the next one not out of cowardice, but to give time to the newborn church of Christ, to reach the age, not of a weak, incapable, unweaned child, but an older age in which it will be able to face life and death without being afraid of death. Let those flee who are advised by the Spirit to flee, as I fled when a child. Truly, all the vicissitudes of my earthly life will be repeated in my church, all of them. From the mystery of its formation to the humbleness of the early times, to the perturbation and snares brought about by cruel people, to the necessity of fleeing to continue to live, from poverty and unremitting work, to many more events that I am living now that I will suffer later, before reaching my eternal triumph. On the other hand, let those remain who are advised by the Spirit to remain. Because even if they are killed, they will live and be useful to the Church. Because what the Spirit of God advises is always good. I solemnly tell you that you and your successors will not have covered all the roads and all the towers in Israel before the Son of Man comes. Because on account of its dreadful sin, Israel will be scattered like chaff by a whirlwind and will be spread all over the earth in centuries and millennia will go by before it is gathered again on the threshing floor of Arauna, the Jebusite. Every time Israel will try to gather together before the predetermined hour, it will be caught once again in the whirlwind and scattered, because Israel will have to weep for its sin for as many centuries as the drops of blood that will flow from the veins of the Lamb of God sacrificed for the sins of the world. And my church, which will be struck by Israel in me, and in my apostles and disciples will have to open its motherly arms and endeavour to gather Israel under its mantle 
as a brooding hen does with its stray chickens. When the whole of Israel will be under the mantle of the Church of Christ, then I will come. But that applies to the future. Let us talk of the present. Remember that the disciple is not superior to his teacher, nor the slave to his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher, which is already an undeserved honour. And for a slave to be like his master, and it is supernatural bounty to grant you that. If they have called the landlord Beelzebub, what will they not say of the household? And will the slaves be able to rebel if the landlord does not rebel, does not hate or curse, but calm in his justice, he continues to work, postponing judgment to another moment when he sees them obstinate and evil, after he has tried everything to persuade them? No. The slaves will not be able to do what the master does not do but they can imitate him, considering that they are sinners, whereas he is without sin. So be not afraid of those who will call you demons. The truth will be known one day, and then it will be clear who was the demon, whether it was you or they. There is nothing hidden that is not to be revealed and nothing secret that is not to be known. What I now say to you in the dark and secretly, because the world is not worthy of knowing all the words of the word, it is not yet worthy of that, and it is not yet time to tell also those who are unworthy. When the time comes when everything is to be known, tell in daylight Proclaim from housetops what I now whisper more to your souls than to your ears. Because the world then will have been baptized in blood and there will be such a banner against Satan that the world, if it wishes so, will be able to understand the secrets of God. While Satan will not be able to injure anyone but those who wish to be bitten by him and prefer his bite to my kiss. But most of the world will not wish to understand. Only a minority will be willing to know everything in order to follow all my doctrine. It does not matter, as it is not possible to separate that minority from the unjust mass. Preach my doctrine as well from housetops. Preach it from mountain tops, on the boundless seas, in the bowels of the earth. Even if men will not listen to it, birds and winds, fish and waves will pick up the divine words, and the bowels of the earth will keep their echo to repeat it to underground springs, minerals and metals, and they will all rejoice over them, because they have been created by God as well to be a stool for my feet and joy to my heart. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Fear him, rather, who can lose your soul and unite it on doomsday to your body raised from death to throw both into the fire of hell. Be not afraid. Are two sparrows not sold for a penny? And yet, if your father does not allow it, not one of them will fall to the ground, notwithstanding all the snares of man. So be not afraid. The father knows you. Every hair on your head is known to him. And you are worth more than many sparrows. And I tell you that if anyone acknowledges me in the presence of men, I will acknowledge him in the presence of my Father who is in heaven. But the one who disowns me in the presence of men, I will disown in the presence of my Father. 
To acknowledge means to follow and practice. To disown means to abandon my way out of cowardice, or treble, concupiscence, or petty calculation, or attachment to a relative who opposes me. Because that will happen. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth and for the earth. My peace is above the selfish peace treaties for every day's wangle. It is not peace I have come to bring, but a sword. A sharp sword to cut the lianus detaining people in mud and open the way to supernatural flights. I have come to set a man against his father a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, because I am he who reigns and has every right on his subjects, because no one is greater than I am with regard to rights on affections, because all love is centralized in me and becomes thus sublime. I am father, mother, husband, brother, friend, and I love you as such, and as such I am to be loved. And when I say I want, no tie can resist, and that soul is mine. I created it with the Father, I save it by myself, so I am entitled to have it. The real enemies of man are men besides demons, and the enemies of the new man, of the Christian, will be his relatives at home, with their complaints, their threats, or their entreaties. But from now on, he who prefers his father and mother to me is not worthy of me. He who prefers his son or daughter to me is not worthy of me. He who does not take his cross daily, complex as it is, made of resignation, renunciation, obedience, heroism, sorrow, illness, mourning, made of anything that reveals the will of God or a test for man, and does not follow with it in my footsteps, is not worthy of me. Anyone who appraises earthly life more than the spiritual one will lose true life. Anyone who loses his earthly life for my sake will find an eternal, blissful one. Anyone who receives you receives me. He who receives me receives him who sent me. Anyone who receives a prophet as a prophet will receive a reward proportionate to the charity offered to the prophet. He who receives a just man because he is just will receive a prize proportionate to the just man. The reason is that he who acknowledges a prophet as such must be a prophet himself, that is, very holy, because he is held in the arms of the Spirit of God. And who will acknowledge a just man as such proves that he is just as well, because like souls know one another. Thus, each will be given a reward according to justice. And he who has given a glass of pure water to one of my servants, even if he were the least one, and are servants of Jesus all those who preach him through their holy lives, and may be kings or beggars, wise men or people who know nothing, old people and babies, because all ages and all classes can be my disciples. He who has given a disciple of mine even a glass of water in my name, and because he is my disciple, I solemnly tell you that he will not go without a reward. I have finished. Now let us pray and go home. You will leave at dawn as follows. Simon of Jonah with John. Simon Zealot with Judas Iscariot. Andrew with Matthew. James of Alphaeus with Thomas. 
Philip with James of Zebedee, my brother Judas with Bartholomew. That is for this week. I will let you have new instructions later. Let us pray. And they pray in loud voices. The poem of the man God. The second year of the public life. Chapter 265. John the Baptist sends his disciples to ask Jesus whether he is the Messiah. 29th of August, 1945. Jesus is alone with Matthew, who, having hurt his feet, has not been able to go and preach with the others. Invalids and people anxious to hear the doctrine of the gospel have crowded the terrace and the free area of the kitchen garden to hear Jesus and receive assistance. Jesus ends speaking, saying, We have meditated together on Solomon's great sentence. The greatest strength lies in the abundance of justice. And I now exhort you to have such abundance because it is money to enter the kingdom of heaven. Be with my peace and may God be with you. He then turns to the poor and the sick. In many cases, the same person is both and he kindly listens to what they tell him. He assists with money, advises with words, cures them by imposing his hands and by his words. Matthew, who is beside him, sees to the arms in money. Jesus is attentively listening to a poor widow, who, weeping, informs him of the sudden death of her husband, a carpenter, at his workbench only a few days previously. I ran here looking for you, and all the relatives of my dead husband accused me of being unbecoming and hard-hearted, and they now curse me. But I came because I know that you can raise people from death, and I also know that if I had found you, my husband would have risen again. But you were not here. He has now been buried two weeks. And I am here with five children. Our relatives hate me and do not help me. I have small tree and vines. They are only a few. But they would give me bread for the winter months if I could only keep them until harvest time. But I have no money, because my husband was ill for some time and worked very little, and he ate and drank even too much to support himself. He used to say that wine did him good, but it brought about double trouble as it killed him and used up all our savings, which were already scanty because of his work. He was just finishing a cart and a chest, and he had orders for two beds, some tables and shelves. But now they are not finished, and my boy is not yet eight years old. I shall lose the money. I shall have to sell the tools and the wood. I cannot sell the cart and the chest as such, although they are almost finished. I shall have to give them as firewood, and the money will not be enough, because I, my old mother, who is also ill, and five children are seven all together. I will sell the vineyard and the olive trees. But you know what the world is like. They fleece you when they know that you're in need. Tell me what shall I do. I want to keep the bench and the tools for my son, who is already capable of doing some work with wood. And I wanted to keep the land to live on as a dowry for my daughters. Jesus is listening to all that when the confusion of the crowd warns him 
that something is happening. He turns round and sees three men who are elbowing their way through the crowd. He turns round to the widow again to ask her, Where do you live? At the grand chorus, near the road to the warm fountain, a low house between two fig trees. Very well. I will come and finish the cart and the chest, and you will sell them to those who ordered them. Wait for me tomorrow at dawn. <gasps> what? You are going to work for me? The woman is choking with amazement. I will resume my work and bring you peace. And in the meantime, I will give a lesson on charity to the heartless people of Corazon. Yes, they have no heart. If only old Isaac were there, he would not have let me die of starvation. But he has gone back to Abraham. Do not weep. Do not worry. Here is what you need for today. I will come tomorrow. Go in peace. The woman stoops to kiss his tunic, and she is somewhat relieved when she goes away. Three times, holy master. May I greet you? Asks one of the three men who have just arrived and have stopped respectfully behind Jesus, waiting for him to dismiss the woman, and have thus heard Jesus' promise. The man who has greeted Jesus is Manaya. Jesus turns round and smiling, says, Peace to you, Manaya. So you have remembered me. Always, master. And I have planned to come to see you in Lazarus's house or at the Garden of Gethsemane and stay with you. But the Baptist was captured before Passover. He was recaptured by treachery. And I was afraid that Herodias might order the holy man to be killed during the absence of Herod, who had come to Jerusalem for Passover. She refuses to go to Zion for the festivity, saying that she was not well. It is true, she was ill of hatred and lust. I was at Machaerus to control the situation and check the wicked woman who was capable of killing with her own hand. And she does not do so because she is afraid of losing Herod's favour, who, either because he is afraid or he is convinced, defends John, confining his action to keeping him in prison. Herodias has now escaped from the oppressing heat at Machaerus, and she has gone to a castle of her own property. So I came with these friends of mine and disciples of John. He sent them that they may ask you some questions, and I joined them. When the crowd hear the man speak of Herod, and they understand who is speaking, they press curiously round the little group of Jesus and the three men. What did you want to ask me? asks Jesus after exchanging greetings with the two austere personages. You had better speak, Manayan, since you know everything and you are more friendly, says one of the two. Well, Master, you must be indulgent if out of excess of love these disciples look suspiciously at him whom they believe to be the antagonist or the supplanter of their master. Your disciples do so as well with John's. It is an understandable jealousy that proves all the love of the disciples for their masters. I am impartial, and these who are with me can confirm it, because I know you and John, and I love you both with justice, so much so that, although I love you for what you are, I preferred to sacrifice myself and stay with John, because I respect him as well for what he is. And at the present moment, because he is in greater danger than you are. Now, because of their love, which the Pharisees are instigating with their hatred, they have come to doubt that you are the Messiah. And they told John, thinking that they would fill him with joy by saying, As far as we are concerned, you are the Messiah. There cannot be anyone holier than you are. But John reproached them, calling them first of all blasphemous, and then, after rebuking them, 
he more kindly explained the various facts that prove that you are the true Messiah. Finally, when he realized that they were still not convinced, he took two of them, these ones here, and said, Go to him and say to him in my name, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we wait for another one? He did not send the shepherd disciples, because they believe it, and it would have been of no avail to send them. But he chose amongst those who are doubtful to let them approach you, so that their word may dispel the doubts of their companions. I brought them here so that I could see you as well. That is all. I beg you to dispel the doubt. But do not think that we are hostile to you, master. Manaen's words might make you think so. We, we have known the Baptist for many years, and we have always seen him to be holy, penitent, inspired. You, we know you only through the words of other people, and you know what the words of man are worth. They build up and destroy fame and praises in the contrast between those who exalt and those who demolish, as a cloud is formed and dissolved by contrasting winds. I know. I read in your souls and your eyes can read the truth in what surrounds you, just as your ears heard my conversation with the widow. That should be enough to convince you. But I say to you, look at those who are around me. There are no rich or jolly or scandalous people here, but only poor, sick, honest Israelites who are anxious to know the word of God. Nothing else. This man, that one, this woman and that little girl, that old man, were ill when they came here, and now they are sound and healthy. Ask them, and they will tell you what was wrong with them, how I cured them, and how they are feeling now. Do so. And in the meantime, I will speak to Mania. And Jesus is about to withdraw. No, master, we do not doubt your words. Just give us a reply to take back to John, that he may know that we came here, and on the strength of it, he may convince our companions. Go and report this to John. The deaf hear. This girl was deaf and dumb. The dumb speak, and that man was dumb since his birth. The blind see. Man, come here. Tell these men what was wrong with you, says Jesus, taking a miraculously cured man by the arm. The man says, I am a mason and a pail full of quick life fell on my face. It burnt my eyes. I was four years in the dark. The Messiah wetted my dry eyes with his saliva, and they have become fresher than when I was twenty years old. May he be blessed for it. Jesus resumes. And with the blind, the deaf, the dumb, who have been cured, the lame walk straight, the cripple run. Over there is that old man. A short while ago he was contracted. Now he is as straight as a palm tree in the desert and as agile as a gazelle. The most serious diseases are cured. Woman, what was the matter with you? I had trouble with my breast for giving too much milk to voracious mouths, and my illness ate not only into my breast, but also into my life. Look now. And opening her dress, she shows her wholesome breasts and adds, They were one big sore as you can see from my tunic, which is still soaked with puce. I am now going home to put on a clean dress, and I feel strong and am happy. Whilst only yesterday I was dying, and I was brought here by compassionate friends, and I was so unhappy because of my children who were about to be left motherless. Eternal praise to the Saviour! Do you hear? And you can ask the head of the synagogue of this town with regard to the resurrection of his daughter. And on your way back to Jericho, go to Naim, 
and ask for the young man who rose again in the presence of the whole town when they were going to put him into his grave. You will thus be able to report that dead people rise again from the dead. You will be able to find out in many places in Israel that a large number of lepers have been cured. But if you wish to go to Sikaminon, you will find many among the disciples if you look for them. Tell John, therefore, that lepers are cleansed. And tell him, as you can see, that the gospel is announced to the poor. And blessed are those who will not be scandalized in me. Tell John that. And tell him that I bless him with all my love. Thank you, Master. Bless us as well before our departure. You cannot leave in this warm hour. Stay here, therefore, as my guests until evening. You will live for one day the life of this master who is not John, but loves John, because he knows who he is. Come into the house. It is cool and it will restore you. Goodbye, my listeners. Peace be with you. And after dismissing the crowd, he enters the house with the three guests. What they have said to one another during those sweltering hours, I do not know. What I now see is the preparation for the departure to Jericho of the two disciples. Manaen is apparently staying, because they have not brought his horse with the two strong donkeys to the opening in the wall of the yard. The two messengers of John, after bowing several times to the master and Manaen, mount their donkeys and look back, saluting, until they disappear round a corner. Many people of Capernaum have gathered together to see the departure because the news of the visit of John's disciples and of Jesus' reply to them has spread through the village and I think it reached nearby towns as well. I see people from Bethsaida and Chorazin who introduced themselves to John's messengers asking after him and to be remembered to him. They are perhaps ex-disciples of the Baptist who are now chatting together with the people of Capernaum, making their comments. Jesus is about to enter the house while speaking to Manan, who is beside him. But people press round him, anxious to see Herod's foster brother and his respectful manners to Jesus, and to speak to Jesus at the same time. There is also Jairus, the head of the synagogue. But thanks be to God, there are no Pharisees. And it is Jairus who remarks, John will be glad. You have sent him not only an exhaustive answer, but by keeping them here, you have also been able to teach them and show them a miracle. And it was not little one either, exclaims a man. I deliberately brought my little daughter here today that they might see her. She has never been so well, and it is a great joy for her to come to the master. And did you hear her reply? I do not remember what death is, but I remember that an angel called me, and he took me through a brighter and brighter light, at the end of which there was Jesus. And I do not see him now, as I saw him then, with my soul that was coming back to me. You and I now see the man, but my soul saw the God who is closed in the man. And how good she has become since then. She was good, but now she's a real angel. Ah! They can say what they like. But as far as I am concerned, no one is holy but you. But John is also holy too, says a man from Bethsaida. Yes, but he is too severe. Not more with others than he is with himself. But he does not work miracles and they say that he fasts to be like a magician. And yet he is a saint, 
and the petticolo spreads among the crowd. Jesus raises his hand, stretching it out in his usual gesture, asking for silence and attention when he wants to speak. The crowd becomes silent at once. Jesus says, John is holy and great. Do not consider his way of behaving or the lack of miracles. I solemnly tell you, he is a great one in the kingdom of God. He will appear there in all his grandeur. Many complain that he was and still is so severe as to appear rude. I tell you solemnly that he has worked like a giant to prepare the ways of the Lord. And he who works like that has no time for softness. Did he not repeat when he was along the Jordan the words of Isaiah by which he and the Messiah are prophesied? Let every valley be filled in, every mountain and hill be laid low. Let every cliff become a plain and the ridges a valley in order to prepare the ways to the Lord and King. He really did more than the whole of Israel to prepare my way. And he who has to lay mountains low and fill in valleys and straighten roads and make ridges become plates can but work rudely because he was the precursor and he preceded me by only a few months and everything was to be done before the sun was high on the day of redemption. And this is the time. The sun is rising to shine on Zion and thence on the whole world. John has prepared the way as he had to do. What did you go to see in the wilderness? A reed swaying in every direction in the breeze? But what did you go to see? A man clad in fine soft clothes? But those live in the palaces of kings, wearing fine clothes and respected by many servants and courtiers. And they are courtiers themselves of a poor man. There is one here. Ask him whether he is not disgusted with the life at court and whether he admires the solitary rugged rock that is struck in vain by thunderbolts and scorched by hailstones, and against which silly winds struggle, endeavouring to demolish it, while it stands firm, thrusting its whole being towards the sky, with its top proclaiming the joy of altitude, straight as it is and sharp like a rising flame. That is John. That is how Manayan sees him, because he has understood the truth of life and death, and he can see grandeur where it really is, even if it be hidden under a wild appearance. And what did you see in John when you went to see him? A prophet? A saint? I will tell you, he is more than a prophet. He is more than many saints, because he is the one of whom it is written. Look, I am going to send my angel to prepare your way before you. Angel, consider this. You know that angels are pure spirits created by God to his spiritual likeness and placed as a link between man, the perfection of the visible and material creation. And God, the perfection of heaven and earth, creator of the spiritual kingdom and of the animal kingdom. Even in the holiest man there is always flesh and blood forming an abyss between him and God. And the abyss subsides under the weight of sin that weighs down also what is spiritual in man. So God created the angels, creatures reaching the summit of the creation scale, just as minerals lie at its base. Minerals being the dust forming the earth and inorganic materials in general. They are 
clear mirrors of the thought of God, willing flames operating out of love, ready to understand, quick in acting, free in willing as we are, but their entire holy will ignores the rebellion and incentive of sin. That is what the angels adoring God are, his messengers to men, our protectors, who grant us the light that shines on them and the fire that they gather, worshipping. John is called angel by the prophetic word. And I say to you, of all the children born of women, a greater one than John the Baptist has never been seen. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven will be greater than John, man because one of the kingdom of heaven is a son of God and not of woman. And even therefore to become citizens of the kingdom. What are you asking one another? We were saying, but will John be in the kingdom and how will he be there? He is already in the kingdom in his spirit and he will be there after his death as one of the most splendid sons of the eternal Jerusalem. And that, because of the grace that is in him without any flaw and through his own will. Because he was and is violent, also against himself for a holy purpose. From the Baptist onwards, the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are capable of conquering it, through strength opposed to evil, and the violent will conquer it. Because now it is known what is to be done, and everything has been given for such conquest. It is no longer the time when the law and the prophets only spoke. They spoke down to the time of John. Now the word of God speaks, and it does not hide an iota, of what is to be known for this conquest. Thus, if you believe in me, you must see him as the Elijah who is to come. If anyone has ears to hear, let him listen. What description can I find for this generation? It is like children shouting to their companions as they sit in the marketplace. We have played the pipes for you, and you would not dance. We sang dirges, and you would not weep. For John came, and he neither ate nor drank, and this generation says he can do that because the demon assists him. The Son of Man came, eating and drinking, and they say, Here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of publicans and sinners. Thus her children do justice to wisdom, I tell you solemnly that only children are capable of discerning the truth because there is no malice in them. You are right, master, says the head of the synagogue. That is why my daughter, who is still without malice, can see you as we are not able to see you. And yet this town and the neighbouring ones are overflowing with your power, wisdom, and kindness. And I must admit it, they are making progress only in wickedness towards you. They will not mend their ways, and the good you do to them ferments into hatred against you. What are you saying, Jairus? You are calumniating us. We are here because we are faithful to the Christ, says one from Bethsaida. Yes, we are. But how many are we? Less than one hundred out of three towns that ought to be at Jesus' feet. Of those who are absent, I am talking of the men. Half are hostile, a quarter are indifferent. I will grant that the rest cannot come. Is that not a sin in the eyes of God? 
and will such hatred and obstinacy in evil not be punished? Speak, master, because you know, and if you are silent, it is out of kindness, not because you do not know. You are patient, and that is mistaken for ignorance and weakness. Speak, therefore, and may your words stir at least those who are indifferent, as the wicked will not repent, but they become more and more wicked. Yes, it is a sin, and it will be punished, because the gift of God must never be despised or used to do wrong. Woe betide you, Chorazin! Woe betide you, Bethsaida! who misuse the gifts of God. If the miracles worked in you had taken place in Tyre and Sidon, their inhabitants would have done penance and come to me a long time ago, wearing sackcloths and sprinkled with ashes. I therefore say that Tyre and Sidon will be dealt with more mercifully than you will on doomsday. And you, Capernaum, do you think that you will be exalted to heaven only because you gave me hospitality? You will descend to hell. Because if the miracles I gave you had been worked in Sodom, it would still be flourishing as it would have believed in me and turned. Therefore, greater mercifulness will be shown to Sodom on the day of judgment because they did not know the Saviour and his word, and thus their sin is not so grave, than will be shown to you as you knew the Messiah and heard his word, but you did not mend your ways. But since God is just, those of Capernaum, Bethsaida and Chorazim who believed and are becoming holy, obeying my word, will be treated with great mercifulness. Because it is not fair for the just to be involved in the ruin of sinners. With regard to your daughter Jairus, and yours, Simon, and your boy, Zacharias, and your grandchildren, Benjamin, I tell you that they already see God, because they are without malice. And you can see how their faith is pure and active, joined to celestial wisdom and charitable yearning, which adults do not possess. And Jesus, looking at the sky, which is becoming dark at dusk, exclaims, I thank you, Father of heaven and earth, because you have concealed these things from wise and learned people and you have disclosed them to the humble, because that is what pleases you. Everything has been trusted to me by my Father, and nobody knows him but the Son, and those to whom the Son has revealed it. And I have revealed it to the little ones, to the humble, the pure, because God gives himself to them. And the truth descends like seed on free soil and the father pours his light on it that it may take root and grow. Truly, the father prepares these souls of children by age or children by will that they may know the truth and I may rejoice in their faith. The poem of The Man God, the second year of the public life. Chapter 266. Jesus works as a carpenter at Chorazim. 31st of August, 1945. Jesus is working diligently in a carpenter's workshop. He is finishing a wheel. A delicate, sad child helps him, handing this or that tool to him. Manaen, although an idle witness, admires him 
sitting on a bench near a wall. Jesus has taken off his beautiful linen tunic and has put on a dark one, which is obviously not his own, as it reaches only halfway down his shins. It is an overall, clean although patched, which probably belonged to the deceased carpenter. Jesus encourages the boy with smiles and kind words, teaching him what he must do to prepare the glue properly and polish the sides of the chest. It did not take you long to finish it, master, says Manin, standing up and running a finger on the mouldings of the finished chest that the boy is polishing with a fluid. It was almost finished. I wish I had this work of yours, for the buyer has already come and he seems to have acquired some rights. You have disappointed him. He was hoping to be able to take everything to make up for the little money he had lent. Now he has to take his articles and nothing else. If he were one who believed in you, they would be of infinite value to him. But did you hear? Leave him. On the other hand, there is some wood here, and the woman will be happy to make use of it and have some profit. Give me an order for a chest and I will make it for you. Really, master, do you intend to go on working? Until there is no more wood left. I am a conscientious worker, he says, smiling more frankly. A chest made by you? Oh, what a relic! But what shall I put in it? Anything you like, Manan. It will only be a chest. But made by you! So? The father also made man. He made all men. And what did man put in himself? What do men put in themselves? Jesus speaks while working, moving about, looking for the necessary tools, tightening vices, drilling, planing, turning, according to what is needed. We have put sins in ourselves. That's true. See? And you may rest assured that man created by God is worth much more than a chest made by me. Never mix up objects and actions. Of my chest, just make a relic for your soul. That's it. Give your spirit the teaching you get from what I do. Your charity, humility, activity. Then, these virtues. Is that right? Yes. And do likewise yourself in future. Yes, master. But will you make me a chest? Yes, I will. But since you still consider it a relic, I will make you pay for it as such. Thus, they will be able to say that at least once I have been greedy for money. But you know for whom the money is, for these little orphans. Ask me whatever you want. I will give it to you. At least it will justify my idling while you, the son of God, are working. Agreed. With sweat on your brow, you shall eat your bread. But that was set for the guilty man, not for you. Oh, one day I shall be the guilty one, and I shall have on me all the sins of the world. I will take them away with me on my first departure. And do you think that the world will not sin any more? It should not, but it will always sin. That is why the burden I shall have on me will be such as to break my heart. Because I will have to bear the sins committed from the time of Adam down to that hour and those from that hour until the end of the world. I will expiate everything on behalf of man. And yet man will not understand you and will not love you. Do you think that Chorazim will turn to you because of this holy, silent lesson you are giving by this work you are doing to help a family? No, they will not. They will say he preferred to work to kill the time and keep the money for himself. I had no more money. I had given it all. I always give everything I have to the last little coin, and I have worked to give the money away. 
And what about food for yourself and Matthew? God would have provided it. But you gave us to eat. Of course. How did you do that? Asked the landlord. Oh, well, as soon as we go back to Capernaum. Jesus smiles mildly into his fair beard. In the silence that follows, one can hear only the squeaking of the vice tightened on two pieces of a wheel. Then Manayan asks, What are you thinking of doing before the Sabbath? I will go to Capernaum and wait for the apostles. We decide to meet every Sabbath eve and spend the Sabbath all together. Then I will give them instructions, and if Matthew is well, there will be six couples going out to evangelize. If not, do you wish to go with them? I would rather stay with you, Master, but may I give you a piece of advice? Tell me, I will accept it if it is just. Never be all by yourself. You have many enemies, Master. I know. But do you think that the apostles would be of much help in case of danger? They love you, I think. Of course, but that will not help. If my enemies are thinking of capturing me, they would come with greater forces than the apostles. Is. It does not matter. Do not be alone. In two weeks' time, many disciples will join me. I am going to prepare them to send them to evangelize as well. I will no longer be alone. Do not worry. While they are talking thus, many curious people of Chorazim come to eye them and then go away without speaking. They are astonished seeing you work. Yes, but they are not so humble as to say, that is how he teaches us. The best ones I had here are with the disciples with the exception of an old man who died. It does not matter. A lesson is always a lesson. What will the apostles say when they know you have been working? They are eleven because Matthew has already said what he thinks. There will be eleven different opinions, and most of them will oppose me. But it will help me to teach them. Will you let me attend the lesson? If you wish to stay. But I am a disciple. They are apostles. What is good for apostles will be good also for a disciple. They may resent being reminded what justice is in my presence. It will do their humility good. Stay, Manan. I keep you willingly with me. And I remain willingly with you. The woman shows herself and says, Your meal is ready, master. But you are working too much. I am earning my bread, woman. And here is another customer. He wants a chest as well. And he will pay a good price for it. The place where you keep the wood will be empty, says Jesus, taking off the worn-out apron he had on and going out of the room to wash himself in a basin. The woman brought him into the kitchen garden. And... With one of the uncertain smiles that reappear after a long period of deep sorrow, she says, The place for the wood empty, the house full of your presence, and my heart in peace. I am no longer afraid of tomorrow, master, and you be not afraid that we may ever forget you. They enter the kitchen and it all ends. The poem of the man God, the second year of the public life, chapter 267, Jesus speaks of love, 1st of September, 1945. Jesus with man in beside him comes out of the widow's house, saying, Peace to you and to your family. We will meet again after the Sabbath. Goodbye, little Joseph. You can play and rest tomorrow, and then you will help me again. Why are you weeping? I am afraid that you will not come back again. 
I always speak the truth. But you are so sorry that I am going away? The boy nods assent. Jesus caresses him, saying, A day will soon pass. You will be with your mother and brothers tomorrow, and I will be with my apostles, and I will be speaking to them. During the past days I spoke to you to teach you how to work. I am now going to them to teach them how to preach and to be good. You would not enjoy yourself with me, the only boy among so many men. Oh, I would enjoy myself because I would be with you. I see, woman. Your son is like many, and they are the best. He does not want to leave me. Can you trust him with me until the day after tomorrow? Oh, Lord, I would give you them all. They are as safe with you as they would be in heaven. And this boy, who used to stay with his father more than the rest of them, has suffered too much. He was with his father at the moment. See, he does nothing but weep and pine. Don't weep, son. Ask the Lord if what I say is true. Master, to comfort him, I always say to him that his father is not lost, but has only gone far away from us temporarily. Which is the truth. It is exactly as your mother says, little Joseph. But I will not be able to find him again until I die. And I am only a boy. If I am to become as old as Isaac, how long will I have to wait? Poor boy. But time flies. Oh, Lord. My father has been dead three weeks. And it seems such a long time to me. <laughs> I cannot go on without him. <laughs> and he weeps, silently but most pitifully. See, he is always like that, particularly when he is not busy with something that interests him. The Sabbath is a torture. I am afraid he will die. No. I have another boy who is an orphan of father and mother. He was emaciated and sad. Now, staying with a good woman at Bethsaida and being sure that he is not separated from his parents, he has flourished again both in his body and soul. The same will happen to your son. Both because of what I will tell him and because time is a great healer. And also because he will calm down too when he sees that you are no longer worried about your daily bread. Goodbye, woman. The sun is setting and I must go. Come, Joseph. Say goodbye to your mother, your little brothers, and then run to pick up with me. And Jesus goes away. And what will you tell the apostles now? That I have an old disciple and a new one. They walk through Chorazin that is becoming animated with people. A group of men stop Jesus. Are you going away? Are you not staying for the Sabbath? No, I am going to Capernaum. You have not spoken one word during the whole week. Are we not worthy of your word? Have I not given you for six days the best word? When? To whom? To everybody, from the carpenter's bench. For days I have been preaching that our neighbour is to be loved and helped in every possible way, particularly when our neighbour is weak, as in the case of widows and orphans. Goodbye, people of Chorazin. Ponder on this lesson of mine on the Sabbath. And Jesus sets out again leaving the citizens perplexed. But the boy, who has reached Jesus running, rouses the curiosity of the people who stopped the master again, asking, 
Are you taking away the widow's son? Why? To teach him to believe that God is a father, and that in God he will find his lost father, and also that there might be one here who believes in the place of old Isaac. There are three men from Chorazim with your disciples. With my disciples, not here. This one will be here. Goodbye. And with the child between him and Manan, he walks fast through the country towards Capernaum, talking to Manan. They reach Capernaum after the apostles had arrived. They are sitting on the terrace in the shade of the pergola, round Matthew, whose wound is not yet healed, informing him of their feats. They turn round at the light shuffling of sandals on the little staircase, and they see Jesus' fair head emerge more and more from the little wall of the terrace. They rush towards him, who is smiling. And they are dumbfounded, seeing a poor boy behind Jesus. Manan climbs the steps in his pompous pure white linen tunic, which is made even more beautiful by a precious belt, by the bright red dyed linen tunic, which is so shiny as to seem silk hanging from his shoulders like a train, and by his spices headdress, fastened by a thin gold diadem, an engraved thin plate which divides his wide forehead into two halves and gives him almost the air of an Egyptian king. His presence prevents an avalanche of questions which, however, are clearly expressed by the apostles' eyes. After greeting one another, while sitting near Jesus, the apostles ask. Now, who is this? Pointing at the boy. This is my last conquest, little Joseph, a carpenter like the great Joseph, who was my father, and thus most dear to me, as I am to him. Is that right, little boy? Come here that I may introduce you to these friends of mine, of whom you have heard me speak so much. This is Simon Peter, the kindest man to children there is. And this is John, a big boy who will speak to you of God also when playing. And this is James, his brother, serious and good like an elder brother. And this is Andrew, Simon's brother. You will get along well at once with him because he is as meek as a lamb. And this is Simon the Zealot. He loves fatherless children so much that I think he would go round the whole world looking for them, if he were not with me. Then here is Judas of Simon, and with him there is Philip of Bethsaida and Nathaniel. See how they look at you? They have children as well, and they love children. And there are my brothers, James and Judas. They love everything I love, and so they will love you. Now let us go to Matthew, who is suffering agonies with his feet. And yet, he is not angry with the boy who is playing recklessly. Hit him with a sharp flint stone. Is that right, Matthew? Oh, no, master. Is he the widow's son? Yes, he is. He is very clever, but he has become very sad. Oh, poor boy. I will get you to call little James and you will play with him. And Matthew caresses him, drawing him close to himself with one hand. Jesus ends the instructions with Thomas, who, practical as he is, completes it by offering the boy a bunch of grapes he has picked off the pergola. Now you are friends, concludes Jesus, sitting down again while the child eats his grapes, replying to Matthew, who keeps him close to himself. But where have you been all alone for a whole week? At Chorazin, Simon of Jonah. I know, but what did you do? Did you go to Isaac? Isaac the elder is dead. So? Did Matthew not tell you? No, he only said that you were at Chorazin since the day after our departure. Matthew is more clever than you are. He can keep quiet, but you cannot check your curiosity. 
not only mine, everybody's. Well, I went to Chorazim to preach factual charity. Factual charity? What do you mean? Asked many. There is a widow at Chorazim with five children and an old sick woman. Her husband died suddenly at his workbench, leaving behind him misery and unfinished jobs. Chorazim did not find a tiny bit of pity for this unhappy family. I went to finish the work, and there is pandemonium. Some ask questions, some protest, some reproach Matthew for allowing it, some admire, and some criticize. Unfortunately, the majority protest or criticize. Jesus lets the storm calm down just as it started. And as a reply, he says, I am going back the day after tomorrow, and I will do so until I finish. And I hope that you at least will understand. Chorazin is a closed fruit stone without its germ. You, at least, ought to be stones with germs. Boy, give me the walnut that Simon gave you and listen to me as well. See this nut? I am taking this one because I have no other fruit shells available. But to understand the parable, think, for instance, of the seeds of pines or palms, the hardest ones, or the stones of olives. They are very hard containers, completely closed, without cracks of solid wood. They look like magic coffers, which can be opened only by means of violence. And yet, if one of them is thrown onto the ground by chance, and a passerby buries it in the earth, treading on it, what happens? The coffer opens and takes root and comes into leaf. How does that happen by itself? We have to strike it hard with a hammer to open it. Instead, without any blows, it opens by itself. Is the seed a magic one? No. It contains a pulp, a feeble thing compared to the hard shell. And yet it nourishes an even smaller thing, the germ. And that is the lever that forces, opens it, and produces a plant with roots and leaves. As an experiment, bury some fruit stones and wait. You will see that some strike root, others do not. Pull out the ones that did not sprout. Open them with a hammer, and you will see that they are empty seeds. So. It is not the dampness of the ground or its heat that makes the stone open, but it is its pulp, or rather the soul of the pulp, the germ, which, swelling, acts as a lever and opens it. That is the parable. Now let us apply it to ourselves. What did I do that should not have been done? Have we understood one another so little that we have not understood that hypocrisy is a sin and that words are just like wind if they are not corroborated by action? What have I always told you? Love one another. Love is the precept and the secret of glory. And I, who preach, should I be without charity? Should I thus set an example of an untruthful master? No, never. My dear friends, our body is like a hard stone in which pulp is enclosed, our soul, and in it there is the germ that I laid. It is made of many elements, the main one being charity. It acts as a lever to open the stone and free the spirit from the constrictions of matter and reunite it 
to God, who is charity. Charity does not consist only in giving alms or comforting by means of words. Charity is accomplished through charity alone. Do not think that this is a pun. I had no money and words were not sufficient for this case. There were seven people on the threshold of starvation and anguish. Despair was already putting forth its black claws to grasp and strangle. The world was withdrawing harshly and selfishly before this misfortune. The world was proving that it had not understood the words of the master. The master evangelized through deeds. I was capable and free to do it. And it was my duty, on behalf of the whole world, to love those poor wretches whom the world did not love. That is what I did. Can you still criticize me? Or should I criticize you? in the presence of a disciple who did not hesitate to come among sawdust and shavings in order not to leave the master, and who, I am sure, became more convinced of me, seeing me bent over a piece of wood, than he would have been persuaded if he had seen me on a throne, and in the presence of a boy who perceived me to be what I am, notwithstanding his ignorance, the misfortune that blunts his mind and the fact that he was in no way acquainted with the Messiah as he really is. Are you not saying anything? Do not feel humiliated only while I raise my voice to correct wrong ideas. I do it out of love. But strive to have within you the germ that sanctifies and opens the stone. Or you will always be useless things. You must be prepared to do what I have done. No work must be burdensome to you for the sake of your neighbour or to take a soul to God. Work, whatever it may be, is never humiliating. Whereas base action, falseness, untrue denunciations, harshness, abuse of power, usury, slander, and lust are humiliating. They do humiliate man, and yet they are done unashamedly by those also who say they are perfect and who were certainly scandalized seeing me work with saw and hammer Oh, a hammer, the worthless hammer. If used to drive nails into wood to make a piece of furniture that will earn food for orphans, how noble it becomes. The hammer, although ignoble, if it is in my hands for a holy purpose, will no longer appear as such and how it will be craved for by all those who gladly shout that they are scandalized because of it. Oh man, you ought to be light and truth, how dark and false you are. But you, at least, endeavor to understand what goodness is, what charity is, what obedience is. I solemnly tell you that great is the number of Pharisees, and they are even present among those who surround me. No, Master, don't say that. We, it is because we love you that we do not want certain things. It is because you have not yet understood anything. I have spoken to you of faith and hope, and I did not think that any new word was required to speak to you of charity, because so much emanates from me that you should be saturated with it. But I see that you know it only by name, without being aware of its nature and form, just as you know the moon.
Do you remember when I told you that hope is like the crossbar of the kind yoke supporting faith and charity? And it is the scaffold of mankind and the throne of salvation? You do? But you have not understood my words in their true meaning. And why did you not ask for a clarification? I will give it to you. It is a yoke because it compels man to lower his silly pride under the weight of eternal truths. And it is the scaffold of such pride. The man who hopes in God, his Lord, unavoidably mortifies his pride that would like him to be proclaimed his God and acknowledges that he is nothing and God is everything that he can do nothing, and God can do everything. That he, man, is transient dust, and God is eternity, elevating to a higher degree and rewarding man with eternity. Man nails himself to his holy cross to reach life. The flames of faith and charity nail him to his cross, but hope which is between the former and the latter, elevate towards heaven. But remember the lesson, if charity is lacking. The throne is without light, and the body, unnailed on one side, hangs towards mud and no longer sees heaven. It thus cancels the wholesome effects of hope and ends up by making sterile also faith. Because when one is detached from two of the three theological virtues, one falls into languor and deadly chill. Do not reject God even in the least things. And to refuse to assist one's neighbour through heathen pride is to reject God. My doctrine is a yoke that bends guilty mankind. It is a mallet that breaks the hard bark to free its spirit. It is a yoke and a hammer indeed. And yet he who accepts it does not feel the tiredness that all other doctrines and all other human things give. And he who allows himself to be struck by it does not feel the pain of being crushed in his human ego, but feels a sensation of liberation. Why do you endeavour to get rid of it, to replace it with what is lead and pain? You all have your sorrows and your difficulties. All mankind has sorrows and difficulties, which at times are beyond human strength. From children, like this one, who is already carrying on his little shoulders a heavy weight, which bends him and prevents his lips from smiling childishly and removes all thoughtlessness from his mind, which from a human point of view has never been childish, to the old man who is declining towards his sepulchre with all the disappointments, troubles, burdens and wounds of his long life. But in my doctrine and in my faith, there is the relief from all such overwhelming burdens. That is why it is called the gospel. And he who accepts it and obeys will be blessed on the earth also, because he will have God to comfort him and virtues to make his way easy and bright as if they were good sisters, who, holding him by the hand with lit lamps, illuminate his way and his life and sing the eternal promises of God to him. Until, yielding in peace his tired body to the earth, he awakes in paradise. Why, men, do you wish to be fatigued Desolate, tired, disgusted, desperate. When you can be relieved and consoled. 
Why do you, my apostles, wish too to feel the fatigue, the difficulty, the severity of your mission? Whereas with the reliance of a child, you could have cheerful zeal, bright aptitude to accomplish it, and realize and perceive that it is severe only for the unrepentant who do not know God whilst for its believers it is like a mother who supports a child on his way, pointing out to his uncertain steps, stones and thorns, nests of snakes and ditches, that he may identify them and thus avoid danger. You are now desolate. Your desolation had a really miserable beginning. You are desolate, first of all, because of my humility as if it were a crime against myself. And you are now distressed because you have understood that you have grieved me and that you are still so far from perfection. But only in a few, this latter desolation is devoid of pride. Of the pride hurt by the ascertainment that you are still nothing whilst out of pride you would like to be perfect. Be only humbly willing to accept a reproach and to confess that you are wrong, promising in your hearts that you want perfection for a superhuman purpose. And then come to me. I correct you, but I understand and I am indulgent. Come to me, you apostles, and come to me, you all men who suffer through material, moral, spiritual sorrows. These last ones are caused by the fact that you cannot sanctify yourselves as you would like, with promptitude and without returning to evil, for the love of God you have. The way of sanctification is long and mysterious, and sometimes it is covered unknown to the walker who proceeds through darkness with the taste of poison in his mouth and thinks that he is not proceeding and is not drinking a celestial liquid and does not realize that such spiritual blindness is an element of perfection. Blessed, three times blessed, are those who continue to proceed without enjoyment of light and kindness, and that do not surrender because they see or hear nothing, and they do not stop saying, I will not proceed until God grants me some delight. I tell you, the darkest road will suddenly become the best lighted one, opening onto celestial landscapes and the poison after removing all relish for human things will change into heavenly sweetness for those brave believers who, quite astonished, will exclaim, Why all this? Why so much kindness and joy to me? Because they have persevered, and God will let them enjoy on the earth what heaven is. But in the meantime, come to me. You all who are fatigued and tired, you apostles, and with you all the men who seek God, who weep because of the sorrows of the world, who have become exhausted in their loneliness, and I will restore you. Take my yoke upon you. It is not heavy. It is a support. Embrace my doctrine as you would embrace a beloved bride. Imitate your master, who does not confine himself to bless it, but does what he teaches. Learn from me, who am meek and humble-hearted. You will find rest for your souls, because meekness and humility grant the kingdom, both on the earth and in heaven. I have already told you that the true triumphs among men 
are those who conquer them by love. And love is always meek and humble. I would never ask you to do things that are beyond your strength, because I love you, and I want you with me in my kingdom. Take, therefore, my insignia and my uniform, and strive to be like me, and as my doctrine teaches. Do not be afraid, because my yoke is sweet, and its weight is light whereas the glory that you will enjoy if you are faithful to me is infinitely powerful, infinite and eternal. I will leave you for some time. I am going to the lake with the boy. He will find some friends. Later we shall eat our bread together. Come, Joseph, I will introduce you to the little ones who love me. The poem of the man God, the second year of the public life. Chapter 268. The dispute with the Pharisees and the arrival of Jesus' mother and brothers. 2nd of September, 1945. The scene is the same as in the last vision. Jesus is taking leave of the widow, holding little Joseph by the hand, and he says to the woman, Nobody will come before I come back, unless they are Gentiles. But keep here until the day after tomorrow, whoever should come, saying that I shall definitely be here. I will, Master, and if there are any sick people, I will give them hospitality as you taught me. Goodbye, then, and peace be with you. Come, Manaya. From this brief conversation, I understand that sick and unhappy people in general have come to the Master at Chorazin, and that Jesus has been evangelizing, not only working, but also through miracles. And if Chorazin is still indifferent, it really means that it is a wild, untillable soil. And yet Jesus walks through it, exchanging greetings with those who greet him, as if nothing were the matter, and then resuming his conversation with Manian who is uncertain whether he should leave again for Machaerus or remain another week. In the meantime, in the house at Capernaum, they are preparing for the Sabbath. Matthew, still limping a little, welcomes his companions, offers them water and fresh fruit, inquiring about their mission. Peter turns up his nose, seeing that some Pharisees are already sauntering near the house. They want to poison our Sabbath. I almost feel like going to meet the master to tell him to go to Bethsaida and thus frustrate the plans. And do you think that the master would do it? Asks his brother. Then there is that poor wretch waiting for him in the room on the ground floor, remarks Matthew. We could take him to Bethsaida by boat, and I... Or someone else could go and meet the master, says Peter. It is not a bad idea, says Philip, who would willingly go to Bethsaida where his family is. All the more that, take note, their guardianship has been reinforced with scribes. Let us go immediately. You will take the sick man, go through the kitchen garden and away through the back of the house. I will take the boat to the fig wheel and James will do likewise. Sama Zealot and Jesus' brothers will go and meet the master. I am not going away with the possessed man, proclaims the Iscariot. Why not? Were you afraid the demon might cling to you? Don't bother me, Simon of Jonah. I said that I am not going and I will not go. Go with the cousins to meet Jesus. No. Oh, come by boat. No. Well, what is it you want? You are always a hindrance. I want to stay here where I am. I am not afraid of anybody, and I am not running away. In any case, the master would not be happy with the trick, and there would be another sermon reproaching us, and I have no intention of getting it through your fault. You may go. I will stay here to report. 
definitely no. Either everybody or nobody, shouts Peter. Then nobody, because the master is here. Here he is coming, says the steward seriously, looking down the road. Peter, who is obviously dissatisfied, grumbles into his beard, but he goes to meet Jesus with the others. After greeting him, they inform him of a blind and dumb man possessed who has been waiting for several hours with his relatives for him. Matthew explains, He is like an inert body. He threw himself on some empty sacks and has not moved since. His relatives hope in you. Come and refresh yourself and you will assist him later. No, I am going to him at once. Where is he? In the room on the ground floor near the oven. I put him in there with his relatives, because there are many Pharisees and scribes who seem to be lying in wait. Yes, and it would be better not to make them happy, grumbles Peter. Is Judas of Simon not here? asks Jesus. He stayed in the house. He must do the opposite of what others do, grumbles Peter again. Jesus looks at him but does not reproach him. He goes quickly towards the house, entrusting the boy just to Peter, who caresses him, taking out at once from his wide sash a whistle, saying, One for you and one for my son. I will take you to see him tomorrow evening. I've got a shepherd to make them for me after I had spoken to him of Jesus. Jesus enters the house. He greets Judas, who seems to be busy sorting out the kitchenware. And then he goes straight to a kind of low, dark storeroom beside the oven. Get the sick man to come out, orders Jesus. A Pharisee, who is not from Capernaum, but whose standoffishness is even worse than that of the local Pharisees, says, He is not sick. He is possessed. That is still a disease of the spirit. But his eyes and tongue are bound. It is always a disease of the spirit that expands to limbs and organs. If you had allowed me to finish, you would have realised that is what I wanted to say. Fever is in the blood when one is ill, but after the blood it attacks this or that part of the body. The Pharisee does not know what to retort and becomes silent. The possessed man has been led before Jesus. He is motionless. Matthew was quite right. He is very greatly impeded by the demon. People are gathering in the meantime. It is incredible how, particularly during the hours that I would call of relaxation, people were so quick in gathering where there was something to be seen. The notables of Capernaum are now there and among them there are four Pharisees. Jairus is also there, and in a corner, with the excuse of supervising order, there is the Roman centurion, and citizens from other towns are with him. In the name of God, depart from the eyes and the tongue of this man. I want it. Set him free. You are no longer permitted to have him. Go away, shouts Jesus stretching out his hands while giving the order. The miracle begins with a howl of rage from the demon and ends with a cry of joy of the cured man, who shouts, Son of David! Son of David! Holy and King! How can this man know that it was he who cured him? asks a scribe. It is all a farce! These people are paid to do that, says the Pharisee, shrugging his shoulders. By who? If you do not mind me asking you, asks Jairus, by you too. And for what purpose? To make Capernaum famous? Do not mortify your intelligence by taking nonsense, and your tongue by making it foul with lies. 
You know that it is not true, and you ought to realize that you are talking nonsense. What has happened here has happened in many parts of Israel, so there must be someone paying everywhere. I did not really know that the common people in Israel were very rich, because you, and with you all the mighty ones, do not certainly pay for that. So, it is the common people who pay, being the only ones who love the master? You are the head of the synagogue and you love him. There is Manaen. At Bethany there is Lazarus of Theophilus. They are not common people. But they are honest, and I am honest too. And we do not cheat anybody in no way, much less in matters of faith. We do not take the liberty of doing that, because we fear God and we have understood what is pleasant to God. Honesty. The Pharisee turned their back to Jairus, and they attacked the relatives of the cured man. Who told you to come here? Who? Many people who had already been cured, or their relatives. But what did they give you? Give? the assurance that he would cure him. Was he really ill? Oh, sly minds! Do you think that all this is feigned? If you do not believe it, go to Gadara and inquire about the misfortune of the family of Anna of Ishmael. The irritated people of Capernaum are in tumult, while some Galileans who have come from near Nazareth say, And yet, He's the son of Joseph, the carpenter. The citizens of Capernaum, being faithful to Jesus, shout, No, he is what he said, and what the cured man has just said, son of God and son of David. Do not increase the excitement of the population with your statements, says a scribe contemptuously. And what is he then, according to you? A Beelzebub! Oh, tongues of vipers! Blasphemers! You are possessed, heartless men! You are our ruin! Do you want to deprive us also of the joy of the Messiah? Usurers! Aristones! A real uproar. Jesus, who had gone into the kitchen to drink some water, appears on the threshold in time to hear once again the stale, stupid accusation of the Pharisees. He is a Beelzebub, because demons obey him. The great Beelzebub, who is his father, helps him, and he drives out demons only through the assistance of Beelzebub, the prince of demons. Jesus descends the two little steps of the threshold and comes forward. He stops erect, severe and calm, in front of the group of scribes and Pharisees, and staring at them with keen eyes, he says to them, Also on the earth we see that a kingdom divided into opposed parties becomes weak internally, and can be easily attacked and laid waste by nearby countries that make it their slave. Also on the earth we see that a town divided into conflicting parts does not flourish, and the same applies to a family, the members of which are divided by mutual hatred. It falls to pieces and becomes a useless nibble, which is of no use to anybody, and the laughing stock of fellow citizens. Harmony is shrewdness besides being necessary because it keeps people independent, strong, and loving. Patriots, citizens, relatives ought to ponder on that, 
when for the caprice of an individual advantage they are tempted to have separations or commit abuses, which are always dangerous because they are alternative in parties and they destroy love. And such shrewdness is practiced by those who are the masters of the world. Consider Rome in its undeniable power, so painful to us. Rome rules the world, but they are united by one mind and one will to rule. Even amongst them, there must be differences, aversions, rebellions, but they lie at the bottom. On the surface, they are one block without cracks or perturbations. They all want the same thing and they are successful because of that. And they will be successful as long as they want the same thing. Consider that example of human cohesive shrewdness and say, if the children of this world are like that, what will Satan be like? The Romans are demons as far as we are concerned, but their hidden Satanism is nothing compared to the perfect Satanism of Satan and his demons. In their eternal kingdom, without time, without end, with no limits to cunning and wickedness, where they rejoice in being detrimental to God and men, and to be harmful is their very life and their only cruel, painful enjoyment. They have attained with cursed perfection the fusion of their spirits in one will, to be harmful. Now, if, as you state, to insinuate doubt about my power, Satan is the one who helps me because I am a minor Beelzebub, does it not follow that Satan is divided against himself? And his demons, if he drives them out of the people possessed by him? And if he is at variance with his followers, can his kingdom last? No. It is not. Satan is very shrewd and does not damage himself in the hearts of men. The aim of his life is to steal, to damage, to lie, to offend, to upset. To steal the souls of God and the peace of men. To damage the children of the father grieving him. To lie in order to mislead. To offend in order to rejoice, to upset because he is disorder and cannot change. He is eternal in his being and in his methods. But answer this question. If I drive out demons in the name of Beelzebub, in whose name do your sons drive them out? Are you willing to admit that they are Beelzebub as well? If you say that, they will consider you slanderous. And if their holiness is such that they will not react to your accusations, you will condemn yourselves confessing that you think that you have many demons in Israel and God will judge you in the name of the children of Israel accused by you of being demons. Therefore, Whoever may pass judgment, in actual fact, they will be your judges, where judgment is not suborned by human pressure. If instead, as it is true, I expel demons through the Spirit of God, that would be evidence that the kingdom of God and the king of that kingdom have come to you. Which king has such power? that no averse force can resist him. Thus, I bind and compel the usurpers of the children of my kingdom to depart from the place they have occupied and give me back the prey so that I may take possession of it. Is that not what is done by one who wants to enter a house inhabited by a powerful man to take his property, rightly or wrongly acquired? It is. He enters and ties him, 
and then he can plunder the house. I tie the dark angel who has taken what is mine, and I take away from him the good property he has stolen of me. And I am the only one who can do it, because I alone am the strong one, the father of the future century, the prince of peace. Clarify for us what you mean by saying, father of the future century. Do you think that you will live until the new century? And still more foolishly, do you think that you, a poor man, will create time? Time belongs to God, asks a scribe. And are you a scribe asking me? Do you not know that there will be a century that will have a beginning but no end, and that it will be mine? I shall triumph in it, gathering round me its children, and they will live forever like the century that I shall have created, and I am already creating it, giving the spirit its true value above the flesh, the world, and above the infernal angels whom I expel because I can do everything. That is why I say that those who are not with me are against me, and those who do not gather with me scatter, because I am he who I am, and he who does not believe that which was already prophesied sins against the Holy Spirit, whose word was announced by the prophets, and it is neither false nor wrong and must be believed without resistance. And I tell you, men will be forgiven everything, all their sins and their blasphemy, because God knows that man is not only spirit, but also flesh, and his flesh, when tempted, is subject to sudden weakness. But blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven. He who has spoken against the Son of Man will still be forgiven, because the weight of the flesh enveloping my person and the man who speaks against me can still mislead. But he who has spoken against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this or in future life, because the truth is what it is, clear, holy, undeniable, and manifested to the Spirit in such a way that it cannot mislead. Only those who err deliberately want to err, to deny the truth spoken by the Holy Spirit is to deny the word of God and the love given by that word for the sake of men. And the sin against love is not forgiven. Every tree bears its fruit. You bear yours, but your fruit is not good. If you give a good tree to have it planted in the orchard, it will give good fruit. But if you give a bad tree, the fruit it will yield will be bad, and everybody will say, this is not a good tree, because a tree is known by its fruit. And how can you think that you are able to speak well, since you are bad? Because a mouth speaks of what fills its heart. Because it is out of the superabundance of what is within us that we act and speak. A good man takes good things out of his good treasure. A wicked man takes wicked things out of his evil one, and he speaks and behaves according to what is within him. I tell you solemnly that idleness is sinful, but it is better to be idle than accomplish wicked deeds. And I also tell you that it is better to be silent than speak idly and wickedly. Even if to be silent is to be idle, 
do that rather than sin with your tongues. I assure you that on doomsday, justification will be requested for every word spoken idly to men. And that men will be justified by the words they have spoken. And by their words, they will be condemned. Be careful, therefore, because you speak many words that are more than idle, as they are not only idle, but also harmful, and are spoken to drive hearts away from the truth speaking to you. The Pharisees and scribes consult one another, and afterwards, pretending to be kind, they ask, Master, it is easier to believe what one sees. Give us, therefore, a sign so that we may believe that you are what you say you are. You can see that there is in you the sin against the Holy Spirit, who several times has pointed me out to you as the Word incarnate, Word and Saviour, who has come in the predicted time, preceded and followed by the signs prophesied, and operating what the Spirit says. They reply, we believe in the Spirit, but how can we believe in you unless we see a sign with our own eyes? How can you believe in the Spirit whose actions are spiritual if you do not believe in mine that are perceptible by your eyes? My life is full of them. Are they not enough? No, they are not. I say so myself. They are not enough. One sign only will be given to this adulterous, wicked generation that seeks a sign. That of the prophet Jonah. In fact, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, so the Son of Man will be for three days in the bowels of the earth. I tell you solemnly that the Ninevites will rise on the day of judgment like all men and they will rebel against this generation and condemn it because they did penance upon Jonah's preaching but you did not. And there is one here who is greater than Jonah and so the queen of the south will rise and stand up against you and will condemn you because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And there is one greater than Solomon here. Why do you say that this generation is adulterous and wicked? It is not any worse than the others. There are the same saints in it as in the others. The structure of Israel has not changed. You offend us. You offend yourselves by injuring your souls because you remove them from the truth and therefore from salvation. But I will reply to you just the same. This generation is holy only in garments and outward appearance. It is not holy inwardly. There are in Israel the same names, meaning the same things, but there is no reality of things. There are the same habits, garments and rites, but their spirit is missing. You are adulterers because you rejected the supernatural marriage with the divine law and you have married in a second adulterous union, the law of Satan. You are circumcised only in a frail member. Your hearts are no longer circumcised. And you are wicked because you have sold yourselves to the evil one. I have spoken. You offend us too grievously. But if it is so, why do you not free? 
Israel from its demon, so that it may become holy. Is Israel willing to do that? No. Those poor people who come here to be freed from the demon are willing, because they feel it like a burden and shame. But you do not feel that, and you would be freed quite uselessly, because as you are not anxious to be relieved, you would be caught again at once and in a stronger way. Because when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, it wanders through arid country, looking for a place to rest and cannot find one. The country is not materially arid, mind you. It is arid because it is hostile to him, as it will not receive him, just as arid soil is hostile to seed. He then says, I will go back to the house from which I was expelled by force and against his will and I am sure that he will welcome me and let me rest. In fact, he goes back to the one he possessed and many times finds him willing to welcome him, because I solemnly tell you that man feels nostalgia more for Satan than for God. And if Satan does not oppress his body, he does not complain of being possessed. He thus goes back and finds the house empty, swept, tidied, smelling of purity. He then goes off and collects seven other spirits, because he does not want to lose it again. And with these seven spirits, more evil than himself, he enters the house and they all settle in there. And the present state of a man who was converted once, and is perverted a second time, is worse than it was before. Because the demon now knows exactly how much that man loves Satan and is ungrateful to God, and also because God will not go back where they tread on his graces and where people, after the first experience of possession, open their arms to a greater one. A relapse into Satanism is worse than a relapse into lethal thysis, already cured once. It cannot improve or recover. The same will apply to this generation, which, although converted by the Baptist, wanted to return to sin because it loves the evil one and does not love me. A whispering, which is neither of approval nor of protest, runs through the crowd, which has become so large that not only the kitchen garden and the terrace are full, but also the street. People are sitting astride the low wall. Many have climbed up the fig tree and the trees of the neighbouring orchards, because everybody wants to listen to the dispute between Jesus and his enemies. The whispering like a wave that from an open sea arrives at the shore from mouth to mouth, reaches the apostles who are closer to Jesus, that is Peter, John, the Zealot, and Alphaeus' sons. Some of the other apostles are on the terrace, some in the kitchen, except Judas, who is in the street among the crowds. Peter, John, the Zealot, Alphaeus' sons, pick up the whispering and says to Jesus, Master, your mother is here with your brothers. They are out there in the street and they are looking for you because they want to speak to you. Tell the crowds to move away so that they may come to you because a grave reason has certainly brought them here looking for you. Jesus raises his head and at the end of the crowd he sees the anguished face of his mother who strives not to weep, while Joseph of Alphaeus is speaking to her excitedly. And he sees her repeated emphatic gestures of denial, notwithstanding Joseph's insistency. He sees also the embarrassed face of Simon, who is openly grieved and disgusted. But he does not smile, neither does he give any order. 
he leaves the sorrowful one in her grief and his cousins where they are. He lowers his head and looks at the crowd and replying to the apostles near him, he replies also to those who are far away and are endeavouring to make blood have more weight than one's duty. Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? He looks round with severe countenance as his face becomes pale as a result of the violent effort he has to make against himself to set duty above family ties and blood and to disavow his tie to his mother in order to serve his father and pointing with a large gesture to the crowd pressing round him in the red light of torches and in the silvery light of the almost full moon. He says, This is my mother, and these are my brothers. Those who do the will of God are my brothers and the sisters. They are my mother. I have nobody else, and my relatives will be such if they are the first to do the will of God with greater perfection than anybody else to the extent of completely sacrificing every other will or the call of blood or of affection. The crowds whisper in louder voices like a sea made rough by a sudden gust of wind. The scribes begin to withdraw, saying, He is a demon! He repudiates his own blood! His relatives come forward, saying, He's crazy! He tortures his very mother! The apostles say, His word is really full of heroism. The crowds comment, how much he loves us. Mary, Joseph and Simon elbow their way through the crowd with difficulty. While Mary is thoroughly kind, Joseph is very angry and Simon is utterly embarrassed. They arrive near Jesus. Joseph attacks him at once. You are crazy. You are offending everybody. You do not respect even your mother. But I am here now and I will stop you. Is it true that you are wandering about as a workman? If it is true, why do you not work in your own shop and thus provide for your mother? Why do you lie saying that your task is to preach? You idle and ungrateful man when you work for money with other people. I think that you are really possessed by a demon misleading you. Reply to me. Jesus turns round and takes little Joseph by the hand. He draws him close to himself and holding him by his armpit, he says, I worked to provide food for this innocent child and his relatives and persuade them that God is good. It was a sermon on humility and charity for Chorazin. And not only for Chorazin, but also for you, Joseph, my unfair brother. But I forgive you, because I know that you have been bitten by snakes. And I forgive you too, Simon, who are so changeable. I have nothing to forgive my mother or be forgiven by her, because her judgment is just. Let the world do what it wants. I do what God wants. And with the blessing of my father and mother, I am happier than I would be if the whole world hailed me king according to the world. Come, mother, do not weep. They do not know what they are doing. Forgive them. Oh, son, I know. You know. There is nothing else to be said. There is nothing else to be said, except to say to the people, Go in peace.
And Jesus blesses the crowd, and holding Mary with his right hand, and Joseph with his left one, he goes towards the staircase, and is the first one to climb it. The poem of the man God, the second year of the public life, chapter two hundred and sixty nine. The news of the murder of John the Baptist, 4th of September, 1945. Jesus is curing some sick people. Man and only is present. They are in the house in Capernaum, in the shady kitchen garden early in the morning. Manan is no longer wearing his precious belt or the thin plate on his forehead. His tunic is held tight by a woolen cord and his headgear by a thin strip of cloth. Jesus is bareheaded, as he always is, when at home. After curing and comforting the sick people, Jesus goes upstairs with Manan and they both sit on the window sill of the window facing the mountain because the sun is shining on the other side of the house and it is very warm, although it is no longer the height of summer. Vintage will be starting soon, says Manir. Yes, then it will be the Feast of the Tabernacles, and it will soon be winter. When are you thinking of going away? Mm. I would never leave, but I am thinking of the Baptist. Herod is weak, if one knows how to influence him to do good. If he does not become good, he remains, at least, not bloodthirsty. But only few people advise him wisely. And that woman, that woman. But I would like to stay here until your apostles come back. Not that I rely much on myself, but I still have some weight. Although the favour I enjoyed previously has diminished much since they have realised that I now follow the way of good. But it does not matter. I would like to have enough courage to be able to abandon everything and follow you completely, like the disciples whom you are expecting. But shall I ever succeed? We, who are not of the common people, find it more difficult to follow you. Why? Because the tentacles of your poor wealth hold you back. However, I know some people who are not exactly rich, but are learned or about to be so, and they do not come either. They also have the tentacles of poor riches holding them back. One is not rich only in money. There is the wealth of knowledge. Few can confess with Solomon. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Which confession is resumed and enlarged not so much materially, but deeply in coalesce. Do you remember it? Human science is vanity, because... To increase human knowledge only is anguish and affliction of the spirit. And he who multiplies science multiplies such anguish. I solemnly tell you that it is so. And I also tell you that it would not be so if human science was supported and bridled by supernatural wisdom and the holy love of God. Pleasure is vanity because it does not last, but quickly fades away after burning, leaving ashes in emptiness. Wealth stored up by means of various industries is vanity for the man who dies, as he leaves it to other people and cannot repel death by means of it. Woman is vanity, when she is considered a female and desired as such. So we conclude that the only thing which is not vanity is the holy fear of God and obedience to his commandments. That is the wisdom of man, who is not only flesh, but has a second nature, the spiritual one. Who can reason thus and is willing, is able to break off from every tentacle of poor wealth and move freely towards the sun. I want to remember those words. How much you have given me during the past days. I can now go back to that ugly court, which seems bright only to fools, and seems powerful and free, 
whereas it is misery, prison and darkness, and I will be able to go back with a treasure that will enable me to live better waiting for the best. But will I ever reach that best, which is to be entirely yours? Yes, you will. When? Next year? Later? Or when old age will make me wise? You will reach it in a few hours by becoming spiritually mature and perfect in willing. Manan looks at him thoughtfully, inquisitively, but he does not ask any other question. There is silence. Then Jesus says, Have you ever approached Lazarus of Bethany? No, Master, I can say no. If we met on few occasions, I cannot say it was out of friendship. You know, I was with Herod, and Herod was against him, so... Lazarus would now see you in God, beyond such things. You must endeavour to approach him as a fellow disciple. I will do it, if you wish so. Excited voices are heard in the garden. They are anxiously asking, The master, the master, is he here? The harmonious voice of the landlady replies, He's upstairs. Who are you, sick people? No. Disciples of John, that we want Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus looks out of the window, saying, Peace be with you. Oh, it is you. Come in. They are the three shepherds, John, Matthias, and Simeon. Oh, master, they say, looking up and showing their sorrowful faces. Not even the sight of Jesus cheers them up. Jesus leaves the room and goes out to meet them on the terrace. Manan follows him. They meet where the staircase leads onto the sunny terrace. The three men kneel down, kissing the floor. Then John says, on behalf of them all, Receive us, Lord, because we are your inheritance. Tears stream down the faces of the disciple and his companions. Jesus and Manahem utter one only cry. John! He has been killed! The word drops like a loud, dull noise, which drowns every other noise in the world. And yet, it was uttered in a low voice. But it petrifies both him who speaks and those who listen. And the earth, upon hearing it and being horrified, seems to interrupt every noise. Such is the period of deep silence and complete immobility in animals in leafy branches, in the air. Doves stop cooing. Blackbirds interrupt their musical songs. The choir of sparrows is struck dumb. And the chirping cicada suddenly becomes silent, as if its contrivance has broken down unexpectedly. While the wind which was caressing the leaves of vines and trees, making them rustle like silk, and causing poles to squeak, drop completely. Jesus becomes as pale as ivory, while his eyes dilate, glazing over. He opens his arms, saying, and his voice is deep, in the effort to make it steady. Peace to the martyr of justice and to my precursor. He folds his arms, collects his thoughts in prayer, communicating with the Spirit of God and of the Baptist. Manna and does not dare to make a gesture. 
contrary to Jesus. He blushes vehemently and has an impulsion of anger. Then he becomes stiff and his excitement is revealed by the mechanical movement of his right hand, rumpling the cord of his tunic, and of the left one, which unintentionally searches for his dagger. And Manan shakes his head, pitying his weak mind that does not remember that he had renounced weapons in order to be the disciple of the meek master, near the meek master. Jesus opens his mouth and eyes again. His countenance, his eyes, his voice has resumed the divine majesty habitual to him. Only a deep melancholy tempered with peace hovers about him. Come and tell me, as from today you will be mine. And it takes them into the room, closing the door and half drawing the curtains to have a subdued light and an atmosphere of concentration around the sorrow and the beauty of the Baptist's death and to form a partition between such perfection of life and the corrupt world. Speak, he tells them. Manan is still petrified. He is near the group but does not utter one word. It was the evening of the feast. The event was unforeseeable. Only two hours before, Herod had consulted with John and had dismissed him very kindly. And shortly before, the murder, the, the martyrdom, the crime, the glorification. Herod had sent a servant with icy fruit and rare wives for the prisoner. John had distributed everything to us. He never changed his austerity. We were the only ones to be there, thanks to Manan. We were in the palace as kitchen servants and stable grooms. And that was a grace, because we could always see our John. John and I were in the kitchen, while Simeon, supervised in the stables, ensuring that the grooms looked after the mounts of guests properly. The palace was full of important people, military commanders and gentlemen from Galilee. Herodias had locked herself in her rooms after a violent quarrel in the morning with Herod. Manian interferes. But when did the hyena come? Two days Previously, unexpectedly, saying to the monarch that she could not live away from him and be absent on the day of his feast. Viper and sorceress, as she has always been, she had made a laughing stock of him. But that morning, although he was already full of wine and lust, Herod refused to give the woman what she asked for with loud cries. But nobody thought it was John's life. She remained disdainfully in her rooms. She sent back the royal dishes that Herod sent to her on precious trays. She kept only a precious one full of fruit, exchanging the gift with an amphora of drugged wine for Herod. Drugged! Ah, oh, a vicious, intoxicated nature was sufficient to drug him for the crime. From the servants waiting at the table, we learned that after the dance of the mimers, nay, halfway through it, Salome had rushed dancing into the banquet hall, and the mimers, in the presence of the royal girl, had withdrawn against the walls. We were told that her dance was perfect, lewd and perfect, worthy of the guests. Herod. Oh, perhaps a new desire of incest was fermenting in his heart. Herod, at the end of the dance, said enthusiastically to Salome, You have danced very well. 
I swear that you deserve a prize. I swear that I will give it to you. I swear that I will give anything you may ask me for. I swear it in the presence of everybody. And the word of a king is loyal also, without swearing. Ask what you want. <sighs> and Salome, simulating perplexity, innocence and modesty, enveloping herself in her veils with bashful gesture, after so much impudicity, said, Allow me, great king, to ponder for a moment. I will withdraw and I will come back later, because your grace has moved me. And she left, going to her mother. Selma told me that she went in, laughing, saying, Mother, you have won. Give me the tray. And Herodias, with a cry of triumph, ordered the slave to give the girl the tray that she had kept previously, saying, Go and come back with a hated head, and I will clothe you with pearls of gold. And Selma was struck with horror and obeyed. Salome re-entered the hall dancing, and went to prostrate herself at the king's feet, saying, here on this tray that you sent to my mother as a token that you love her and you love me, I want the head of John and I will dance again if it pleases you so much. I will dance the dance of victory because I have won. I have beaten you, king. I have defeated life and I am happy. Words were repeated to us by a friendly cupbearer. And Herod was embarrassed, being caught by two desires to abide by his promise, to be just. But he could not be just, because he is unjust. He nodded to the headsman who was standing behind the royal seat and he took from Salome's raised hands the tray and from the banquet hall went down to the lower rooms. John and I saw him cross the yard and shortly afterwards we heard Simeon's cry, Murderers! And then we saw the headsman pass again with the head on the tray. John, your precursor, was dead. Simeon, can you tell me how he died? Asks Jesus after some time. Yes, he was praying. He had previously said to me, The two messengers will be back before long, and those who do not believe will believe. But remember, should I be no longer alive when they come back, I, on the point of dying, say to you, Jesus of Nazareth is the true Messiah, so that you may repeat it to the others. He was always thinking of you. The headsman entered. I uttered a cry. John looked up and saw him. He stood up and said, You can take only my life, but the lasting truth is, that it is not illegal to do wrong. And he was about to say something to me when the headsman swung his heavy sword while John was standing and the head fell from the bust in a stream of blood that reddened the goatskin while his thin face blanched 
but his open eyes were still alive and accusing. The head rolled at my feet. I fell at the same time at his body and I fainted with grief. After, after Herodias had disfigured it, the head was thrown to the dogs. But we picked it up at once and we tied it in a precious veil together with the trunk. And during the night, we recomposed the body and carried it out of Macaris. We embalmed it at daybreak in a nearby acacia thicket with the help of other disciples. But it was taken from us again to be slashed. But she cannot destroy it, I cannot forgive him. And her slaves, fearing death, or more ferocious than jackals in taking the head from us. If you had been there, Manan, and I'd been there. But that head is her malediction. Nothing is taken from the glory of the precursor, even if the body's mutilated. Is that right, master? That is true. Even if the dogs had destroyed it, his glory would not change. Neither has his word changed, master. His eyes, although this figured, under a large wound, still say, You are not allowed. But we have lodged him, says Matthias. And we are now your disciples, because that is what he said, and he told us that you already know. Yes, you have been mine for months. How did you come? On foot, by stages. It was a long, painful journey. In the heat of sands and of the sun, made even more painful by grief, we have been walking for almost twenty days. You will rest now. Manin asked, Was Herod not surprised at my absence? Yes. At first he was annoyed, then he became furious. But when his rage calmed down, he said, One judge less. That is what our friend the cupbearer told us. Jesus says, One judge less. He has God as a judge, and that is enough. Let us go to where we sleep. You are tired and covered with dust. You will find the garments and sandals of your companions. Take them. Refresh yourselves. What belongs to one belongs to everybody. Matthias, since you are tall, you can take one of my tunics. We will provide later. My apostles will be coming before night, because this is the Sabbath Eve. Isaac will be coming next week with the disciples, and later Benjamin and Daniel will come. Elias, Joseph and Levi will be here after the tabernacles. It is time for others to join the twelve. Go and rest now. Manan takes them in and then comes back. Jesus remains with Manan. He sits down pensively and is clearly sad with his head reclined on a hand, his elbow resting on his knee as a support. Manan is sitting near the table and does not move. He's sullen. His face is a storm. After a long time, Jesus raises his head, looks at him and asks, And what are you going to do now? I do not know yet. There is no purpose in staying any longer at Macaris, but I would like to remain at the court to find out, to protect you, according to what I learn. You had better follow me without any delay, but I will not force you. You will come when the old man has been destroyed bit by bit. 
I would also like to take that head away from that woman. She's not worthy to have it. Jesus has a pale hint of a smile and says frankly, And you are not yet dead to human wealth, but you are dear to me just the same. I know that I shall not lose you, even if I have to wait. I know how to wait. Master, I would like to give you my generosity to comfort you. But you are suffering. I can see it. It is true. I am suffering. Very much. Only because of John? I do not think so. You know that he is in peace. I know that he is in peace, and I perceive him close to me. Well then? Then, Manaen, what does dawn precede? The day master. Why do you ask me? Because the death of John precedes the day when I will be the Redeemer. And the human part in me trembles at the idea. Mana and I am going up the mountain. You stay here to receive whoever should come and to assist those who have already come. Stay until I come back. Then you will do whatever you wish. Goodbye. And Jesus leaves the room. He goes slowly down the steps, crosses the kitchen garden at the back of it. He takes a little path along ruffled gardens, olive groves, orchards of apple and fig trees and vineyards, and he climbs the slope of a little hill where he disappears from my sight. The Poem of the Man God The Second Year of the public life. Chapter 270. Departure in the direction of Tarakia. 5th of September, 1945. Jesus goes back to the house at dead of night. He enters the kitchen garden silently. He looks for a moment into the dark kitchen. He looks into the two rooms where are the mats and beds. They are empty also. Only the changed clothes piled on the floor tell that the apostles have come back. The house is so silent that it seems uninhabited. Jesus, making less noise than a shadow, goes up the little steps, immaculate white in the whiteness of the full moon, and arrives on the terrace. He walks along it, he seems a ghost moving about silently, a bright ghost. In the white incandescence of the moon, he looks thinner and taller. He lifts with one hand the curtain at the door of the upper room. It had been left down since John's disciples had entered with Jesus. Inside, there are the apostles, sitting here and there, in groups or alone, with John's disciples in Manaen. There is also Marcia sleeping with his head on Peter's knees. The moon illuminates the room, entering with its phosphorescent rays through the wide open windows. No one is speaking, and no one is sleeping, with the exception of the boy who is sitting on a mat on the floor. Jesus enters quietly, and Thomas is the first to see him. Oh, master! he exclaims starting. All the others rouse themselves. Peter, in his excitement, is on the point of jumping to his feet. But he remembers the child and he stands up gently, laying Marcian's dark-haired head on his seat, and thus is the last to arrive at Jesus. While the master, with the tired voice of one who has suffered very much, is replying to John, James and Andrew who are expressing their sorrow to him. I understand, but only he who does not believe can feel desolate because of death. Not we who know and believe. 
John is no longer separated from us. He was before. Nay, he separated us. Either with me or with him. No longer so. Where he is, I am. He is near me. Peter pushes his grey-haired head among the younger ones, and Jesus sees him. You have been weeping too, Simon of Jonah. And Peter, with a voice hoarser than usual. Yes, Lord, because I was a disciple of John as well. And then, last Sabbath Eve, I was complaining that the presence of Pharisees was going to embitter our Sabbath. This is really a bitter Sabbath. I brought the boy to have a more enjoyable Sabbath. Instead, do not lose heart, Simon of Jonah. John is not lost. I am repeating that to you, too. And in exchange, we have three perfected disciples. Where is the boy? Over there, master. He's sleeping. Let him sleep, says Jesus, stopping over the dark little head which is sleeping peacefully. And he asks again, Have you had your supper? No, master. We were waiting for you and we were worried because of your delay, as we did not know where to look for you and we seem to have lost you as well. We have still plenty time to be together. Well, prepare for the supper, because afterwards we shall go to another place. I need to be alone among friends, and if we are here tomorrow, we shall always be surrounded by people. And I swear to you that I would not put up with them, particularly with those snakes of Pharisaic souls. And it would be most unfortunate if a smile escaped them concerning us in the synagogue. Be good, Simon. I have thought of that as well. That is why I came back to take you with me. The excitement on their faces can be better seen in the light of the little lamps that have been lit at the two ends of the table. Only Jesus is majestically solemn and Marcia smiles in his sleep. The boy has already had his meal, explains Peter. It is better to let him sleep then, says Jesus. And in the middle of his disciples, he offers and hands out the frugal food, which is taken without appetite, and the supper is soon over. Tell me now, what have you done? Says Jesus encouragingly. I went with Philip into the country at Bethsaida, and we evangelised and cured a sick boy, says Peter. In actual fact, it was Simon who cured him, says Philip, who does not wish to ascribe to himself a glory not belonging to him. Oh, Lord, I do not know how I did it. I prayed hard with all my heart because I felt sorry for the little sick boy. I then anointed him with oil. I rubbed him with my coarse hands and he was cured. When I saw him colour up and open his eyes, that is, when I saw him revive, I was almost afraid. Jesus lays a hand on his head without speaking. John amazed people by expelling a demon, but I had to speak, says Thomas. Your brother Judas also did it, states Matthew. Andrew too, says James of Alphaeus. Simon the Zealot instead cured a leper. Oh, he was not afraid of touching him. And he said to me, be not afraid, by the will of God, no physical disease will affect us, says Bartholomew. You are right, Simon. And what about you two? Jesus asks James of Zebedee and the Iscariot, who are a little farther away. The former talking to the three disciples of John, the latter being all alone and sulky. Oh, I did nothing says James. But Judas worked three wonderful miracles, a blind man, a paralytic, a possessed man. He looked like a lunatic to me, but that is what people said. 
And you are pulling a long face when God has assisted you so much, exclaims Peter. I can be humble as well, replies the Iscariot. And we were the guests of a Pharisee. I was rather embarrassed, but Judas knows how to deal with them, and he really appeased the Pharisee. On the first day he was standoffish, but later, is that right, Judas? Judas nods without speaking. Very well, and you will do better and better. We shall be all together next week. In the meantime, Simon, go and prepare the boats. You too, James. For everybody, master, they will not contain us. Can you not get another one? Yes, if I ask my brother-in-law, I will go. Go, and come back as soon as you are ready, and do not tell them too much. The four fishermen leave. The others go downstairs to get their sacks and mantles. Manan stays with Jesus. The boy continues to sleep. Master, are you going far? I do not know yet. They are tired and depressed. I am too. I am thinking of going to Tarikia, into the country, to be alone in peace. I have my horse, Master. But if you will allow me, I will come following the lake. Will you be there for long? Perhaps the whole week, but not longer. In that case, I will come. Master, bless me in this first departure, and relieve my heart of a burden. Which man I am? I feel remorse for leaving John. Perhaps if I had been there. No, it was his hour. And he was certainly pleased to see you come to me. Do not let that upset you. Nay, endeavour to get rid quickly and properly of the only burden you have. The gusto of being man. Become spiritual, man, Anne. You can. You are capable of being so. Goodbye, man, Anne. May peace be with you. We shall soon meet in Judea. Manian kneels down and Jesus blesses him. He then raises him and kisses him. The others come back in and exchange greetings, both the apostles and John's disciples. The fishermen are the last to come. We're ready, master. We can go. Good. Say goodbye to Manian, who is staying here until tomorrow evening. Assemble the foodstuffs, take some water and let us go. Make as little noise as possible. Peter stoops to wake Marcia. No, leave him. He might cry. I will pick him up, says Jesus, and he gently lifts the boy, who whimpers a little, but instinctively makes himself comfortable in Jesus' arms. They put the lamps out. They go out, closing the door. They go downstairs and on the threshold. They say goodbye once again to Manan, and then, in a single file, along the moonlit street, they go to the lake. A huge silvery mirror under the moon at its zenith. The three little lamps on the prows, which are already in the water, look like three red drops on the quiet mirror. They go on board, settling themselves in the boats the fishermen being the last to embark. Peter and the servant are in the boat where Jesus is, John and Andrew in the second, James and the servant in the third one. Where are we going, master? asks Peter. To Tarakia, where we landed after the miracle of the Gadarenes. It will not be boggy now, and it will be quiet. Peter sets sail, and the other two boats sail in his wake. Nobody speeds. Only when they are in the open lake and Capernaum disappears in the moonlight and things present a uniform appearance in its silvery dust, Peter says, as if he were speaking to the tiller. And I am glad they will be looking for us. My dear, and thanks to you they will not find us. To whom are you speaking, Simon? asks Bartholomew. To my boat, 
Don't you know that she's like a bride for a fisherman? How much I have talked to her. More than to Porphyria. Master, is the boy well covered? It's damp on the lake at night. Yes, he is. Listen, Simon, come here. I want to speak to you. Peter entrusts the tiller to the shipboy and comes to Jesus. I said Tarakia, but it will be quite all right to be there after the Sabbath to say goodbye once again to Mane. Could you not find a place nearby where we may stay in peace? Oh, master, in peace for us, or also for the boats. For the boats, I must go to Tarakia or some harbour on the other shore. But if you are referring to us, it is enough to go into the woods beyond the Jordan, where only wild animals will find you, and perhaps an odd fisherman who is watching nets. We can leave the boats at Tarakia. We shall be there at dawn, and we will go away quickly beyond the fort. It is easy to wade it at this time of the year. Very well, we will do that. The world is disgusting you as well, eh? You prefer fish and mosquitoes, eh? You are, right. It does not disgust me. One must not be disgusted. But I do not want you to stir up a scandal, and I wish to find comfort in you on the Sabbath. Ma master! Peter kisses Jesus' forehead and goes away, wiping a large tear that insisted in dropping out and streaming down to his beard. He goes back to his rudder, heading south resolutely, while the moonlight fades as the planet sets behind the hill, concealing its huge face from the sight of men, but still making the sky white with its light and the lake silvery on the eastern coast. The rest is dark indigo, hardly distinguishable in the light of the prow lamp. The poem of the man God, the second year of the public life, chapter 271, speaking to a scribe on the banks of the Jordan, 6th of September, 1945. When Jesus set foot on the right bank of the Jordan, a good mile probably more from the little peninsula of Tarakia, where there is nothing but beautiful green country, because the ground, which is now dry, but moist in its depths, keeps also the weakest plants alive, he finds a large crowd waiting for him. His cousins come to meet him with Simon's elet. Master, the boats have given us away. Perhaps Manaen also was a hint. Master, says Manaen apologetically, I left at night so that no one could see me, and I have not spoken to anyone, believe me. Many of them asked me where you were, and my reply to everybody was, he left. But I think the trouble was brought about by a fisherman who said that he had given you his boat. That fool of my brother-in-law, thunders Peter, and I told him to keep his mouth shut, and I also said to him that we were going to Bethsaida, and I had told him that if he said one word, I will tear his beard off, and I will do it, I will indeed. And what are we going to do now? That's the end of our peace, solitude and rest. Be good, Simon, be good. We have already had our peaceful days. In any case, I have attained part of what I intended. Teach you, comfort and calm you, to prevent offences and contrasts between you and the Pharisees of Capernaum. Now let us go to these people who are waiting for us and reward their faith and love. Is their love not a relief too? Hatred grieves us, but there is love here, so it is a joy. Peter calms down like a wind that drops suddenly, and Peter goes towards the crowd of sick people who are waiting for him so anxiously that their desire seems engraved on their faces, and he heals them one after the other kindly, patiently. He goes also to a scribe who shows his little sick son to him. And it is the scribe who says to him, See, you are running away. 
because it is useless. Hatred and love are shrewd in finding. In this case, love has found you, as it is written in the Song of Songs. You are like the beloved of the songs, and they come to you as the maid of Sulam goes to her bridegroom, facing patrol guards and Aminadab's quadrigae. Why do you say that? Because it is true. It is dangerous to come because you are hated. Do you not know that Rome is watching for you and the temple hates you? Why are you tempting me, man? Your words are insidious. To take my answer back to Rome and to the temple, I did not cure your son by deceit. The scribe, who has been reproached so gently, lowers his head confusedly and confesses. I see that you can really read the hearts of men. Forgive me. I now see that you are truly holy. Forgive me. Yes, it is true. I came, and the yeast that others put into my heart was fermenting within me. And it has found in you the necessary heat to ferment. Yes, it is true. But now I am going away without any such yeast. That is, with a new leaven. I know. I bear no grudge. Many are at fault through their own will. Many through the will of other people. God, who is just, will judge them with different measures. Scribe, be just, and do not corrupt in future as you were corrupted. When the pressure of the world will be urging you, look at the living grace, which is your son, who was rescued from death, and be grateful to God. To you, to God, all glory and praise to him. I am his Messiah, and I am the first to praise and glorify him, and the first to obey him, because man does not degrade himself by honouring and serving God in truth, but he lowers himself by serving sin. You are right. Do you always speak thus to everybody? Yes, to everybody. If I spoke to Annas, or to Gamaliel, or to a begging leper on a country path, the words would be the same, because one is the truth. Speak, then, because everybody here is begging for a word or a grace of yours. I will, so that nobody may say that I am biased against those who are honest in their convictions. Those I had are now dead, but it is true. I was honest in mine. I believed that I was serving God by fighting you. You are sincere, and that is why you deserve to understand God, who is never falsehood. But your convictions are not yet dead, I am telling you. They are like burned couch grass. They seem to be dead superficially, and have in fact received a hard blow that has exhausted them. But the roots are alive, and the soil nourishes them, and the dew invites them to strike new rhizomes, which will emit fresh shoots. You must watch that that does not happen, otherwise you will be invaded once again by couch grass. Israel is a die hard. So Israel must die? Is it a wicked plant? It must die to rise again. A spiritual reincarnation? A spiritual evolution. There is no reincarnation of any kind. Some believe in it. They are wrong. Hellenism has spread such beliefs also among us, and learned people feed on them and are proud of them, as if they were a most noble nourishment. An absurd contradiction in those who cry anathema when one of the minor 613 precepts is neglected. It is true, but that is how things are. People like to imitate even what they hate. Well, imitate me, seeing that you hate me, and it would be better for you. The scribe cannot help laughing at Jesus' witty remark. 
The people are listening, open-mouthed, and those who are farther away ask those who are near Jesus and the scribe to repeat their words. But in confidence, what do you think of reincarnation? That it is an error, I told you. There are some who maintain that the living originate from the dead, and the dead from the living, because what exists cannot be destroyed. In fact, what is eternal cannot be destroyed. But tell me, according to you, has the Creator limitations to himself? No, Master, to think that would be an abatement. You are right. Can, then, one think that he allows a spirit to reincarnate because no more than so many spirits can exist? One should not think so, yet there are some who believe it. And what is worse, Israel believes it. The thought of the immortality of the spirit, which is already a great one, even if it is joined to the error of a wrong evaluation by a pagan as to how such immortality takes place, ought to be perfect in an Israelite. Instead, it becomes a small, low, guilty thought in those who believe in it, in the terms of the heathen thesis. It is not the glory of a thought which proves itself worthy of admiration by coming close to the truth by itself, and which, therefore, testifies to the composite nature of man, as it is in heathens, because of their intuition of an eternal life, of the mysterious thing that is called soul, and distinguishes us from brutes. But it is a degradation of the thought, which, being acquainted with divine wisdom and the true God, becomes materialistic, even in so highly a spiritual thing. A spirit transmigrates only from the creator to the being, and from the being to the creator, to whom it presents itself after this life, to receive a sentence of life or of death. That is the truth, and it remains forever where it is sent. Do you not admit purgatory? Yes, I do. Why do you ask me? Because you say it remains where it is sent. Purgatory is temporary. That is why, in my thought, I assimilate it to eternal life. Purgatory is already life. Stunned, tired, but always vital. After the temporary stay in purgatory, the spirit reaches perfect life without any limitation or ties. Two things will remain. Heaven, the abyss. Paradise, hell. Two categories. The blessed, the damned. But from those three kingdoms that now exist, no spirit will ever come to clothe itself with flesh. And that until the final resurrection, which will end forever the incarnation of spirits in flesh, of the immortal in the mortal. Not of the eternal. God is eternal. Eternity is to have no beginning and no end, and that is God. Immortality is to continue to live since when life began, and that is the spirit of man. That is the difference. You say eternal life? Yes, from the moment man is created to live, because of his spirit, through grace and his own will, he can reach eternal life, not eternity. Life implies a beginning. We do not say the life of God, because God had no beginning. And what about yourself? I will live, because I am also flesh, 
and to my divine spirit, I joined the soul of the Christ in the flesh of man. God is called the living God. In fact, he does not know death. He is life, the endless life. Not life of God, just life, only that. They are nuances, O scribe. But wisdom and truth clothe themselves in nuances. Do you speak thus to Gentiles? No, they would not understand. I show them the sun. But as I would show it to a boy, so far blind and silly, who had miraculously recovered sight and intelligence. Thus, like a star, without going into the details of his composition. But you, people of Israel, are neither blind nor fools. For ages the finger of God has opened your eyes and cleared your minds. That is true, master, and yet we are blind and foolish. You have made yourselves such, and you do not want the miracle of him who loves you. Master, it is the truth, scribe. The man lowers his head and is silent. Jesus leaves him and passes by, and while doing so he caresses Marcian and the scribe's little boy, who are playing with many coloured pebbles. Rather than preach, he talks to this or that group, but he is continuously preaching as he resolves doubts, clarifies ideas. He sums up or expands on things already said or concepts only partly remembered by someone. And the hours go by thus. The Poem of the Man God the second year of the public life. Chapter 272 First Miracle of the Loaves 7th of September, 1945 The place is still the same, but the sun no longer shines from the east, filtering through the undergrowth along the Jordan in this wild place where the water of the lake flows into the riverbed. It shines equally obliquely from the west, while setting in a glorious red sky, streaked by its last rays. Under the thick foliage, the light is quite moderate, tending to the peaceful evening hues. Birds, exhilarated by the sunshine they enjoyed all day, and by the plentiful food they picked in the neighbouring country, are making an uproar of trills and songs on treetops. Evening is approaching with the final pomp of the day. The apostles pointed out to Jesus, who always teaches according to the subjects presented to him. Master, evening is approaching. This is a desert place, far from houses and villages. It is shady and damp. In a short while, it will not be possible to see or walk here. The moon rises late. Dismiss the people so that they may go to Tarakia or other villages along the Jordan to buy food and find lodgings. They need not go. Give them something to eat. They can sleep here as they did when waiting for me. Master, you know that there are only five loaves left and two fish. Bring them to me. Andrew, go and look for the boy. He is looking after the bag. A little while ago, he was with the scribe's son and two more boys, intent on making garlands of flowers and playing at kings. Andrew goes away at once. John and Philip also look for Marcian among the crowds, who continuously change place. They find him almost simultaneously, with a bag of victuals across his back, a large shoot of clematis around his head, and a belt of clematis, from which an offshoot hangs as a sword, the top being the hilt, the long stem, its blade. There are seven boys with him, all wearing the same decorations, playing court to the scribe's son, a very thin child, 
with the grave countenance of one who has suffered very much, who is adorned with flowers more than the others and plays the king. Come, Maxiam, the master wants you. Maxiam leaves his friends and runs away without taking off his floral insignia. But the other boys follow him, and Jesus is soon surrounded by a circle of children wreathed with flowers. He caresses them while Philip takes a parcel out of the bag containing some loaves, which are wrapped together with two big fish. Two kilograms of fish or a little more. They would not suffice for the seventeen people, nay, eighteen, including Manaen, of Jesus' group. They take the food to the master. Very well. Now, bring me some baskets. Seventeen, as many as you are. Marciam will hand the food to the children. Jesus stares at the scribe who has always been near him and asks, Will you give food to the hungry people too? I would like to, but I have none myself. Give mine. I will let you have it. But are you going to satisfy five thousand men, besides women and children, with those two fish and the five loaves? Undoubtedly. Do not be incredulous. Those who believe will see the miracle being accomplished. Oh, in that case, I want to hand out the food too. Then get someone to give you a basket as well. The apostles come back with baskets and hand baskets, some of which are low and wide, others are deep and narrow. The scribe comes back with a rather small one. Obviously, his faith or his incredulity made him pick that one as the largest required. Good. Leave everything here. Now get the crowds to sit in an orderly way, in rows, as far as possible. And while they do that, Jesus raises the loaves with the fish on top of them, offers them, prays and blesses them. The scribe does not take his eyes off him for a moment. Jesus breaks the five loaves into eighteen parts. He makes also eighteen parts of the two fish and puts a bit of fish, a tiny bit indeed, into each basket. He then breaks each of the eighteen bits of bread into morsels, each bit into many morsels, relatively many. About twenty, not more. He then puts each bit, which has been broken into morsels, into a basket with a bit of fish. Now take them and hand the food out to satiety. Go. Marziam, hand the food out to your companions. Oh, how heavy it is, says Marziam, lifting his basket. He goes at once towards his little friends, walking like one who carries a heavy weight. The apostles, disciples, Manna and the scribe, watch him go incredulously. They then pick up their baskets, and shaking their heads, they say to one another, The boy is joking. They are the same weight as before. And the scribe looks inside his basket puts his hand into it, searching for the bottom, because it is getting dark in the thicket where Jesus is, whereas farther away, in the glade, it is clear. However, notwithstanding their remarks, they go towards the people and begin to hand the food out. And they distribute. Now and again they look back at Jesus, thoroughly astonished, as they move farther and farther away and the master leaning against a tree with folded arms smiles sadly at their astonishment. The distribution takes a long time and is plentiful. The only one who shows no surprise is Maxia, who smiles and is happy to be able to fill the laps of so many poor children with bread and fish. 
he is also the first to go back to Jesus, saying, I have dealt out so much, so much, because I know what it is to be hungry. And he raises his little face, which is no longer emaciated, but remembering. It blanches with wide open eyes, but Jesus caresses him and the bright smile appears on his face while he leans trustfully against Jesus, his master and protector. The apostles and disciples come back slowly, dumbfounded with amazement. Last is the scribe who says nothing, but he makes a gesture that is more than a sermon. He kneels down and kisses the hem of Jesus' tunic. Take your share and give me some. Let us eat the food of God. They eat, in fact, bread and fish, each according to his need. In the meantime, the people, who are now sated, exchange their impressions also, those around Jesus make their comments, watching Marcien, who finishes his food and plays with the other children. Master, asks the scribe, why did the boy feel the weight at once, and we did not? I searched also inside. There were still the few morsels of bread and the only bit to fish. I began to feel the weight when I moved towards the crowd. But if it had weighed for what I gave out, it would have taken a pair of mules to carry it, not a basket, but a wagon packed with food. At the beginning I was dealing it out sparingly, but later I gave and gave. And as I did not want to be unfair, I went back to the first ones and gave them more because I had given them little at first, and yet it was enough. I also felt the basket was getting heavy when I set out, and I gave plenty at once, because I realized that you had worked a miracle, says John. I instead stopped. I sat down and poured everything on my lap to see, and I saw loaves and loaves, and then I went on says Mania. I even counted them, because I did not want to cut a bad figure. There were fifty small loaves, so I said, I will give them to fifty people, and then I will go back. And I counted, but when I got to fifty, the weight was still the same. I looked inside. They were so many. I went on and I handed out hundreds of them. They never diminished says Bartholomew. I, I must admit it, I did not believe in. I took the morsels of bread and the bit of fish in my hand and I looked at them saying, what's the use of them? Jesus must have been joking. And I looked at them over and over again, hiding behind a tree, hoping and despairing to see them grow. But they were always the same. I was about to come back when Matthew passed by, saying, Have you noticed how beautiful they are? What? I asked him. The loaves and fish. Are you mad? I can only see morsels of bread. Go and hand them out with faith and you will see. I threw back into the basket a few morsels and I went reluctantly. And then, Forgive me, Jesus, because I am a sinner says Thomas. No, you are a worldly spirit. You reason according to the world. I as well, Lord. So much so that I was thinking of giving a coin with the bread and I said to myself, they will eat somewhere else, says this carrier. I was hoping to help you cut a finer figure. So what am I? Like Thomas or more? You are much more worldly than Thomas. And yet, I was thinking of giving alms to be heavenly. It was my own personal money. Alms to yourself, 
to your pride, and arms to God. But the latter does not need them, and it is a sin to give arms to your pride, not to merit. Judas lowers his head and becomes silent. I instead thought that I had to crumble the morsel of fish and the morsel of bread so that they would suffice. I did not doubt they would be sufficient, both with regard to numbers and nourishment. A drop of water given by you can be more nourishing than a banquet, says Simon Zealot. And what do you think? Peter asks Jesus' cousins. We remembered Cana and did not doubt, replies Judas gravely. And you, James, my dear brother, were you only thinking of that? No, I thought it was a sacrament, as you told me. Is it so, or am I wrong? Jesus smiles. It is, and it is not. Your thought of a remote figure is to be added to the truth concerning the power of nourishment in a drop of water mentioned by Simon. But it is not yet a sacrament. The scribe is holding a crumb in his hand. What are you going to do with it? A souvenir. I will keep one too. I will put it round Moxiam's neck in a little bag, says Peter. And I will take it to your mother, says John. And what about us? We have eaten it all, says the other sorrowfully. Stand up. Go round again with the baskets and collect the scraps remaining. Select the poorest people and bring them here with the baskets. And then you, my disciples, will go to the boats and set sail going to the plain of Gennesaret. I will dismiss the crowds after assisting the poorest people and I will join you later. The apostles obey. The apostles obey and they come back with twelve for baskets full of food. The apostles obey, and they come back with twelve baskets full of remnants of food, and followed by about thirty beggars of very poor people. Very well, you may go now. The apostles and John's disciples say goodbye to Manan, and go away, leaving Jesus rather reluctantly but they obey. Manan stays with Jesus until the crowd, in the last light of the day, set out towards villages or look for a place where to sleep among the tall, dry bog grass. He then takes leave of the master. The scribe has gone before him. In fact, he was one of the first as he left with his son following the apostles. When they have all gone or fallen asleep, Jesus stands up, blesses the sleepers, and walking with slow steps, he goes towards the lake to the little peninsula of Tarakia. A few yards above the lake, like an indented hill protruding on it. And when he reaches the foot of it, without entering the town but going round it, he climbs the hill and stops on a crest, praying in front of the blue lake and in the peak of the serene moonlight. Jesus says, You will put here the vision dated March 4th, 1944. Jesus walks on the water. The poem of The Man God The Second Year of the Public Life Chapter 273 Jesus Walks on the Water 4th of March, 1944. It is late in the evening, almost night, because I can hardly see on the path that climbs up a hillock studded with trees, which I think are olives. But the light is so faint 
that I'm not sure. The trees are not tall, but they are leafy and twisted, characteristically olive. Jesus is alone. He is wearing a white tunic and a dark blue mantle. He climbs and enters the grove. He is striding resolutely. He is not walking fast, but as he strides, he goes a long way without rushing. He walks until he reaches a kind of natural balcony overlooking the lake, which is peaceful and quiet in the light of the stars already crowding the sky like bright eyes. Silence surrounds Jesus with its restful embrace. It detaches him from the crowds and from the earth, making him forget them and uniting him to the sky, which seems to descend to worship the word of God and caress him with the light of its stars. He's praying in his habitual posture, standing with his arms stretched out crosswise. There is an olive tree behind him, and he seems to be already crucified to its dark trunk. Tall as he is, the leafy branches are only a little above him, and they replace the inscription on the cross with a word consonant to the Christ. There, King of the Jews, here, Prince of Peace. The peaceful olive tree speaks the truth to those who can understand it. He prays for a long time. He then sits at the foot of the tree, on a thick protruding root, and assumes his habitual attitude with his hands interlocked and his elbows resting on his knees. He meditates. I wonder into which conversation he falls with his father and the spirit, now that he's alone and can be entirely of God. God with God. I think that many hours go by thus, because I see that stars have changed their position and many have already set in the west. Just when the appearance of light, or rather luminosity, because it cannot be called light as yet, becomes visible on the remote eastern horizon. A puff of wind shakes the olive tree. It calms down. It resumes blowing, and is stronger and becomes more and more violent at short intervals. The light of dawn, which has just begun, finds it difficult to make its way because of a mass of dark clouds which have invaded the sky. Driven by stronger and stronger gusts of wind, the lake is no longer calm either. I think it is preparing a storm like that I already saw in the vision of the tempest. The noise of the leafy branches and the roar of the water now fill the air, which a little while ago was so calm. Jesus is roused from his meditation. He stands up and looks at the lake. He scans it in the light of the remaining stars and of the poor, sickly dawn, and sees the boat of Peter, which is striving hard to reach the opposite shore, but cannot make it. Jesus pulls his mantle tight around himself, lifting over his head as if it were a hood, the hanging hem, which would hinder his descent and runs down, not the road he came up, but a very steep path, which takes one straight to the lake. He runs so fast that he seems to be flying. When he reaches the shore, lashed by the waves, which leave on the shingle an edge of fluffy, rustling foam, he continues to walk fast, as if he were treading not on a restlessly tossing liquid element, but on the smoothest, most solid pavement on the earth. He now becomes light. All the faint light that still comes from the few dying stars and the stormy dawn seems to converge on him, gathering like phosphorescence round his slender body. He flies over the waves, the foamy crests and the dark folds between the waves with his arms stretched forward while his mantle swells around his cheeks and flaps as much as possible, tight as it is around his body, 
like a whip. The apostles see him and utter a cry of fear, which the wind carries towards Jesus. Be not afraid, it is I. Jesus' voice, although the wind is against him, carries clearly over the lake. Is it really you, Master? asks Peter. If it is you, tell me to come and meet you, walking on the water like you. Jesus smiles. Come, he says simply, as if to indicate that to walk on the water were the most natural thing in the world. And Peter, half naked as he is, that is wearing only a short sleeveless tunic, jumps overboard and walks towards Jesus. But when he is about 50 yards from the boat and as many from Jesus, he is seized with fear. So far, his love in Peter supported him. Now his human nature overwhelms him and he fears for his own skin. Like one who is on a slippery ground, or better still, on quicksands, he begins to stagger, to grope, to sink. And the more he gropes and he fears, the more he sinks. Jesus has stopped and looks at him. He is serious and waits. But he does not stretch even one hand. His arms are folded, and he does not take one step or utter one word. Peter is sinking. His malioli, shins, knees disappear. The water reaches up to his inguin, rises above it, up to his waist. Terror is on his face. Terror paralyzes also his thoughts. He is nothing but flesh, afraid of sinking. He does not even think of swimming. Nothing. He is habitated by fear. At last he decides to look at Jesus. And as soon as he looks at him, his mind begins to reason and see where salvation is. Master Lord, my Lord, save me! Jesus opens his arms. And as if he were carried by the wind or by the waves, he rushes towards the apostle and holds out his hand, saying, Oh, what a man of little faith! Why did you doubt me? Why did you want to do it by yourself? Peter, who had clutched convulsively at Jesus' hand, does not reply. He looks at him, only to ascertain whether he is angry, with a mixture of remaining fear and rising repentance. But Jesus smiles at him and holds him firmly by the wrist until they reach the boat and step overboard into it. Then Jesus orders, Go to the shore. He is soaked through. And he smiles, looking at the mortified disciple. The waves smooth down, making it easy to land, and the town seen in the past from the height of a hill now looms beyond the shore. The vision ends here. Jesus says, Many times I do not even wait to be caught when I see my children in danger. And many times I rush to help a son who is ungrateful to me. You are asleep or you are seized by the worries and anxieties of life. I watch and pray for you. I am the angel of all men, and I look after you, and nothing grieves me more than the impossibility of interference, because you refuse my intervention, because you prefer to act on your own, or worse still, you ask the evil one to help you. Like a father who hears his son say to him, I do not love you, I do not want you, go out of my house. I am mortified, and I suffer more than I did because of my wounds. But if you do not say to me, go away, and you are absent-minded only because of the worries of life, then I am the eternal watchman, ready to come even before he is called. And if I wait for you to say a word, 
as I sometimes do. It is only to hear you call me. How pleasant, how sweet it is to hear men call me. To hear that they remember that I am the Saviour. I will not mention the infinite joy that pervades and exalts me when there is someone who loves me and calls me without being in need. He calls me because he loves me more than he loves anybody else in the world and is filled with joy as I am, only by calling Jesus, Jesus, as children call, Mommy, Mommy and they taste the sweetness of honey on their lips. Because the simple word, mummy, has in itself the taste of motherly kisses. The apostles were rowing, obeying my order, to go and wait for me at Capernaum. And I, after the miracle of the loaves, went away from the crowds all alone. Not because I disdained them, or because I was tired, I never disdained men, not even when they were bad to me. I became indignant only when I saw the law trampled or the house of God desecrated. But then the interests of the Father were involved, not I. And I was on the earth as the first of the servants of God to serve the Father of Heaven. I was never tired in devoting myself to the crowds, even when I saw them so dull, sluggish and human, as to dishearten even those who had most confidence in their mission. Nay, just because they were so deficient, I multiplied my lesson infinitely. I treated them exactly as backward pupils, and I guided their spirits in their most elementary discoveries and initiations, just as a patient master guides the inexpert hands of pupils to form the first letters and thus enable them to understand and write. How much love have I given to crowds? I took them by the flesh to lead them to the spirit. I began from the flesh as well, but while Satan through it leads to hell, I led to heaven. I wanted to be all alone to thank the Father for the miracle of the loaves. Thousands of people had been fed, and I exhorted them to say thanks to the Lord. But once a man has been helped, he forgets to say thanks. I said it on their behalf, and afterwards, and afterwards I had merged with my father, for whose love I was infinitely sick. I was on the earth, but like a lifeless hide. My soul was thrust towards my father, whom I felt leaning on his word, and I said to him, I love you, Holy Father. It was a joy to me to say to him, I love you, to say so as a man besides as God. I humiliated my feelings as man, as I offered him my palpitation as God. I seemed to be the magnet that attracted all the love of men, of men capable of loving God a little, and that I gathered all such love and offered it from the bottom of my heart. I seemed to be the only one to exist. I, the man, that is the human race, conversing once again with God in the cool of the evening, as on the innocent days. But although my blessedness was complete, because it was a blessedness of love, it did not abstract me from the needs of men and I became aware of the danger of my children on the lake, and I left love for the sake of love. Charity must be speedy. They took me for a ghost. Oh, how often, my poor children, you take me for a ghost, for a frightening object. 
If you always thought of me, you would know me at once. But you have other ghosts in your hearts, and that makes you dizzy. But I make myself known. Oh, if you only listened to me. Why was Peter sinking after walking so far? You said it, because his human nature overwhelmed his spirit. Peter was very much a man. Had it been John, he would not have dared immoderately. Neither would he have changed his mind. Purity grants prudence and strength. But Peter was man in the full meaning of the word. He was anxious to excel, to show that nobody loves the master as he does. He wanted to impose himself, and only because he was one of mine, he thought he was above the weakness of the flesh. Instead, poor Simon, his results, when he was tested, were far from being sublime. But it was necessary that he might be later the one who was to perpetuate the mercy of the Master in the dawning church. Peter is not only overwhelmed by fear for his endangered life, but as you said, he becomes nothing but trembling flesh. He no longer thinks, he no longer looks at me. You all do the same. The more impending is the danger, the more you want to do things by yourselves, as if you were able to do things. You never go away from me, or close your hearts to me, or even curse me, as in the hours when you ought to hoop in me and call me. Peter does not curse me, but he forgets me, and I have to impose my will to call his spirit to me so that he may look at his master and saviour. I absolve him beforehand of his sin of doubt, because I love him as this impulsive man, once he is confirmed in grace, will be able to proceed without any further perturbation or tiredness as far as martyrdom, and will be indefatigable in casting his mystical net to take souls to his master. And when he invokes me, I do not walk. I fly to help him, and I hold him tight to lead him to salvation. My reproach is a mild one, because I understand the extenuating circumstances of Peter. I am the best advocate and judge there is, and there has ever been, on behalf of everybody. I understand you, my poor children. And even when I say a word of reproach, my smile mitigates it. I love you. That is all. I want you to have faith. And if you do have it, I will come and take you out of danger. Oh, if the earth could say, Master, Lord, save me. One cry of the whole earth would be enough, and Satan and his sectarians would be immediately defeated. But you do not know how to have faith. I am multiplying the means to lead you to faith, but they all fall into your slime as a stone falls into the slime of a marsh and are buried there. You do not want to purify the water of your souls. You prefer to be putrid filth. It does not matter. I do my duty as the eternal saviour. And even if I cannot save the world because the world does not want to be saved, I will save from the world those who, in order to love me as I am to be loved, are no longer of the world.
The Poem of the Man God The Second Year of the Public Life Chapter 274 The Deeds of Corporal and Spiritual Mercy 8th of September 1945 Jesus is in the Chorazin Plain along the upper Jordan Valley between the lakes of Gennesaret and Merim. The country is covered with vineyards, and it is already vintage time. He must have been there for some days, because the disciples who are at Sicamenon have joined him this morning, and among them there is Stephen with Hermas. Isaac apologises for not coming earlier, because, he says, the new disciples and his uncertainty whether he should bring them or not caused the delay. But... He says, I thought that the way to heaven is open to all of those good will, and those two, although they are pupils of Gamaliel, seem to be so. You are right, and you have done the right thing. Bring them here. Isaac goes away and comes back with the two disciples. Peace to you. Has the apostolic word seemed so true to you that you have decided to join it? Yes. And yours above all. Do not send us away, master. Why should I? Because we are disciples of Gamaliel. So what? I honour the great Gamaliel, and I would like him to be with me, because he is worthy of it. That is all he lacks to make his wisdom perfect. What did he say to you when you left him? Because you certainly said goodbye to him. Yes, he said to us, you are lucky that you can believe. Pray that I may forget in order to remember. The apostles who have gathered round Jesus inquisitively look at one another and ask, whispering, What does he mean? What does he want? To forget in order to remember? Jesus hears their whispering and explains. He wants to forget his wisdom. To take on mine. He wants to forget that he is Rabbi Gamaliel, to remember that he is a son of Israel awaiting the Christ. He wants to forget himself, to remember the truth. Gamaliel is not untruthful, master, replies Hermas apologetically. No, he's not. But it is the medley of poor human words which is untruthful. Words taking the place of the word. You must forget them, divesting yourselves of them, and come to the truth as pure as virgins, in order to be reclothed and fecundated. Humility is required for that. The difficulty. Then we must forget as well. Undoubtedly, you must forget everything pertaining to man and remember what pertains to God. Come, you can do it. We want to do it, confirms Hermes. Have you already lived as disciples? Yes, we have. Since the day we heard the Baptist had been killed, the news spread very rapidly in Jerusalem where it was brought to Herod's courtiers and to commanders. His death roused us from our torpidity, replies Stephen. The blood of martyrs is always a new life for torpid people, Stephen. Remember that. Yes, master. Will you speak today? I hunger for your word. I have already spoken, but I will speak again, and very much, to you, disciples. Your companions, the apostles, have already begun their mission after due preparation. But they are not sufficient for the needs of the world, and everything is to be done in good time. I am like one who has an expiry date and must do everything within that date. I ask you all to help me, and in the name of God, I promise you help and a glorious future. Jesus' keen eyes discovers a man completely enveloped in a linen mantle. Are you not John the priest? 
Yes, master. The hearts of the Jews are more arid than the cursed large valley. I ran away looking for you. And your priesthood? Leprosy expelled me from it the first time. Men the second time, because I love you. Your grace draws me to itself, to you. It expels me as well from a desecrated place to a pure one. You have purified me, master, both in my body and in my soul. And what is pure cannot and must not approach what is impure. It would be an offence to him who purified. Your judgment is severe, but not unfair. Master, unpleasant family matters are known to those who live in the family, and should be mentioned only to righteous-minded people. You are so, and in any case, you know. I would not tell anybody else. Here we are, you, the apostles, I and two who know as well as you and I do. So, all right, but... Oh, you are here too. Peace be with you. Have you come to hand out more food? No, I came to have some of your food. Have your crops been spoiled? Oh, no, they have never been so plentiful. But my master, I am looking for another bread and a different crop, yours. And I brought with me the leper whom you cured in my fields. He came back to his master. But both he and I have a master to follow and serve. You. Come. One, two, three, four. A good harvest. But have you taken into consideration your position at the temple? You know, and I know. And I will say no more. I am a free man, and I go with whomever I wish, says John the priest. So am I, says the last arrival, John the scribe, who dealt out the food at the foot of the Mount of Beatitudes on the Sabbath. And we are free too, state Hermas and Stephen. And Stephen adds, Speak to us, Lord. We do not know what our mission exactly consists in. Give us the least necessary to enable us to serve you at once. The rest will come as we follow you. Yes, on the mountain you spoke of the Beatitudes, and that was a lesson for us. But what are we to do with regard to other people? In our second love, the love for our neighbour, asks John the scribe. Where is John of Endor? Is Jesus' only answer. He's over there, master, with the people who have been cured. Let him come here. John of Endor goes at once. Jesus lays his hand on John's shoulder as a special greeting and says... Here you are. I will now speak. But I want you, who bear a holy name, to be in front of me. You, my apostle. You, a priest. You, a scribe. You, John of the Baptist. And finally you, to complete the sequence of graces granted by God. And if you are the last one to be mentioned by me, you know that you are not the last one in my heart. One day, I promised you this speech. You will now have it. And Jesus, as he is wont, climbs a little mound, so that everybody may see him. And the five Johns are in the first row in front of him. Behind them, 
there is a group of disciples mingled with the crowds who have come from every part of Palestine seeking health or doctrine. May peace be with you all and wisdom upon you. Listen. One day a long time ago, a man asked me whether and to what extent is God merciful towards sinners. It was a sinner who asked that question, and although he had been forgiven, he could not believe that God had forgiven him completely. And I soothed his anxiety by means of parables. I assured and promised him that for his sake I would always speak of mercy, so that his repentant heart, which wept within him like a lost child, should feel sure of being already in the possession of his Father in heaven. God is mercy, because God is love. A servant of God must be merciful to imitate God. God makes use of mercy, to attract to himself his children led astray. A servant of God must make use of mercy as a means of taking misguided men back to God. The precept of love is compulsory for everybody, but it must be three times so in the servants of God. No one will conquer heaven if one does not love that is all that is necessary to say to believers. But to the servants of God, I say, you cannot make believers conquer heaven if you do not love them with perfect love. And who are you who are crowding here around me? Most of you are children of God, aiming at perfect life, at the blessed hard, bright life of the servant of God and ministers of Christ. And which are your duties in such lives of servants and ministers? Complete love for God and complete love for your neighbour. Your aim is to serve. How? Taking back to God those whom the world, flesh, the demon, have stolen from God. By which means? By love. Love which can be active in a thousand ways and has but one purpose, to make people love. Let us consider our beautiful Jordan. How imposing it is at Jericho. But was it like that at the source? No. It was just a trickle of water, and would have remained such if it had always been alone. Instead, from the mountains and hills on both sides of its valley, thousands of tributaries, either alone or made up by many rivulets, flow into its bed, and it grows more and more from the little silvery blue stream, so pleasant and joyful in its infancy until it becomes the large, solemn, placid river, flowing like a sky-blue ribbon between its fertile emerald banks. Such is love. It is initially a tiny stream among the infant on the way of life, who can just avoid grave sins for fear of punishment, but subsequently, as they proceed on the way to perfection, Many brooks of this main virtue, by will of love, appear from the rugged, arid, proud, harsh mountains of mankind, and everything helps to make it rise and gush out. Sorrows and joy, just as upon the mountains the frozen snow and the sun melting it, form rivers. Everything helps to open the way for them humility, as well as repentance. Everything serves to convey them to the initial river, because a soul thrust onto that way loves to have its ego destroyed 
and aspires to rise again, drawn by the sun god, after becoming a beautiful, mighty, beneficial river. The brook that nourish the embryonic stream of awesome love are, ah, besides virtues, the deeds that virtues teach men to accomplish. Deeds which, being streams of love, are deeds of mercy. Let us consider them together. Some were already known to Israel. Some will be made known to you by me because my law is the perfection of love. To feed the hungry. It is a duty of gratitude and love, and a duty of imitation. Children are grateful to their father for the bread he procures for them, and when they are grown into men, they imitate him by procuring with their work bread for their own sons and for their father by now unable to work because of his age, an affectionate fair return of the good received. The fourth commandment states, honour your father and mother. One honours their old age by ensuring they do not have to beg for bread of others. But the first commandment comes before the fourth. Love God with your whole being. And the second, love your neighbours as you love yourself. To love God in himself and to love him in one's neighbour is to be perfect. One loves him by giving bread to those who are hungry, remembering how many times he appeased man's hunger through miracles. But without taking into account the gifts of manna and quails, let us consider the continuous miracle of corn, which germinates through the bounty of God, who gave men lands suitable to be cultivated, and he adjusts and controls winds, rain, heat, seasons, so that the seed may become an ear of wheat, and the wheat bread. And was it not a miracle of his mercy, the fact that by supernatural light he taught his guilty child that the tall, slender grass, ending in golden ears of seed, smelling of the warm sun, enclosed in a hard cover of thorny scales, was food, which man had to pick, hull, pulverize, knead and bake, God taught man all that. And he taught him how to pick it, husk it, pound it, knead and bake it. He placed stones near the ears and water near the stone. And by means of the reflection of water and sun, he lit the first fire on the earth. And the wind blew onto the fire some grains of wheat which were roasted, smelling pleasantly so that man may understand that wheat is better when toasted by fire than as it is in the ear, as birds eat it or soaked in water, after being pulverized as a sticky mash. Now that you eat the good bread baked in the family oven, do you not consider how much mercy is shown by the achievement of so much perfection in baking? And how much progress human knowledge has made from the first ear chewed as horses do to the bread of today. And by whom? By the giver of bread. And the same applies to all kinds of food, which man, through beneficent enlightenment, has been able to single out among the plants and animals which the Creator spread over the earth a place of fatherly punishment for his guilty child. Thus, to give something to eat to the hungry is a prayer of gratitude to the Lord and Father, who satisfies our hunger, and it is imitating the Father, whose likeness was 
gratuitously granted to us and which we must continuously increase by imitating his action. To give drink to the thirsty. Have you ever thought what would happen if the Father did not let rain fall on the earth? And if he said, because of your harsh unkindness towards the thirsty, I will stop clouds from descending upon the earth. Could we protest and curse? Water, more than wheat, belongs to God. Because wheat is cultivated by man, but only God cultivates the fields of clouds, which descend as rain or dew, fog or snow, nourishing fields and cisterns, filling rivers and lakes, giving shelter to fish, which appease man's hunger with other animals. If someone asks you, Give me a drink. Can you say to him, No, this water is mine, and I will not let you have it. Lies. Which of you made a snowflake, or one single drop of rain? Which of you evaporated a dew diamond with its astral heat? No one. It is God who does that. And if water descends from the sky and reascends there, it is only because God controls that part of creation as he controls the rest. Give, therefore, the good cool water of the springs of the earth, or the pure water of your well, or the water that filled your cisterns to those who are thirsty. It is the water of God, and it is for everybody. Give it to the thirsty. For such a small deed, which costs you no money and involves no work except the handing of a cup or a jug, I tell you that you will receive a reward in heaven. Because not the water, but the charitable action is great in the eyes and judgment of God. To clothe the poor. Nude, shameful. Pitiful miseries pass along the roads of the earth. Forlorn old people, people disabled by disease or misfortune, lepers coming back to life through the Lord's bounty, widows laden with children, people deprived of every comfort by mishaps, innocent little orphans. If my eyes scan the vast earth, I can see everywhere people who are naked or covered with rags, which hardly protect their decency, but do not shelter them from the cold. And all those poor people look with downcast eyes at the wealthy people who pass by wearing soft garments and comfortable shoes. Downcast eyes and kindness in good people. Downcast eyes and hatred in those who are not so good. Why do you not assist their dejection, making the good ones better, by means of your love, and destroying hate in those who are less good? Do not say, I have only enough for myself. As in the case of bread, there is always something more than what is necessary on the tables, and in the wardrobes of people, who are not entirely forsaken. Among those who are now listening to me, there is more than one who from a cast-off garment made clothes for an orphan or a poor boy, and out of an old bedsheet made swaddling bands for an innocent baby who had none. And there is one, a beggar, who for years shared the bread begged for with so much difficulty, with a leper who could not go and beg for it at the doorstep of rich people. And I solemnly tell you that such merciful people are not found among the wealthy, but among the poor humble classes who know by their own experience how painful is poverty. Here again, 
as for water and bread. Consider that wool and linen with which you dress yourselves come from animals and plants, which the Father created, not only for the rich, but for all men. Because God gave man only one wealth, his grace, health and intelligence. Not the filthy wealth, which is gold, elevated by you to a useless nobility, whilst as a metal it is not more beautiful than any other, and it is much more useless than iron, with which you make spades and ploughs, harrows and sickles, chisels, hammers, saws and planes, the holy tools for holy work. And you elevate it to false nobility through the instigation of Satan, who has made you, the children of God, as wild as beasts. God had given you the riches of what is holy to make you more and more holy. Not this murderous wealth which sheds so much blood and so many tears. And give as it was given to you. Give in the name of the Lord without being afraid of remaining naked. It would be better to die of cold after stripping yourselves in favour of a beggar, than chill your hearts, even if clad in soft garments, through lack of charity. The warmth of a good action accomplished is more pleasant than the comfort of a mantle of pure wool, and the clad bodies of poor people speak to God, saying, Bless those who have clothed us. If to satisfy people's hunger and quench their thirst and clothe the poor, joins holy temperance and blessed justice to most holy charity, so that the destiny of our unhappy brothers is modified through our holiness. When we give what we abound in, with God's leave, on behalf of those who are deprived of it, through the wickedness of man or through diseases. To give hospitality to pilgrims joins charity to confidence and to the esteem of our neighbour. And that is a virtue too, you know. A virtue that denotes honesty besides charity in those who possess it. Because he who is honest acts righteously and as we generally think that other people act as we do, so the confidence and simplicity, believing that the words of other people are true, show that he who listens to them is one who speaks the truth in important and small matters and does not distrust what other people tell him. Why should one think of the pilgrim who is asking for shelter? And what about if he is a thief or a murderer? Are you so attached to your wealth as to be afraid because of it, of every stranger who arrives at your house? Are you so attached to your lives as to shudder with horror at the thought of being deprived of them? What? Do you think that God cannot defend you from robbers? What? Are you afraid that a passerby may be a robber? and you are not afraid of the evil guest who robs you of what cannot be replaced? How many give hospitality to the demon in their hearts? I could say, everybody shelters capital sin, yet nobody fears that. Are wealth and life the only valuable things? Is perhaps eternity not more valuable, since you allow sin to rob you of it and kill it. O oh, poor souls, robbed of their treasure and handed over to killers, as if they were trifles, whilst houses are locked and bolted, protecting with dogs and safes things that we cannot take with us when we die. Why should we see a robber in every pilgrim? 
We are all brothers. Houses should be open to brothers passing by. Is a pilgrim not of our same blood? Of course he is. He is of the blood of Adam and Eve. Is he not our brother? Why not? The father is only one. God. Who has given each of us an identical soul? as the father only gives the children of the same marriage the same blood. Is he poor? Ensure that your spirit, deprived of the Lord's friendship, may not be poorer than he is. Are his clothes torn? Ensure that your soul may not be more torn by sin. Are his feet covered with mud or dust? Ensure that your ego may not be more worn by vices than his dirty sandal has been worn by so much walking. Is his appearance unpleasant? Make sure that yours is not more unpleasant in the eyes of God. Does he speak a foreign language? Make sure that the language of your heart is not incomprehensible in the city of God. You must see a brother in each pilgrim. We are all pilgrims going towards heaven, and we all knock at the doors along the way to heaven. And the doors are the patriarchs, the just, the angels and archangels, whom we implore to help and protect us so that we may reach our goal without becoming exhausted and dropping into the darkness of night, into the rigours of ice-cold weather, the praise of insidious wolves and jackals, of wicked passions and demons. As we want angels and saints to show us their love by giving us shelter and strength to proceed on our way, so let us do likewise to the pilgrims of the earth. And each time we open our homes and our arms, greeting a stranger with the sweet word of brother and thinking of God who knows him, I tell you that we will have gone many miles along the way leading to heaven. To visit the sick. Truly, as men are pilgrims, so they are sick. And the sickness of the soul is the gravest. It is invisible and lethal. And yet people are not disgusted by it. A moral sore is not disgusting. The stench of vice is not nauseating. Demoniac frenzy is not frightening. The gangrene of a spiritual leper does not make anyone sick. The sepulchre full of rottenness of a man whose soul is dead and putrefied does not make anybody run away. He who approaches such impurities is not anathematized. How poor and narrow is the thought of man? But tell me, which is worth more, the spirit or blood and flesh? Can matter corrupt what is immaterial simply by being close to it? No, I tell you, it cannot. The value of the spirit is infinite as compared to flesh and blood. That is true. But the flesh is not more powerful than the spirit. And the spirit can be corrupted by spiritual things, not by material ones. If a man takes care of a leper, his spirit does not become leprous. On the contrary, because of his charity practiced heroically, to the extent of segregating himself in the valley of death, out of pity for his brother, every stain of sin will be removed from him because charity is absolution from sin and the first purification. Always bear in mind the following principle. 
What would I like done to me if I were like him? And act as you would like other people to act on your behalf. Israel still has its ancient laws. But the day will come, and its dawn is no longer very far, when men will worship as the symbol of absolute beauty, the image of one who will be the material repetition of the man of sorrows of Isaiah and the tortured victim of David's son, who will become the redeemer of mankind because he made himself similar to a leper and all those who are parched with thirst, ill, exhausted, weeping on the earth will hasten towards his wounds as deer rush to the springs of water, and he will quench their thirst, will cure them, restore them, will comfort their souls and bodies, and the best believers will yearn to be like him, covered with wounds, shedding their blood, beaten, crowned with thorns, crucified for the sake of men to be redeemed. Continuing thus the work of the King of Kings and Redeemer of the world. You, who are still Israel, but are already putting on wings to fly to the kingdom of heaven, begin to consider, as from this moment, this new conception and evaluation of sickness. And while blessing God for keeping you in good health, Bend over those who are suffering and dying. One of my apostles said one day to one of his brothers, Do not be afraid to touch lepers. No disease will attack us by God's will. He was right. God protects his servants. But even if you were infected when curing sick people, you would be placed in the next life among the martyrs. Of love. To visit prisoners. Do you think that there are only criminals on galleys? One eye of human justice is blind, and the other suffers from sight trouble, so that it mistakes camels for clouds and a snake for a flowery branch. It judges erroneously. Even more so, because those who preside over it often deliberately stir up clouds of smoke so that it may see more erroneously. But even if prisoners were all robbers or killers, it would be wrong for us to become robbers and murderers of depriving them of the hope of forgiveness through our score. Poor prisoners! They dare not raise their eyes to God, laden as they are with their crimes. Their fetters really hurt their souls more than their feet. Woe to them if they despair of God. To the crime against their neighbour they would add the sin of despairing of forgiveness. The galley is expiation, just as dying on the scaffold but it is not sufficient to pay what is due to human society for the crime committed. It is necessary to pay also and above all what is due God in order to expiate and have eternal life. But he who rebels and despairs expiates only with regard to society. Let the convict or prisoner have the love of his brothers. It will be light in the dark. It will be a voice. A hand pointing upwards while the voice says, May my love tell you that God also loves you as he put in my heart this love for you, my unfortunate brother. And light enables men to see God, their merciful Father. Let your charity go with greater reason to comfort the martyrs of human injustice. Both those who are utterly innocent 
and those who have been led to kill by a cruel force. Do not judge what has already been judged. You do not know why a man was driven to kill. You do not realize that many times the man who kills is nothing but a dead person. And automaton devoid of reason because a bloodless murder has deprived him of reason with cruel, cowardly betrayal. God knows that is enough. In the next life, many galley slaves, murderers and robbers, will be seen in heaven, whereas many who seemed to have been robbed and killed will be seen in hell. Because in actual fact, the pseudo-victims were the true robbers of the peace, honesty and trust of other people and the true murderers of hearts. They were victims only because they were the last to be struck after they had been striking covertly for years. Murder and theft are sins. But between one who kills and robs because he is led to such crimes by others, and later repents, and one who induces others to sin and does not repent, the latter will be punished more severely, because he persuades others to commit sin and does not feel remorse. Thus, by not passing judgment on them, be compassionate to prisons. Always bear in mind that if all the murders and thefts of men were to be punished, few men and women would not die in galleys and on the scaffold. What shall we call those mothers who conceive but do not wish to give birth to the fruit of their wombs? Oh, do not let us pun. Let us call them frankly by their name. Murderers! What shall we say about those men who steal other people's reputation and positions? Simply what they are, thieves. What is the name for those men and women who are adulterous or torture their relatives to the extent of driving them to homicide or suicide? And for the mighty ones of the earth who drive their subjects to desperation and through desperation to violence, here it is, murderers. Well, is no one running away? So you can see that we live without any worry among criminals who have evaded justice, who crowd houses and towns, rub against us in streets, sleep in the same hotels as we do, and share food with us. And yet, who is without sin? If God's finger should write on the wall of the room wherein the thoughts of man germinate, that is, on man's forehead, words describing one as one was, is, or will be, very few would bear the word innocent written in bright letters. The other four heads would bear the words adulterers, murderers, thieves, killers in letters as green as envy or as black as treason or as red as crime. So without being proud, be merciful to your brothers who from a human point of view have been less fortunate than you are and are now on galleys expiating what you do not expiate, although guilty of the same crime. Your humility will improve by doing so. To bury the dead. The contemplation of death is a lesson for life. I would like to take you all before death and say to you, endeavour to live as saints in order to have but this death, a temporary separation of the body from the soul, 
to rise thereafter triumphantly forever, all gathered together in utter happiness. We were all born nude. We all die, and our mortal remains are destined to putrefaction. Whether kings or beggars, as we were born, so we die. And if the pomp of kings allows their corpses to be preserved for a longer period of time, decomposition is still the fate of dead flesh. What are mummies? Flesh? No. They are matter fossilized by resins, lignified matter. It is not a prey to worms, as it has been altered and burned by essences, but it is a prey to woodworms, just like old wood. But dust becomes dust once again, because God said so. And yet only because that dust enveloped the spirit and was vivified by it, like something that touched the glory of God. Such is the soul of man. We must conclude that it is sanctified dust, not unlike the objects that have been in contact with the tabernacle. There was at least one moment when a soul was perfect, while God was creating it. And if sin disfigured it, depriving it of its perfection, because of its origin, it still confers beauty to matter. And because of the beauty that comes from God, a body is embellished and deserves respect. We are temples, and as such, we deserve to be honoured, as the places where the tabernacle stopped were always honoured. Grant, therefore, the dead the charity of an honourable rest while awaiting resurrection, and in the wonderful harmony of the human body, contemplate the divine mind and hand that conceived and modelled it so perfectly, and venerate the work of the Lord also in its remains. But man is not only flesh and blood, he is also soul and mind. The latter suffer as well and are to be assisted mercifully. There are ignorant people who do wrong only because they do not know good. How many do not know or know wrongly the things of God and even moral laws? They languish like famishing people because no one satisfies their hunger and fall into marimus through lack of nourishing truth. Go and teach them, because that is why I have gathered you, and I am sending you. Give the bread of the Spirit to the hunger of spirits. To teach the ignorant corresponds in the spiritual field, to appeasing the hunger of those who are starving. And if a reward is granted for a piece of bread offered to a languishing body, so that it may not die, what reward will be given to him who satisfies a spirit with eternal truth and gives it eternal life? Do not be avaricious of what you know. It was given to you without any expense or limit. Give it without avarice, because it belongs to God, like the water of the sky. And it is to be given as it was given to us. Be not avaricious or proud of what you know, but give with humble generosity and give the limpid charitable relief of prayer to the living and to the dead who thirst for graces. Water is not to be refused to parched throats. What is, therefore, to be given to the hearts of anguished living people and what to the expiating souls of the dead? Prayers. Prayers that are prolific because they are full of love and spirit of mortification. Prayers must be true, not mechanical, like the noise of a wheel on the road. 
Is it the noise or the wheel that makes a cart proceed? It is the wheel that wears itself out to move the cart forward. The same applies to vocal mechanical prayer and to active prayer. The former is sound and nothing else. The latter is work in which strength wears out and suffering increases, but it attains its goal. Pray more by means of mortification than with your lips, and you will give relief to the living and the dead, fulfilling the second work of spiritual mercy. The world will be saved more by the prayers of those who know how to pray than by useless, rumbling, deadly battles. Many people in the world believe, but they do not believe firmly. They waver as if they were drawn in opposite directions, and without proceeding by one step only, they wear their strength out unsuccessfully. They are the doubtful ones, those who hesitate, saying, but, if, and then. Those who ask, will it really be thus? And if it were not so, shall I be able? And if I am not successful, and so on. They are like bear bites, which do not climb up unless they find something to cling to. And even when they do find it, they dangle to and fro, and it is not only necessary to find a support for them, but one must guide them onto it at each turn every day. Oh, they really try one's patience and charity more than a backward child. But in the name of the Lord, do not abandon them. Give bright faith, ardent strength, to those prisoners of themselves and of their hazy disease. Guide them towards the sun and the sky. Be masters and fathers to those dubious minds without tiring or losing your patience. They discourage you? Very well. How often you discourage me, and even more, the Father who is in heaven and who must often think that the word seems to have become flesh in vain, since men still hesitate, even now, that they hear the word of God speak. You will not presume that you are of greater worth than God is or I am. So open the prisons of those prisoners of but and if, Relieve them from their chains of, shall I be able, if I am not successful? Convince them that it is enough to do one's best, and God is satisfied. And if you see them fall off their support, do not pass by ignoring them, but lift them up once again. Like mothers who do not pass by if their child falls, but they stop, pick him up cleans him, comforts him, and holds him until he is no longer afraid of falling again. And they do so for months and years if the boy's legs are weak. Clothe those who are naked spiritually by forgiving those who offend you. Offences are against charity. Lack of charity divests one of God. So he who offends becomes naked and only the forgiveness of the offended person can put clothes back on such nudity because he brings God back to it. God waits for the offended person to forgive before he forgives both the person offended by man and the offender of man and of God. Because... Let us admit it, there is no one who has not given offence to his Lord. But God forgives us if we forgive our neighbour, and forgives our neighbour if the person offended forgives. It will be done to you as you do to others. 
Forgive, therefore, if you wish to be forgiven, and you will rejoice in heaven for your charitable behavior, as if a mantle studded with stars were placed on your holy shoulders. Be merciful to those who are weeping. They have been wounded by life, and their hearts are grieved in their affections. Do not lock yourselves up in your serenity as in a stronghold. Weep with those who are weeping. Comfort who is distressed. Console the loneliness of those who have been deprived of a relative by death. Be fathers to orphans, sons to parents, brothers to one another. Love. Why love only those who are happy? They already have their share of sunshine. Love the weeping. They are the least amiable for the world. But the world is not aware of the value of tears. You are. Love, therefore, those who are weeping. Love them if they are resigned in their grief. Love them even more if they rebel against their sorrow. Do not reproach them, but kindly convince them of the truth of grief and the utility of sorrow. Through the veil of tears, they may see the face of God deformed and his countenance full of revengeful arrogance. No, do not be scandalized. It is only a hallucination brought about by the fever of grief. Assist them so that their temperature may abate. Let your fresh faith be like ice applied to a delirious patient. And when the raging fever drops and is followed by the seediness and torpid habitude typical of those who come out of a trauma, then speak to them once again of God, as of something new, kindly and patiently, as you would deal with children who have become backward through disease. Oh, a lovely tale told to amuse man, the eternal child. And then, be quiet. Do not impose. A soul works by itself. Assist it with caresses and prayer. And when it asks, So it was not God? Reply, No, he did not want to hurt you, because he loves you. Also on behalf of those who no longer love you, because of death or other reasons. And when the soul says, But I accused him, say, He has forgotten it because it was your fever. And when it says, I would like to have him, say, here he is, at the door of your heart, waiting for you to open it to him. Bear bothersome persons. They come in to upset the little house of our ego, just as pilgrims come in to upset the house in which we live. But as I told you to welcome pilgrims, so I tell you to welcome these persons. Are they bothersome? But if you do not love them because of the trouble they cause you, they love you more or less righteously. Welcome them for such love. And even if they came inquiring, hating, insulting you, be patient and charitable. You can improve them through your patience. But you may scandalize them through your lack of charity. Be sorry because they sin, but be more sorry to make them sin and to sin yourselves. Receive them in my name if you cannot receive them with your own love. And God will reward you by coming himself later to return the visit and cancel the unpleasant memory by his supernatural caresses. 
finally, endeavor to bury sinners in order to prepare the return to the life of grace. Do you know when you do that? When you admonish them with paternal, patient, loving insistence? It is as if you were burying little by little the ugly part of the body before delivering it to its sepulchre, awaiting the command of God. Rise and come to me. Do the Jews not purify the dead out of respect for the body, which is to rise again? To admonish sinners is like purifying their limbs, the first operation for burial. The grace of the Lord will do the rest. Purify them through charity, tears and sacrifices. Be heroes to snatch a soul from corruption. Be heroes. You will not be left without reward. Because if a reward is given for a cup of water given to a thirsty body, what will be given to him who relieves a soul from infernal thirst? I have finished. Those are the deeds of corporal and spiritual mercy that increase love. Go and practice them. And may the peace of God and mine be with you, now and ever. The Poem of the Man God The Second Year of the Public Life Chapter 275 Avarice and the Foolish Rich Man 10th and 14th of September, 1945 Jesus is on one of the hills on the western coast of the lake. The towns and villages spread on both shores are displayed under his eyes. Directly under the hill are Magdala and Tiberias, the former with its luxurious district strewn with gardens, clearly separated from the poor houses of fishermen, peasants and common people by a little torrent now completely dry. The latter magnificent in every quarter, a town unaware of misery and decay, looking beautiful and fresh in the sunshine before the lake. Between the two towns there are a few but well-kept vegetable gardens on the short plain, while olive trees climb the hill conquering it. From this hilltop one can see behind Jesus the saddles of the Mount of Beatitudes, at the foot of which there is the main road, which goes from the Mediterranean Sea to Tiberias. Perhaps Jesus has chosen this place because it is so close to a very busy road, and thus people can come here from many towns, both on the lake and in the inland of Galilee, and then go back home in the evening or find hospitality in many of the towns. The climate is also mild because of the height, and also because the tall trees on the upper slopes have replaced the olive trees. There are, in fact, many people besides the apostles and disciples. People who need Jesus for health reasons or for advice. People who have come out of curiosity or led by friends or in a spirit of imitation. In brief, there is a large crowd. The season, which is no longer hot, but tends to the languid pleasantness of autumn, encourages pilgrims to come in search for the Master. Jesus has cured sick people and has spoken to the crowd on the subject of wealth unjustly attained and detachment therefrom, as is necessary in everyone who wishes to gain heaven and is essential in those who want to be his disciples. He is now replying to the questions of this or that rich disciple who is somewhat upset by such requirements. John, the scribe, says, Must I destroy what I have, thus depriving my family of what is due to them? No, God gave you some property. Let it be useful to justice and make just use of it. That is, assist your family by means of it, which is your duty, 
Treat your servants humanely, and that is charity. Help the poor and the poor disciples in need. Your wealth thus will not be a hindrance, but an aid. Then addressing the crowd, he says, I solemnly tell you that also the poorest disciple can be in the same danger of losing heaven through attachment to riches if he acts against justice by coming to terms with rich people after he has become a priest of mine. A rich or wicked man will often endeavour to seduce you with gifts to make you agreeable to his way of living and to his sin. And among my ministers, there will be some who will yield to the temptation of presence. That must not happen. Follow the Baptist's example. Although he was not a judge or a magistrate, he possessed the perfection of judge and magistrate, as pointed out in Deuteronomy. You must be impartial. You must take no bribes. For a bribe blinds wise men's eyes and jeopardizes the cause of the just. Too often, man allows the edge of the sword of justice to be blunted by the gold which a sinner rubs on it. No, that must not happen. Learn how to be poor, how to die, but never come to terms with sin not even with the excuse of using that gold for the poor. It is cursed gold and would bear no good. It is the gold of a disgraceful compromise. You have been appointed masters that you may be masters, doctors and redeemers. What would you be if your own interest led you to agree to wickedness? Master of evil science. Doctors who kill their patients, not redeemers, but parties to the ruin of hearts. One of the crowd comes forward and says, I am not a disciple, but I do admire you. Answer this question of mine. Is it lawful to keep the money of another person? No, man. It is larceny, like robbing the purse of a passerby. Even if it is family money... Of course, it is not right that one should take possession of the money belonging to all the others. Then come to Abel, my master, on the road to Damascus, and order my brother to share with me the inheritance of our father, who died without leaving a written will. He took everything for himself. And remember that we are twins, born at the first and only birth so I have the same rights as he has. Jesus looks at him and says, It is a painful situation, and your brother is certainly not behaving righteously. But all I can do is to pray for you and for him, that he may change, and I can come to your village and evangelize and thus touch his heart. The road is no burden to me, if I can bring about peace between you. The man becomes furious and bursts out. What is the use of your words? It takes much more than that in this case. Did you not tell me to order your brother to... To order is not to evangelize. An order is always joined to a threat. Threaten to strike his person. If he does not give me what is due to me, you can do that. As you give health, you can give a disease. Man, I came to convert, not to strike. But if you have faith in my words, you will have peace. Which words? I told you that I will pray for you and for your brother, that you may be comforted and he may be converted. Nonsense! I'm not such a fool as to believe that. Come in order. Jesus, who has been meek and patient, becomes impressive and severe. He straightens up. Before, 
he was bending over the little stout angry man. And he says, Man, who appointed me judge or arbitrator between you? Nobody. But to avoid a rupture between two brothers, I was willing to come and practice my mission of conciliator and redeemer. If you had believed my words, on going back to Abelmine, you would have found your brother already changed. But you did not believe. And you will have no miracle. If you had been able to get hold of the treasure before your brother, you would have kept it, depriving your brother of it. Because as it is true that you were born twins, it is also true that you have twin passions, and both you and your brother have but one love, gold, and one faith, gold. Be therefore with your faith. Goodbye. The man goes away, cursing Jesus, while all the people present are scandalised. And would like to punish him. But Jesus objects, saying, Let him go. Why dirty your hands striking a boot? I forgive him, because he is possessed and led astray by the demon of gold. Forgive him as well. Let us rather pray for the unhappy man, so that he may become humane again with a beautiful free soul. That is true. Even his countenance was dreadful because of his greed. Did you notice it? The disciples and those who were close to the miser ask one another. That is true indeed. He did not look the same person as before. Yes, and when he rejected the master, he almost struck him while cursing him, and his countenance was demoniac. A tempting demon, he wanted to lead the master to wickedness. Listen says Jesus. It is true that the alterations of the spirit are reflected on one's face. It is as if the demon appeared on the surface of his possession. Only few people who are demons, either in deeds or appearance, do not disclose what they are. And those few are perfect in evil and perfectly possessed. The countenance of a just man, instead, is always beautiful, even if his face is materially disfigured, because of a supernatural beauty, which from the interior exude exteriorly. And it is not just a saying, but a real fact, that we notice a bodily freshness as well in those who are free from vices. The soul within us envelops a whole being. The stench of a corrupt soul affects also the body, whereas the scent of a pure soul preserves it. A corrupt soul drives the flesh to obscene sins, which age and disfigure the body. A pure soul incites the body to a pure life, which grants a fresh complexion and imparts majesty. Endeavour to keep your youth spiritually pure, or to revive it, if you have already lost it, and beware of greed, both for sensual pleasures and for power. The life of man does not depend on the abundance of his wealth, neither in present life, and much less in the next one, eternal life. It depends instead on his way of living, as well as his happiness, both on the earth and in heaven. Because a vicious man is never really happy. On the contrary, a virtuous man is always happy, with a celestial joy, even if he is poor and alone. Not even death upsets him, because he has no sins or remorse, making him fear to meet God. Neither does he regret what he leaves on the earth. 
he knows that his treasure is in heaven, and like a man who goes to take the inheritance due to him, a holy inheritance, he goes happily and solicitously towards death, which opens to him the gate of the kingdom where his treasure is. Store up your treasure at once. Begin in your youth, you young people. Work incessantly, you older people, who are closer to death because of your age. But since the date of death is unknown, and the child often dies before a venerable old man, do not postpone the work of storing up your treasure of virtues and good deeds for the next life, lest death should reach you before you have placed a treasure of merits in heaven. Many people say, Oh, I am young and strong. I will enjoy myself for the time being on the earth, and I will turn later. A big mistake. Listen to this parable. A rich man's estate had yielded a good harvest, a really miraculous harvest. He looks happily at so much abundance piling up in his fields and threshing floors. And which is to be stored in provisional sheds, and even in the rooms of his house, since his barns cannot hold it all, and says, I have worked like a slave, but I have not been disappointed by my fields. I have worked as much as for ten harvests, and I am going to rest just as long. What shall I do to put away all this crop? I do not want to sell it, Otherwise, I would be compelled to work to have a new crop next year. This is what I will do. I will knock down my granaries and build larger ones, capable of holding all my crops and my goods. And then I will say to my soul, Oh, my soul, you have aside goods for many years. Rest, therefore, eat, drink, and have a good time. The man, like many more people, mistook his soul for his body and mixed the sacred and the profane. Because in actual fact, a soul does not rejoice in reveries and idleness, but languishes. And the man, like many, after the first good harvest in the fields of virtue, stopped, as he thought he had done everything. But do you not know that once you have laid your hand on the plough, you must persevere for one, ten, one hundred years, as long as your life lasts? Because to stop is a crime against oneself, as one denies oneself a great glory. And it is a regression, because generally he who stops not only does not proceed further, but turns back. The treasure of heaven must increase year by year to be good. Because if mercy is benign to those also who had few years to store it up, it will not be an accomplice of lazy people who in a long life do little. It is a treasure increasing continuously. Otherwise, it is no longer a fruit-bearing treasure but an unfruitful one, which is detrimental to the readily available peace of heaven. God said to the foolish man, Fool, you mistake body and wealth of the earth for what is spirit, and you turn the grace of God into evil. This very night, the demand will be made for your soul, and it will be taken away, and your body will lie lifeless. And this hoard of yours, whose will it be then? Will you take it with you? No. You will come to my presence despoiled of earthly crops and spiritual works, and you will be the poor in the next life. It would have been better if you had used your crops for works of mercy on behalf of your neighbour and yourself, because if you had been merciful towards others, you would have been merciful to your own soul. 
and instead of fostering idle thoughts, you could have piled a trade which would have given an honest profit for your body and great merit for your soul until I called you. And the man died that night and was severely judged. I tell you solemnly that that happens to those who store up treasure for themselves but do not grow rich in the eyes of God. Go now and avail yourselves of the doctrine explained to you. Peace be with you. And Jesus blesses and withdraws into a thicket with his apostles and disciples to take some food and rest. And while eating, he continues to speak on the same lesson, repeating a subject already explained several times to the apostles and which I think will never be clarified enough because man is too easily seized with foolish fears. You must believe, he says, that man should worry only about making himself rich in virtue. But mind you, you must not worry anxiously or painfully. Good is the enemy of anxiety, of fears, of haste which still show too many traces of avarice, jealousy, and human mistrust. Let your work be constant, confident, peaceful, without rough starts and stops, as onagers do. But no one makes use of them unless one is mad to go on a safe journey. Be peaceful in victory and peaceful in defeat. Also, tears shed for an error you made and which grieves you because by it you have displeased God must be peaceful, comforted by humility and trust. Prostration, anger against oneself are always a symptom of pride and lack of confidence. He who is humble, knows that he is a poor man, subject to the miseries of the flesh, which at times triumphs. He who is humble puts his trust not so much in himself as in God, and is serene also when defeated, and says, Forgive me, Father. I know that you are aware of my weakness, which overwhelms me at times. I will believe that you pity me, I am fully confident that you will help me in the future, even more than heretofore, notwithstanding I please you so little. Do not be indifferent or avaricious with regard to the gifts of God. Give generously what you possess of wisdom and virtue. Be active in spiritual matters as men are with regard to their body. And as far as your bodies are concerned, do not imitate the people of the world who always tremble for their future, fearing they may lack what is superfluous, that they may be taken ill or die, that enemies may be harmful and so on. God knows what you are in need of. Therefore, be not afraid for your future. Be free from tears, which are heavier than the chains of galley slaves. Do not be anxious about the necessities of life, what you will eat or drink, and how you will clothe yourself. The life of the spirit is worth more than the life of the body, and the body is worth more than clothes, because you live with your bodies and not with your clothes. And through the mortification of your bodies, you help your souls to attain eternal life. God knows how long he will leave your souls in your bodies. And he will give you what is necessary until that hour. He gives it to crows, impure birds, which feed on corpses. And the reason for their being is just to remove putrefying corpses. And will he not give you what is necessary? 
Crows have neither larders or granaries, and God feeds them just the same. You are men, not crows. At present, you are the cream of men, because you are the disciples of the Master, the evangelizers of the world, the servants of God. And can you possibly think that God may neglect you, even for what concerns your clothes, since he takes care of the lilies of the valleys and makes them grow and clothes them with such beautiful robes that Solomon never possessed the like. And yet they do no work but scent worshipping God. It is true that by yourselves you cannot add one tooth to a toothless mouth or lengthen by one inch a contracted leg, or make dimmed eyes bright. And if you cannot do such things, can you think you may be able to repel misery and diseases and turn dust into food? You cannot. But do not be of little faith. You will always have what you need. Do not worry like the people of the world who strive to satisfy their pleasures. You have your father who knows what you need. All you must seek, and it must be your first care, is the kingdom of God and his justice, and all the rest will be given to you as well. Be not afraid, my little flock. My father was pleased to call you to the kingdom, that you may have his kingdom. You may, therefore, aspire to it and assist the father through your goodwill and holy activity. Sell your property and give the money to charity if you are alone. Give your relatives means of subsistence as compensation for your abandoning the house to follow me, because it is unfair to deprive children and wife of their daily bread. And if you cannot sacrifice money, sacrifice the wealth of your affections, they are money which God evaluates for what they are. Gold which is purer than any other gold. Pearls which are more precious than those taken from the sea, and rubies, which are rarer than those found in the bowels of the earth. Because to renounce one's family for my sake is love, which is more perfect than the purest gold. It is a pearl made of tears, a ruby made of blood, wailing from the wound of one's heart, torn to pieces by the separation from father and mother wife and children. But such purses never wear out. Such treasures never fail. Thieves cannot break into heaven. Woodworms cannot eat what is deposited there. And have heaven in your hearts, and your hearts in heaven near your treasures. Because a heart, whether good or wicked, is with what you consider your dear treasure. So, as our heart is there where its treasure is, in heaven, so the treasure is there where the heart is, within you. Nay, the treasure is within the heart, and with the treasure of saints, in the heart there is the heaven of saints. Be always ready, like those who are about to depart or are waiting for their master. You are the servants of the master God. He can call you where he is any moment or come where you are. Be, therefore, always ready to go or to pay him homage, with work or travelling belt round your waists and lamps lit in your hands coming out of a wedding party with one who has preceded you in heaven, 
and in being consecrated to God on the earth. God may remember that you are waiting, and may say, Let us go to Stephen, or to John, or to James, and to Peter. And God is fast in coming, or saying, Come. So, be ready to open the door to him when he arrives, or to leave should he call you. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds vigilant on his arrival. I tell you solemnly that to reward them for their faithful waiting, he will gird his waist, make them sit at the table and serve them. He may come at the first or second or third watch. You do not know, so be always vigilant, and you will be happy if you are so and the master finds you thus. Do not flatter yourselves by saying there is time he will not come tonight. Evil would befall you. You do not know. If one knew when a thief is going to come, one would not leave the house unguarded so that a robber may force the door and coffers. Be prepared as well, because when you least expect him, the Son of Man will come, saying, It is time. Peter, who has even forgotten to finish his food, to listen to the Lord, when he sees that Jesus is silent, asks, What you said, is it for us or for everybody? It is for you and for everybody. But it is primarily for you, because you are like stewards put by the Master at the head of the servants, and it is your duty to be twice as vigilant, both as stewards and as simple believers. What must a steward be like? Once he has been put by his master at the head of the servants, so that he may give each his fair portion at the right moment, he must be shrewd and loyal. In order to fulfil his own duty, and make his subordinates fulfil theirs. Otherwise, the interests of the master would suffer a loss, whereas he pays so that the steward may act on his behalf and safeguard his interests while he is away. Happy is the servant whom the master finds acting loyally, diligently and honestly on his returning home. I tell you solemnly, that he will appoint his steward over other estates, over all his estates, and will relax and rejoice in his heart because of the reliability of his servant. But if the servant says, Well, my master is far away and has written to me that he will be delayed in coming back home, so I can do what I like and I will do the necessary when I think he is about to come and he begins to eat and drink until he gets drunk and gives crazy orders. And as the good servant under him refused to carry them out, not to cause damage to their master, he beats servants and maids until they are taken ill and decline. And thinking that he is happy, he says, at last I relish being the master and feared by everybody. But what will happen to him? It will happen that the master will arrive when he least expects him, catching him perhaps in the very act of pocketing money or bribing some of the most unreliable servants. Then, I tell you, the master will throw him out, depriving him of his position as steward and refusing to keep him among his servants because it is not right to keep unfaithful traitors among honest people. And the more the master previously loved and instructed him, the more he will be punished. Because the more one is aware of the will and mind of the master, the more one is obliged to fulfil it accurately. If one does not act as the master explained in so great detail that nobody else was told so clearly, one will be severely beaten. 
whereas an inferior servant, who knows little and does wrong, while he thinks he's doing right, will receive a less severe punishment. Much will be requested of him who was given much, and he who has much in his care will have to return much, because my stewards will be asked to give an account also of the soul of a baby one hour old. My election is not a cool relaxation in a flowery little wood. I came to bring fire on the earth. And what can I wish for but that it may light up? That is why I tire myself, and I want you to tire yourselves until you die, and until the whole earth is a celestial bonfire. I am to be baptized with a baptism. And how distressed I will be until it is accomplished. Are you not asking why? Because through it I will be able to make you fire bearers. Agitators who will act in and against every social stratum to make it one thing only, the flock of Christ. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? And according to the way of thinking of the earth? No. On the contrary, I came to bring discord and separation. Because from now on, and until the whole world becomes one only flock, of five people in one house, two will be against three, and the father will be against his son, and the son against the father, the mother against her daughters, and the daughters against the mother. And mother-in-laws and daughter-in-laws will have a further reason not to understand each other, because a new language will be spoken by some lips, and it will be like Babel because a deep disturbance will agitate the reign of human and superhuman affections. Then the time will come when everything will be unified in a new language, spoken by all those who have been saved by the Nazarene, and feelings will be filtered like water, as the dross will sink to the bottom while the limpid waves of celestial lakes will shine on the surface. Truly, it is not restful to serve me. According to the meaning man attaches to that word. Heroism and indefatigability are required. But I tell you that at the end, it will be Jesus still and always, Jesus, who will grid his waist to serve you and will sit with you at an eternal banquet and all labour and sorrow will be forgotten. Now, since no one has been looking for us, let us go to the lake. We shall rest at Magdala. In the gardens of Mary of Lazarus, there is room for everybody, and she has put her house at the disposal of the pilgrim and his friends. There is no need for me to tell you that Mary of Magdala died with her sin, and she has risen again from her repentance as Mary of Lazarus, the woman disciple of Jesus of Nazareth. You are already aware of that, because the news spread like the fury of the wind in a forest. But I will tell you something you do not know. All the personal wealth of Mary is for the servants of God and the poor people of Christ. Let us go. The Poem of the Man God The Second Year of the Public Life Chapter 276 In the Garden of Mary of Magdala Love for one's neighbour. 16th of September, 1945. 
Jesus is no longer where he was during the last vision. He's in a large garden which extends as far as the lake, and in the middle of it there is a house surrounded by the garden, which at the rear of the house is at least three times as large as on the front and sides. There are flowers, but of all trees, thickets and green nooks, some around fountain basins of precious marbles, some like bowers around tables and stone seats. And there must have been statues here and there, both along the paths and in the centre of the basins. Only the pedestals of the statues are now left as a remembrance, near laurel and box shrubs or reflected in the basins of full of limpid water. The presence of Jesus with his disciples and of people from Magdala, among whom there is little Benjamin, who dared to tell the Iscariot that he was a bad man, makes me think that they are the gardens of the Magdalene's house, which have been conveniently altered for a new function by removing what might have disgusted or scandalised or reminded one of the past. The lake is a grey-blue creep reflecting the sky, where the clouds are sailing swiftly, laden with the first autumn rain. But it is beautiful even so, in the still, placid light of a day which is not clear, but not entirely rainy. Its shores are no longer covered with flowers. They are, however, painted by the great painter, which is autumn, and they show ochre and purple hues, and the exhausted pallor of the withering leaves of trees and vineyards, which change colour before yielding to the earth their living clothing. In the garden of a villa overlooking the lake like this one, there is a spot which has turned red, as if it poured blood into the water, due to the presence of a hedge of flexible branches, which autumn has coloured with blazing copper hue, while the willow trees spread along the shore, not far from the garden, seem to be trembling, as their slender silver-green leaves quiver and look paler than usual before dying. Jesus is not looking at what I am watching. He is looking at some poor, sick people whom he cures. He is looking at some old beggars to whom he gives some money. He is looking at some children offered to him by their mothers that he may bless them. And he is looking pitifully at a group of sisters who are informing him of the behaviour of their only brother, who has caused their mother to die of a broken heart and has brought about their ruin. And the poor women beg him to give them some advice and to pray for them. I will certainly pray for you. I will ask God to give you peace and I will pray for him that he may turn and remember that you are his sisters, giving you what is fair, and above all, that he may love you once again. But if he does that, he will do everything else. But do you love him, or have you a grudge against him? Do you forgive him wholeheartedly, or is there anger in your tears? Because he is unhappy too, more than you are. And notwithstanding his riches, he is poorer than you are, and you must pity him. He no longer loves and is without the love of God. See how unhappy he is. The sad life he made you lead will end in happiness for you. And first of all, for your mother, but not for him. On the contrary, from the false present enjoyment he would pass to an eternal dreadful torture. Come with me. By speaking to you, I will speak to everybody. And Jesus goes towards the centre of a meadow, where once there must have been a statue, and the site is now strewn with groups of flowers. Only the pedestal is now left and it is surrounded by a low hedge of myrtle and miniature roses. Jesus goes towards that hedge and begins to speak. The people become silent and crowd round him. 
Peace be with you. Listen. It is written, Love your neighbor as you love yourself. But who is our neighbor? The whole mankind, in a general meaning. In a narrower sense, all our countrymen. In an even narrower sense, all our fellow citizens. Then, in a more and more narrow meaning, all our relatives. Finally, the last circle of this crown of love closed like the petals of a rose round the heart of a flower. The love for our full brothers, our first neighbour. God is the centre of the heart of the flower of love. So love for him is the first to be had. Around his centre there is the love for our parents, the second to be had. Because father and mother are really the little God on the earth, as they procreated us and cooperated with God to our creation, besides taking care of us with untiring love. The various love rings press round that ovary, which shines with pistols and exhales the perfume of the most choice love. The first is the love for our brothers born of the same womb and same blood as ourselves. How is our brother to be loved? Only because his flesh and blood are the same as ours? Even the little birds which are together in one nest can do that. In fact, this is all they have in common. They were born in the same brood and have on their tongues the flavour of their mother's and father's saliva. We men are worth more than birds. We have more than flesh and blood. We have the father besides having a father and mother. We have a soul, and we have God, the father of all men. So we must love our brother as our brother, because of our father and mother who gave birth to us, and as a brother, because of God, who is the universal father. We must love him, therefore, spiritually, not only corporeally. We must love him, not only because of his body and blood, but because of the spirit which we have in common. And we must love, as it is to be loved, the spirit of our brother more than his body. Because the spirit is more important than the body. Because the Father God is more important than the man Father. Because the spirit is worth more than the flesh. Because our brother would be much more unhappy if he lost the father God than he would be if he lost his man father. It is heart rending to be deprived of the man father, but it is only half an orphanhood. It is detrimental only to what is earthly, that is, to our need for help and caresses. But the spirit, if it can believe, is not damaged by the death of the father. On the contrary, in order to join the just father where he is, the spirit of the son arises as if it were attracted by a loving force. And I tell you solemnly that that is love. Love for God and for the father who has ascended with his soul to the place of wisdom. He ascends to the place where he is closer to God and acts with greater rectitude because he does not lack true help, that is, the prayers of the Father whom he now loves perfectly. Neither does he lack restraint due both to the certainty that the Father does now see the deeds of his Son better than he did in his lifetime, and to the desire to be able to join him through a holy life. That is why one must take greater care of the spirit than of the body of the brother. 
It would certainly be a very poor love if it took care of what is perishable, neglecting what is not perishable and which, if neglected, may lose eternal joy. Too many people tire themselves with useless things and worry themselves about what is of comparative merit, losing sight of what is really necessary. Good sisters and brothers must not worry only about keeping clothes tidy and having meals ready or helping their brothers with their work, but they must bend over their spirits and listen to their voices, perceive their faults, and with loving patience, busy themselves to give them a wholesome holy spirit. If in those voices and faults they see a danger for their eternal lives, and if their brother has sinned against them, they must forgive him and get God to forgive him through his return to love without which God will not forgive. It is written in Leviticus, you must not bear hatred for your brother in your heart. You must openly tell him of his offence. This way you will not take a sin upon yourself because of him. But there is an abyss between not hating and loving. You may think that aversion, detachment, indifference are not sins because they are not hatred. No, I have come to bring new light to love and consequently to hatred. Because what makes the former shine in every detail makes every detail of the latter shine as well. The very elevation to high spheres of the former brings out, as a consequence, a greater detachment from the latter, because the higher love ascends, the lower hatred seems to sink. My doctrine is perfection. It is refinement for feelings and judgment. It is truth without metaphors and paraphrases. And I tell you that aversion, detachment, and indifference are already hatred, simply because they are not love. Hatred is the opposite of love. Can you find another name for aversion? For being detached from a being? For indifference? He who loves has a liking for the person loved. So, if he dislikes him, he no longer loves him. He who loves, even if he is separated materially from the person he loves, continues to be near him with his spirit. So, if one is detached with one spirit from the other, one no longer loves the other. He who loves is never indifferent towards the person he loves. On the contrary, he is interested in everything concerning that person. So, if one is indifferent towards another, it means that one does not love the other. You can thus see that those three attitudes are branches of one plant, hatred. Now, what happens when we are offended by one whom we love? In 90% of cases, if hatred does not arise, aversion, detachment, or indifference will result. No, do not do that. Do not freeze your hearts by means of those three forms of hatred. Love. But you are asking yourselves, how can we? I reply to you, as God can as he loves those who offend him. A sorrowful, but still good love. You say, how do we do that? I am giving a new law on the relationship with a guilty brother. And I say, 
If your brother offends you, do not humiliate him by reproaching him in public, but urge your love to cover up your brother's fault in the eyes of the world. Because great will be your merit in the eyes of God by barring out of love every satisfaction to your pride. Oh, how man loves to let people know that he was offended and grieved thereby. Like a foolish beggar, he does not go to a king asking for alms and gold, but he goes to other foolish beggars like himself, asking for handfuls of ash and manure and mouthfuls of burning poison. That is what the world gives to offended person who goes complaining and begging for comfort. God, the king, gives pure gold to him who, being offended, goes without any grudge to weep only at his feet and ask him love and wisdom for comfort of love and how to behave in the sorrowful circumstances. Therefore, if you want comfort, go to God and act with love. I say to you, correcting the old law, if your brother has sinned against you, go and correct him by yourself. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother once again. And at the same time, you have gained many blessings from God. If your brother does not listen to you, but he rejects you persisting in his fault, take with you two or three grave, clever, reliable witnesses so that no one may say that you are agreeable to his fault or indifferent to the welfare of his soul. And go back to your brother with them and kindly repeat your remarks in their presence so that the witnesses may be able to repeat that you have done everything in your power to correct your brother in a holy way. Because that is the duty of a good brother since the sin committed by him against you is detrimental to his soul, and you must take care of his soul. If that is of no avail, inform the synagogue, so that he may be called to order in the name of God. If even so he does not make amends, and he rejects the synagogue or the temple as he rejected you, consider him as a publican and a Gentile. Do that both with your full brothers and with the people you love. Because also with your remote neighbour, you must behave with holiness, generosity, flexibility and love. And when it is a lawsuit and it is necessary to go to court and you go with your adversary, I tell you, O oh man, who often find yourself in greater evils through your own fault, to do everything in your power while you're on the way, to make your peace with him, whether you are right or wrong. Because human justice is always imperfect, and a shrewd man generally defeats justice, and the offender might be considered innocent, whilst you, who are innocent, might be found guilty. And then, not only your right would not be acknowledged, but you would lose the case, and from being innocent you would be found guilty of slander, and so the judge would hand you over to the law executor, who would not let you free until you had paid down to the last penny. Be conciliating. Does your pride suffer by it? Very well. Is money squeezed out of you? Better still, providing your holiness increases. Do not feel nostalgia for gold. Do not crave for praises. Let God praise you. Ensure that you have your purse in heaven and pray for those who offend you, that they may make amends. If that happens, they themselves will give you back honour and goods. If they do not, 
Godwin. Go now, because it is time for your meal. Let only the beggars stay and sit at the apostolic table. Peace be with you. The Poem of the Man God The Second Year of the Public Life Chapter 277 Jesus Sends the Seventy-Two Disciples 17th of September, 1945 After the meal, Jesus dismisses the poor guests and remains with his apostles and disciples in the Garden of Mary of Magdala. They sit at the very end of it, near the calm water of the lake, on which some sailing boats are fishing. They will have a good catch, comments Peter, who is watching them. You will have a good catch too, Simon of Jonah. Me, my lord? When? Do you want me to go out and fish for our food for tomorrow? I will go at once and... We do not need any food in this house. You will have a good catch in future. In the spiritual field. And most of these will be very good fishermen like you. Not everyone, master? Asks Matthew. Not everyone, but those who will persevere and become my priests will have good catches. Conversions? Asks James of Zebedee. They will convert, forgive, lead back to God. Oh, so many things. Listen, master, you said before that if a man does not even listen to his brother in the presence of witnesses, the synagogue is to admonish him. Now, if I have understood correctly what you have been telling us since we met, I think that the synagogue will be replaced by the church, the thing that you want to found. If so, where will we go to have our pig-headed brothers admonished? You will do that yourself because you will be my church. So believers will come to you for advice for themselves or for advice for other people. I will tell you more. You will not be able only to give advice. You will be able to absolve in my name. You will be able to release people from the chains of sin and you will be able to join two people who love each other so that they become one body. And what you do will be valid in the eyes of God, as if God himself had done it. I tell you solemnly that whatever you bind on the earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you absolve on the earth will be absolved in heaven. And I say to you also, to make you understand the power of my name, of brotherly love and prayer, that if two disciples of mine, and I mean as such all those who will believe in the Christ, will gather together to ask for any just thing in my name, that thing will be granted to them by my Father. Because prayer is a great power, brother union is a great power. My name is a very great, infinite power, and so is my presence among you. And where two or three people are gathered in my name, I shall be in the midst of them, and I will pray with them, and the Father will not refuse anything to those who pray with me. Many do not get what they ask for because they pray by themselves or they ask for what is illicit or they pray with pride or sin in their hearts. Make your hearts pure so that I can be with you. Then pray and you will be heard. Peter is thoughtful. Jesus notices it and asks him why. And Peter replies, I am thinking of the great duty to which we are destined, and I am afraid of it. 
I am afraid I cannot accomplish it properly. In fact, Simon of Jonah, or James of Alphaeus, or Philip, and so on, would not do it properly. But Peter the priest, James the priest, Philip the priest, or Thomas the priest, will do very well, because they will be acting together with divine wisdom. And how many times will we have to forgive our brethren? How many times if they sin against the priests? And how many times if they sin against God? Because if things will happen then, as they do now, they will certainly sin against us, since they sin against you so many times. Tell me whether I have to forgive always or a number of times. For instance, seven times or more? I will not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven, an endless number. Because also the Father of heaven will forgive you many times, a great number of times, and you ought to be perfect. So do as he does with you, because you will represent God on the earth. Nay, listen, I will tell you a parable which will help everybody. And Jesus, who is surrounded by the apostles only, in a box thicket, goes towards the disciples who are respectfully gathered in an open space, adorned with a fountain basin full of clear water. Jesus' smile is like a sign that he is going to speak. And while he walks with long, slow steps, so that in a few moments he covers a good distance without rushing, they are all delighted and press round him as children gather round those who make them happy. It is a circle of keen faces until Jesus leans against a tall tree and begins to speak. What I said before to the people is to be completed for you who have been chosen from the people. The Apostle Simon of Jonah asked me, how many times must I forgive? Who? Why? I replied to him privately, and I will now repeat my reply, as it is fair that you should know now as well. Listen to how many times, how and why you have to forgive. You must forgive as God forgives, who forgives a thousand times, if one sins a thousand times and repents. Providing he sees that in man there is no will to sin, no pursuit of what makes one sin, and that sin is only the result of man's weakness. In the case of voluntary persistence in sin, there can be no forgiveness for sins against the law. But with regard to the grief, such sins cause you individually. You are to forgive them. Always forgive those who harm you. Forgive, so that you may be forgiven, because you have sinned also against God and your brothers. Forgiveness opens the kingdom of heaven, both to him who is forgiven and to him who forgives. It is like what happened to a king and his servants. A king wanted to draw up the accounts with his servants. He called them one by one, beginning with those who were in the highest positions. There was one who owed the king 10,000 talents, but the servant could not pay back the advance the king had given him to build his house and purchase all kinds of goods because in actual fact, for many more or less justified reasons, he had not made a very diligent use of the money lent to him for that purpose. The king and master was angry at his sloth and breakage of his word, and ordered him, his wife, children, and all his possessions to be sold, until he settled his debt. But the servant threw himself at the king's feet, 
and weeping, implored him. Let me go. Have a little more patience, and I will give you back everything I owe you to the last penny. The king was moved by so much distress. He was a good king, and not only agreed to his request, but when he heard that diseases had been the cause of his lack of diligence and failure to pay, he also remitted his debt. The servant went away happily, but on his way out he ran into another servant, a poor fellow to whom he had lent one hundred denarii taken from the ten thousand talents received from the king. As he felt sure of the king's protection, he thought everything was permissible to him, and he seized the unhappy fellow by the throat, saying, Give me what you owe me. In vain, the man stooped, weeping to kiss his feet, imploring, Have mercy on me, as I have had much bad luck. Have a little patience, and I will pay everything back to you to the last penny. The cruel servant sent for Milesiamen, and had the poor wreck taken to prison, so that he would make up his mind and pay him, or lose his freedom or his very life. The friends of the unhappy man came to know about it, and being very upset, they went and told the king and master, who, upon hearing the news, ordered the pitiless servant to be brought before him, and looking at him severely, said, You wicked servant, I helped you the first time, that you might become merciful, that you might become a rich man. Then I helped you by remitting your debt, when you implored me to have patience. You did not have pity on your fellow servant, whilst I, A king had so much pity on you. Why did you not treat your fellow servant as I treated you? And in his anger, he handed him over to the jailers to be kept by them until he paid everything back, saying, As he did not have pity on one who owed him very little, while he had so much pity from me, who am a king, so I will no longer have pity on him. And that is how my father will deal with you, if you are pitiless towards your brothers, if you are more guilty than a believer after receiving so much from God. Remember that it is your duty to be more faultless than anybody else. Remember that God gives you a great treasure in advance but he wants you to render an account of it. Remember that no one must be able to grant love and forgiveness like you. Do not be servants exacting much for yourselves and giving nothing to those who ask you for help. As you do to others, it will be done to you, and you will be asked to give an account of how other people behave if they have been led to good or to evil by your example. Oh, if you few have sanctified people, your glory in heaven will be really great. But likewise, if you have been corruptors or only sluggish in sanctifying, you will be severely punished. I say to you once again, If any of you does not feel like being the victim of his own mission, let him go away. But let him not fall in it. I mean, let him not fail in what is pernicious to his own and other people's perfection. And let him have God as his friend, always forgiving your weak brothers from your hearts. Then each of you, who will thus forgive, will be forgiven by God the Father. Our stay has come to an end. The time of tabernacles is close at hand. Those to whom I spoke separately this morning, as from tomorrow, will go ahead of me, announcing me to the people. 
Those who are staying must not lose heart. I have kept some of them for prudential reasons, not because I disdain them. They will be staying with me, and I will soon send them, as I am now sending the first seventy-two disciples. The harvest is rich, but the labourers are too few compared to what is needed. So there will be work for everyone, but that is not sufficient. So without being jealous, ask the Lord of the harvest to send new labourers to his harvest. In the meantime, you may go. During the past days, the apostles and I have completed your instructions on the work you have to do. And I have repeated to you what I told the twelve before sending them. One of you asked me, how will I cure in your name? Always cure the spirit first. Promise the sick people the kingdom of God if they can believe in me. And once you have ascertained their faith, order the disease to depart and it will go away. And do likewise with those whose souls are ill. Stimulate their faith first of all. By means of sound words, inspire them with hope. I will then come to grant them divine charity, as I put it into your hearts after you believed in me and hoped for mercy. And be not afraid of men or of demons. They will not hurt you. The only thing you are to fear are sensuality, pride, avarice. Through them, you would hand yourselves over to Satan and devilish men who also exist. Go, therefore, preceding me along the roads of the Jordan, and when you arrive in Jerusalem, go and join the shepherds in the valley of Bethlehem and come with them to me in the place you know, and we will celebrate together the holy feast and we will then go back to our ministry more invigorated than ever. Go in peace. I bless you in the holy name of the Lord.